Chapter 17 of An Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. The Era of Military Dictatorship. We have now arrived at a period when it might seem that the disintegration of Japan had reached such a point as to render the whole situation hopeless. The mention of so many local kings by the first Christian missionaries points to the absence of any generally recognized central authority. So far as emperors and shoguns are concerned, there was certainly little promise of relief in sight. Yet at this desperate juncture, three men were raised up by providence who seemed fashioned for just this particular emergency, and who eventually succeeded in restoring to the nation its lost unity. These men, among the most remarkable in the history of any people, and born within eight years of one another, were, in order of their accession to power, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. Their stories will overlap to a certain extent, but their careers as a whole form a bridge to carry us safely over from the dreadful period of Ashikaga anarchy to the comparative peace and prosperity of the Tokugawa era. Nobunaga was descended from the Taira family. At the time of the Taira debacle in the twelfth century, a grandson of Kiyomori escaped and founded a line of priests who for some eight generations established themselves in the peaceful seclusion of the province of Owari. This ancestral fief formed a wide isthmus across the main island, joining on the east the estates of the family from whence sprang Tokugawa Ieyasu. At length one of the Owari lords, Oda Nobuhide, returned to the way of the warrior, and in 1543, a year after the birth of Queen Elizabeth, begat a son, Oda Nobunaga, who was destined to become one of the great soldiers of all time. Yet his early days were so wild and unpromising that he earned for himself the title of Bakadono, Lord Fool. It was only when the young daimyo's guardian protested and sealed his protest with a dutiful suicide that Nobunaga changed his course. In 1549, on the death of his father, he received his comparatively small inheritance of the Owari properties. To this patrimony, ere he died, he had added six entire provinces. Rough and careless in manner, known everywhere by his long and trailing sword, Nobunaga was throughout his career the soldier rather than the statesman. To the three illustrious soldiers above mentioned, three famous poetical epigrams, haikai, have been traditionally assigned, though they are all probably to be attributed to the epigrammist Shoha. Nobunaga's verse runs as follows. Nakaru nara kurushite shimai, ototogisu. If the cuckoo will not sing, surely its neck will ring. The verse well suggests the general violence and impatience of Nobunaga's character. The Jesuits, whom he favored, described him as follows. Nobunaga was a prince of large stature, but of a weak and delicate complexion, which made him appear less fit to support the toil and fatigues of war. Nevertheless, he had a heart and soul that infinitely supplied all other wants, and was naturally ambitious above all mankind. He was both brave, generous, and bold, and not without many excellent moral virtues, being of his own humor inclined to justice, and a sworn enemy to all treason. He was endued with a quick and penetrating wit, and seemed cut out for business. Above all, he properly excelled in military discipline, and was generally esteemed the fittest to command an army, or to manage a siege, or to fortify a town, or to mark out a camp of any general in Japan. He never used any other head in his councils but his own, for if he asked advice, it was more to know their hearts than to profit by their thoughts. He practiced inviolably the counsel of those hypocrites who teach that one ought to see into others, but never to lay himself open. For the most refined politicians could never dive into his counsels, for very private and secret was he in his designs. As for the worship of the gods, he laughed and ridiculed it, being thoroughly convinced that the bonzes were nothing but impostors, and for the most part wicked men that abused the people's innocent simplicity and screened their own debauches under the specious veil of religion in some respects the description needs correction yet as to essentials the jesuits were in a good position to judge the battle in which his general shibata avenged the murder of the shogun yoshiteru 
was fought near the Jesuit establishment of Sakai. It was a Christmas day, and a remarkable feature of the battle was that on Christmas Eve the many Christian officers and soldiers on both sides forgot their hostility, came out from their respective camps, and joined in the mass and festivities of the sacred season. In 1568 Nobunaga had made himself so powerful a personage that when the emperor invited him to settle the vexed question of the shogunate, he immediately took steps to install Yoshiaki, and incidentally with his armed train filled the capital Kyoto with consternation. By this time he had for his commander-in-chief a still abler soldier than himself, namely Hideyoshi. To make our story continuous, we may as well use the present opportunity to get acquainted with the most remarkable man Japan ever produced. In the employ of Oda Nobuhide, Nobunaga's father, there was a quondam priest who, on becoming through an arrow wound, disqualified for military service, retired to Nakamura. There are perhaps hundreds of places of this name in Japan, since Nakamura merely means middle village. But this Nakamura was in the province of Owari, near Nagoya. Here the ex-bonds took to farming and married a wife named Naka. Of this pair was born the boy who was first of all called Yoshimaru, because it was to the god of that name that the mother had prayed for a son. Since the protean nomenclature of Hideyoshi has frequently been to students a source of confusion, it may be as well to state here that the child name was on his attaining manhood exchanged for Tokichiro Takayoshi, that in 1562 the name Hideyoshi was assumed and that in 1575 the general, as Hideyoshi then was, took the name of Hashiba, formed by the combination of syllables from the names of his generals, Niwa, Ha, and Shiba, Ta, and that later still he assumed the name of Hideyoshi Toyotomi. In the days of his supreme power, Hideyoshi was best known by the title of Taiko-sama. We may add that in childhood, and long after, he was frequently called saru men Kanja, monkey face, on account of his extreme ugliness. From the first, Hideyoshi appears as straitened and handicapped by circumstance. Brinkley writes, Everything was against him, personal appearance, obscurity of lineage, and absence of scholarship. His own conduct, moreover, was far from promising. Being found unmanageable by his parents, he was turned over to the priests of a Buddhist temple for training. They gave up the too difficult task after he had smashed the idol which returned no answer to his invitation to take its food. Altogether, it is said that the young hopeful was dismissed thirty-eight times in succession from positions which had been obtained for him. Yet there must have been some quality, even in his obstreperous boyhood, which commanded respect. If we are to believe the story of his compelling an apology from the bandit Koroku, who had robbed him, Kuruku's apology, forced from him by the outraged and insistent youngster, won him a daimyo ship in the days of Hideyoshi's power some years later. The youthful Hideyoshi finally, through a characteristic piece of impudence, gained access to Nobunaga, whom he shrewdly concluded was the one man to command and merit his allegiance. Thus, from the lowliest of menial tasks, Hideyoshi fought his way upward into the confidence and admiration of his quick-tempered master. With great good humor, with abundant and tactful consideration for the susceptibilities of his associates and rivals, and with the utmost zeal for the cause of Nobunaga, he became the general's right-hand man, his chief adviser and counsel, and his most reliable lieutenant on the field of battle. The soldiers nicknamed him Cotton, because of the multitude of uses to which his talents could be put. In October 1558, Hideyoshi attached himself to Nobunaga, and in ten years he had made him master of all Owari and Mino, and the ally of the future shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu. We may now turn to consider the course of the campaign which the three illustrious soldiers brought to so triumphant an issue. In consolidating his power in the home provinces, apart from the leaders already mentioned, Nobunaga had the assistance of several notable captains. Conspicuous among these was Shibata Genroku, of whom we shall hear more later. He is sometimes known as Shibata, the jarbreaker, because during a certain famous siege he made his men drink what water they needed and then break the water jars to sally forth either to victory or to death. It was Shibata's way of crossing the Rubicon. But no assistance rendered to Nobunaga, not even that rendered by Hideyoshi, may blind us to the real ability of the lord of Owari himself. 
he seemed the man born to break down those elements of the old order which were in the way of the unification and reconstruction of the empire the battle of fifteen sixty in which nobunaga triumphed over the vastly superior force of imagawa yoshimoto when the latter invaded owari has been by some regarded as one of the great combats of the world nobunaga here turned almost certain defeat into a great victory and emerged with a fame which suffers nothing from being shared with his lieutenant hideyoshi imagawa on this occasion was accompanied by ieyasu hitherto called motoyasu but after the battle the tokugawa was convinced of the wisdom of being on good terms with nobunaga so he became first his ally and soon after his son-in-law imagawa nobunaga's most formidable enemy was slain and the victor was now much more powerful than the shogun he was destined to dispossess in fifteen sixty seven after the murder of ashikaga yoshiteru the emperor following upon several vain efforts in other directions asked of the assistance of nobunaga he nothing loath marched his army to kyoto put the dead shogun's brother yoshiaki in the thankless and empty office and retired with the title bestowed upon him by the emperor of vice shogun in fifteen seventy it again became necessary to make a display of military force in kyoto and nobunaga took advantage of the opportunity to march also against his enemies in ichizen asakura yoshikagi and asai nagamasa the battle of anegawa which ensued is another of the great contests of japanese history nobunaga's victory was complete and the confiscated estates of the defeated nagamasa were bestowed upon hideyoshi in the next year the conqueror took a terrible vengeance on the buddhist monasteries which had given no little assistance to yoshikage and nagamasa a remarkable religious revival had taken place in japan during the closing years of the ashikaga period and this contributed so much to the wealth of the monasteries that their arrogance increased in proportion and they behaved as soldiers ever ready to fight in the interest of the neighboring daimyos hara compares the monks of hiezan to the republic founded by the teutonic knights in prussia it was against these turbulent shavelings of hiezan with its eight hundred year old traditions that nobunaga proceeded the whole community was put to the sword in spite of the entreaty of the monks that they might be permitted to buy their lives the great temple Yinrakyuji was burned and with it historical materials of irreplaceable value though the monastery was subsequently rebuilt it never regained its old political importance it certainly looks peaceful enough today as one looks at it from the miyako hotel in kyoto in the massacre of the monks the chief instrument of nobunaga was the traitor to be akechi mitsuhide his subsequent fate was regarded by devout buddhists as a punishment meted out by the gods for his sacrilegious violence on the other hand the burning of hiezan on st michael's day in the year fifteen seventy one was to the jesuits an event which evoked the greatest possible satisfaction nobunaga it is probable was troubled with but little religious feeling in the whole matter in fifteen seventy three the shogun yoshiaki showed himself disposed to play into the hands of nobunaga's enemies and the irate vice shogun promptly deposed his creature thus bringing to an end the two hundred forty years supremacy of the ashikaga family yoshiaki took the tonsure and lived in kyoto for some years longer now at last nobunaga was the actual ruler of japan and issued decrees in the name of the emperor it was out of the question for him to become shogun since he did not belong to the privileged clan of the minamoto but his rule was none the less unchallengeable and he pacified japan to an extent such as had been unknown for two centuries and a half in fifteen seventy eight there were but few opponents of any consequence remaining in fact there was but one who had seriously to be reckoned with this was mori prince of chosu whose territory extended along the shores of the shimonoseki strait against this chieftain hideyoshi was dispatched in the same year and the campaign which lasted for several seasons was eventually about to be crowned with success as soon as the astute hideyoshi saw that the fall of the castle of takamatsu was imminent with his usual tact he sent for nobunaga to administer the coup de grace but alas the butcher of the monks of hiezan akechi had for some time been brooding over a piece of nobunaga's horseplay which by imagination he had at length transformed into a deadly insult feeling that when his playful commander had taken the lieutenant's head under his arm 
and used it as a drum, he had irremediably lost face. Akechi was now meditating an opportunity for treason. Perhaps also he had begun to suspect that Nobunaga's power was becoming too absolute for the security of his subordinates. At any rate, instead of marching to the relief of Hideyoshi, Akechi suddenly turned his forces against Nobunaga, who, all unsuspicious of treachery, was resting in the temple of Honno. The odds were too unequal for the dictator to expect success in resisting his foe. So sorely wounded, Nobunaga set fire to the temple and calmly committed seppuku, with the burning shrine for his funeral pyre. This was on June twenty first, 1582. It was an end quite consonant with Nobunaga's favorite verses. Life is short. The world is a mere dream to the idol. Only the fool fears death, for what is there of life that does not die once, sooner or later? Man has to die once only. He should make his death glorious. Not long before his death, Nobunaga had horrified the Christians by the erection of a temple with an image of himself before which all men were summoned to bow and worship. Assurance of great blessing was given to those who were willing to comply, and dire threats were launched against any who should have the hardihood to refuse. But all the Christians, like the three children of the Apocrypha, disobeyed the command, and Nobunaga's death was by the Jesuits regarded as the just punishment for his blasphemous pride. They wrote as follows, God, who rejects the proud and humbles the lofty cedar of Lebanon, was not long before he avenged this horrible attempt. Forgetting himself and affecting resemblance with God, the Omnipotent struck him in his fury and from the temporal fire precipitated him into everlasting flames to teach men that there is only one God above that rules over kings and humbles the proud. This is a somewhat severe judgment on the man who had done so much for the political unification of Japan and in preparation for the new age which was on the way. Akechi, knowing that Hideyoshi was closely engaged in the siege of the castle of Takamatsu, made all speed to Kyoto, interviewed the emperor, and came away exalted to the skies with the title of Shogun. It was a title destined to wither with the rapidity of a flower plucked from the field. Before we relate the story of how Hideyoshi settled with the Three Days Shogun for the murder of his master, it is necessary to bring up to date the history of the Jesuit mission. The fathers had early learned that if Japan were to be converted, it must be through the influence of the daimyo. Consequently, it is easy to understand why very earnest efforts were made to bring about the conversion of those high in authority. In several conspicuous instances, they met with success, as in the case of the princes of Omura, Bungo, and Arima. But the most substantial aid received during these years came through the favor of Nobunaga. There was never any real likelihood of Nobunaga himself accepting the claims of Christianity, but his hostility against the Buddhists, and particularly against the political military establishments maintained by the monasteries of Hiyazan, was so bitter as to make him more than ready to play off the Christian missionaries against his foes. Consequently, the Jesuits found ample reason for writing home. Now, this man seems to have been raised up by God to open and prepare the way for our faith. Not only were sites provided and churches built in Kyoto and Asuchi, but protection was afforded on at least two occasions when proscriptions of the new religion was threatened by the emperor. One was during the days of civil turmoil, which followed upon the murder of the shogun Yoshiteru in 1565. There were not wanting Buddhists of the Nichiren sect to connect Christianity with the assassination, and it was fortunate that Nobunaga was willing to bring his own influence to bear upon a very dangerous situation. He performed the same good office for the Christians in 1568. Father Villela was received with the greatest possible courtesy by the new shogun, and the years which followed proved a halcyon time for the Jesuit propaganda. In 1582, the year of Nobunaga's death, Father Alessandro Villignani was sent out by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth with gifts to the converted Japanese princess and two counselors who were received by Pope Gregory and his successor Sixtus V. They visited Rome, Lisbon, and Madrid to see the wonders of the West and report on the same on their return as Jesuit priests. It has been established that about this time there were no less than four similar embassies whose main object was to detach the pontiff from support of the intruding Spaniards. 
when the envoys returned to japan they found the political situation changed and hideyoshi much less favorable to the missionaries than his predecessor had been immediately on the death of nobunaga akechi mitsuhide in addition to his adroit haste to make terms with the emperor sent at once to mori terimoto whom hideyoshi was besieging to inform him as to the new turn events had taken and to propose a joint attack on hideyoshi but the great soldier was also a consummate statesman and had already concluded on very favorable terms a truce with mori nevertheless the peril for a while was extreme a large party of horsemen was sent to intercept hideyoshi on his way back from the castle of takamatsu and the stratagem all but succeeded suddenly around the intended victim arose the emissaries of murder with the cry we have come from shogun mitsuhide to take your head hideyoshi did not hesitate under a shower of arrows he turned his horse into a narrow path between the rice fields where his opponents could follow only singly then just before reaching the temple kotokuji where it was taken for granted he would be caught like a rat in a bag he dismounted stabbed his horse in the leg so that it fled backward along the path scattered his pursuers in its flight and entered the shrine where the monks were taking their bath to disrobe hide his clothes under the veranda get his head shaved and then to mingle among the bonzes in the heated water was for hideyoshi the work of but two or three minutes so when the panting horseman came along the supposed trail the fugitive was although in plain sight nowhere to be found shortly after came hideyoshi's bodyguard under kato kiyomasa the soldier famous as every japanese schoolboy knows for having slain a tiger with his bare hands and afterwards the virter escredantes the thrice execrable man of the jesuits the newcomers were not a little surprised to find their master among the priests they might have asked like the israelites of old is Saul also among the prophets for hideyoshi had no love for his old associates the bonzes with lightning speed the general gathered his allies to avenge the death of nobunaga upon the upstart a farmer happened to bring some melons to refresh the weary soldiers as he cut up the fruit hideyoshi exclaimed so shall we chop up the forces of the foe it proved no vain boast for a pitched battle was speedily forced at yamazaki in which akechi was disastrously defeated twelve days after the murder of nobunaka akechi mitsuhide was murdered by the farmers of the neighborhood and his head dispatched to hideyoshi thus ended the career of the three days shogun when the feudal chiefs assembled themselves at the castle of kyoto it was for the purpose of deciding upon nobunaga's successor two sons of the deceased soldier were favored nobu or nobukatsu and nobutaka both were children by secondary wives there was also a grandson named samboshi son of the deceased nobutada each of this trio had his champions but hideyoshi unhesitatingly threw his support to the infant samboshi whether he was actuated by personal ambition or sincerely desirous of saving the land from a renewal of the old anarchy may legitimately be the subject of debate in any case at nobunaga's funeral ceremony while the other chiefs were considering somewhat doubtfully their most politic course hideyoshi audaciously stepped to the forefront with the child samboshi in his arms followed by sixteen stalwart retainers armed to the teeth none could mistake the course he had made up his mind to follow hideyoshi's cuckoo motto was nakanunara nakashite misho ototo gisu if the cuckoo will not sing i will teach the stubborn thing hideyoshi's career was a very epic of audacity but no one was more patient than the great soldier through all his tangled way of plotting and intrigue when decisive action was called for the right step was always forthcoming without a moment of hesitation or delay in a few days the opposition showed itself in arms hideyoshi's old-time comrade shibata katsuiye took the field in support of nobutaka and was defeated in a hard-fought battle when shibata realized that his cause was lost he retired to his castle at fukui gathered together wife children and retainers gave a great feast with dancing and singing bade any of the women who chose to withdraw and then on their refusal calmly set fire to the building the women and children were slain by the men who immediately after took the accustomed exit from life brinkley speaks of this as one of the most dramatic events of japanese history nobutaka himself had escaped the battle but he too soon after sought release by suicide from a hopeless and intolerable situation 
in 1584 followed the campaign known as the Komaki War. Samboshi Hideyoshi's candidate for the succession was put aside as promising only incompetence and eventually settled down as one of his patron's vassals. Nobu, on the other hand, felt the necessity of taking up the cause of his house, and was fortunate enough to attract for a time the aid of no less a person than Tokugawa Ieyasu. As a military operation, the campaign proved indecisive. It had been alleged that Ieyasu proved himself a match for Hideyoshi in generalship. The truth appears rather to be that Hideyoshi's generals, acting contrary to his orders, met defeat more than once. However, after some eight months campaigning, the two great soldiers came to terms, and in 1586 were once more friends. The friendship was cemented by Ieyasu's receiving in marriage the younger sister of Hideyoshi. Soon after this, Hideyoshi was appointed Kwambaku, or regent, by the emperor, and assumed the family name of Toyotomi. It was a wonderful triumph for the monkey-faced sandal-bearer of Nobunaga. A story is told that at the beginning of his military career, Hideyoshi assumed as his battle standard the calabash, or water gourd, of the common soldier, and that with every victory he added another calabash. This picturesque tale is not historical, but we may note that at this point of his career, Hideyoshi did make the symbol of his never-failing victory the golden gourd, which the soldiers of Japan were never reluctant to follow, even though it led them downward to the yellow springs of the underworld. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of an Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 18. The Regency of Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi would fain have made himself shogun, but it was contrary to established precedent for anyone not a Mimoto to receive the name. Whatever he might win in the way of the substance of the office, the ex-shogun, Yoshiaki, moreover, could not be persuaded to adopt the successful upstart into the privileged family. The Fujiwara family, poorer than of want, but still aristocratic, was found more amenable to suggestion, and through his connection with this illustrious house, Hideyoshi was enabled to hold the distinguished office of Kwambuka, or Commander-in-Chief. As Kwambuku, he at once set at work with vigour to restore peace and justice to the long-harassed land. The rules he made for himself are worthy of reproduction. They run as follows. Things that are important should be settled in full conference. Minor matters may be settled by a conference of two or three. Let nothing be unduly postponed. Receive no bribes. Let there be no partiality. Let there be no friends or enemies. Favour not the rich. Despise not the poor. So the periods of peace which fell to Hideyoshi's lot were well occupied with efforts to restore confidence among nobles and people alike. A new land survey was ordered and made the basis of a more equitable system of taxation. The old manorial system was almost entirely swept away. A new gold and silver coinage was introduced. Art was encouraged and a new art capital created at Fushimi, at which 250,000 men toiled for months. Screens were painted at Hideyoshi's command, numerous enough to line the road, when the Kambuku travelled. The tea ceremony and its adjuncts were enthusiastically cultivated. The tea master Rikyu was a special favourite, and the story is told of Hideyoshi's visit to see Rikyu's famous collection of morning glories. To secure the proper effect upon Hideyoshi, the artist destroyed all his garden of blooms but one superb blossom, in order that this one should shine with true queenly distinction. Brigandage, moreover, was suppressed, and trade encouraged with China and Anem. Beautiful buildings arose in Kyoto, including the splendid Juraku Palace. A colossal image of Buddha was reared to rival the Daibutsu of Nara and Kamakura. In this case, there was even more than rivalry, for, whereas the Nara image took 27 years to finish, Hideyoshi accomplished the making of his in five. 50,000 men slaved at the task, and among these, Hideyoshi, clad in the garb of a common labourer. Yet, when this tremendous image was thrown down in the earthquake of 1596, it is said that Hideyoshi, impatient with weakness, even though divine, shot an arrow at the prostrate idol. He said, 
I placed you here at great expense. You cannot even defend your own temple. Among the mightiest of all Hideyoshi's undertakings was the building of the great castle of Osaka. Even today, in spite of the stages of demolition affected in 1614 and 1868, through the great fortress, now the headquarters of the 4th Army Division, the imagination of Hideyoshi dominates Japan. To pass through these great concentric ramparts, in which stones 38 feet by 18, to climb gradually to the top of the citadel, whence it is possible to see far away to the south the shrine of Simiyoshi, where the sea gods are worshipped who gave victory to Jingo, is to realise something of the stature of the man who did so much for the reconstruction of Japan. The writer asked in vain of the engineers of Osaka how those mighty stones were so delicately placed. The legend which explains their presence tells of Hiyoshi's promise of reward to the daimyo who brought him the biggest stone. It is plain that an uprising against the power of the Kambuka was unlikely when the clan leaders were thus engaged. It was the creation of this stupendous castle which gave the poor fishing village the start which has led to Osaka becoming the largest of the cities of Japan. Only one warlike enterprise of the First Order broke the peace of these years. This was the expedition for the reduction of the Satsuma clan in Kaiyushu. A huge army was collected, the largest ever commanded by Hideyoshi, and the Satsuma leader, Shimuzu Yoshishima, was thoroughly beaten. Once again, however, the regent showed that he knew how to secure a lasting peace through a timely magnanimity. Uh, yet the castle of Kagoshima was subdued. Hideyoshi gave the proud Satsuma daimyo an opportunity to save pace by permitting the clan to substitute the son for the father as its chief. So all was happily settled, and no bitterness left behind. To advance so far, says Mr. Gubbins, and yet not enter the rebel capital, to have his enemy within his grasp and yet not crush him, to hold back a victorious army in the hour of victory, all this argues a forbearance and strength of will, which few generals in those days possessed, and which we certainly would not look for in the feudal days of Japan. Little more fighting remained for Hideyoshi in Japan itself. Expeditions in the north took on the semblance of semi-royal progresses, and enabled the victor to consolidate his popularity throughout the land. He found time to revisit the scenes of his childhood, and make friends with the villagers, and congratulate them on the improvement observable around them. He looked up the peasant wife whom long ago he had divorced, and made her a generous present in money. He also looked up one of his old masters from whom he had borrowed a sum of money in order to appear as a soldier before Nobunaga, and repaid the theft with princely interest. Most memorable action of all, Hideyoshi discerned with the eye of the born strategist the possibility of the site of Yedo, then the mere fishing village overlooked by the castle of Ota Dokwan, one of the mighty poets of the age of chivalry. Hideyoshi exacted a promise from Ayasu, who was with him at the time, that he would make the site his future dwelling place, so the regent prophetically fixed the position of the present capital of the empire. It is more than probable that Hideyoshi had, as a matter of fact, no very profound religious convictions, such may be gathered from his boyish escapade while a pupil of the Bonzes. Such also one infers from those delightfully jocose letters into the gods, such as Mr. Denning gives us in an appendix to his biography of the regent. A letter to the god of the foxes, threatening the foxes of Japan with extinction if the possession of one of his maidservants were not immediately relieved, must have been curative of the girl, even if the apologising for the imperfections of this letter were not acceptable to Inario Damajin. It is perhaps due to this fact that without the bitter hostility against Buddhism which marked the attitude of Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, for the greater part of his career, was not intolerant of Christianity. In 1584, he is reported as being not at all unfavourable to the Christians and, indeed, preferred them to all sects of the Bronzes. He is also reputed to have said on one occasion, I find no other difference in Christianity except the prohibition of having more than one wife. Were it not for that, I would become a Christian at once. The missionaries wrote, He is not only not opposed to the things of God, but he is entrusting to Christians his treasures, secrets and most important fortresses. Several of the court ladies became converts, and one famous savant, Mane is Dokwan, the most learned man in all Japan, entered the church, followed by his whole school of 800 pupils. In 1583, the famous soldier, Konishi Yukinaga, 
who used to serve Hideyoshi his cups of tea, was baptized. But the reduction of Kyushu, in some measure, carried with it the prediction of trouble to come. For the Christian daimyo of the southern island found their influence considerably curbed by the growing supremacy of the regent. Probably the fear on the part of Hideyoshi and his successors that the southern daimyo might use their relations with the foreigner to resist the authority established at the capital may be assigned as one reason for the shogun's hostility towards Christianity, a reason which has not yet been sufficiently emphasised. In any case, Hideyoshi made a kind of vault fast in 1587, and the edict of that year commanding the Jesuits to leave the country within 20 days under pain of death came as a great shock. About 120 missionaries were collected at Harado and ordered to take passage on the next outgoing ship. Yet something else occurred to modify Hideyoshi's attitude, and the continued presence of the missionaries was winked at. Conversion still proceeded apace, 23,000 being baptised in 1589 in Kyushu alone. Two years later, the regent received Visitor General Valganari and was delighted with the presence of a clock. He remained in conversation with the Jesuit far into the night, but serious trouble arose soon after, and this time from the foreigners themselves. Although the crowns of Spain and Portugal had been united in 1580 under Philip II, there was still great commercial rivalry between the two countries. Spanish merchants were envious of Portuguese trade in Japan, as the Spanish Franciscans and Dominicans were jealous of the spiritual monopoly of the Portuguese Jesuits, which had been conceded by Pope Gregory XIII in 1585. Several Franciscans from Manila succeeded in gaining admission to Japan as envoys of the governor of the Philippines, and presently opened up a church in Nagasaki. A painful and mischievous situation developed. The Franciscans claimed exemption from the bull in 1585, since they had come in the character of envoys rather than as missionaries. In 1587 came the incident of the San Felipe, a Spanish ship whose pilot boasted loudly of the expanding dominion of his master, the King of Spain. When asked how Spain had come by these vast territories, he replied that the missionaries went first and the soldiers of the empire followed hard after. This roused all Hideyoshi's wrath with suspicion, and from thenceforth, Christianity appeared to him as a kind of disguised treason. While might the genuine analyst say of the too candid pilot, this unfortunate inflicted a wound on the religion which is bleeding still after the lapse of a century and a half. The same year came the persecution which is marked particularly by the crucifixion of the 26. The victims included six Spanish Franciscans, three Japanese Jesuits, and 17 Japanese laymen. Three were boys, servers at the altar, from 11 to 14 years of age. Prior to execution, they were mutilated, and the Jesuit narrative, transmitted by the first Christian bishop in Japan, Pedro Martinez, tells how Father Augustino looked at the ears and noses slashed off by the executioners and welcomed them with tears of compassion and joy as the flowers of this new church which I humbly offer to God. As the sad procession passed through the streets with the tablet, setting forth their crime displayed before them, the multitude crowded the windows and roofs. Arrived in Nagasaki, the victims found twenty-six crosses set up in a line and prepared to die. Some lifted up their voices in song. Some stood absorbed in contemplation. Little Ludovic instantly asked which was his cross, and on it being shown him, ran up to it with great devotion and fervour. Many other things, writes Froze, might be added to this account, which, for the sake of brevity, I leave out. This only I say, that the fruit of this glorious martyrdom remains, because all the Christians, new as well as old, have been singularly confirmed in the faith, and stir up in each other desire for the way of eternal salvation, and firmly settle their minds to give their lives for the confession of the name of Christian. It is no wonder that many of these Christians regarded Hiyoshi's death in the following year with satisfaction, and not without hope. Yet to form an entirely just estimate of the situation, it should be recalled that three days before him died Philip II of Spain, and those who view with surprise and shame the inhumanity of Hiyoshi may well judge him as a persecutor alongside his European and Christian contemporary. The one great mistake of his life, this is not an inadequate description of the latest of Hiyoshi's enterprises, as to his motives for undertaking the invasion of the peninsula, a number of more or less plausible theories have been suggested. Some have said it was to give employment to the dangerously efficient army of restless daimyo and samurai. 
and to forestall any further attempt at rebellion. Others have told of Hideyoshi's frantic grief for his dead child, the babe is much beloved as I, and of the determination to cure his sorrow by his warrior's exploits. Still others have brought forth the story which is quite legendary, of his having entertained the idea from early days. One day, says the tale, visiting Kamakura, he had patted the effigy of Yorimoto on the shoulder and, and with the remark, You conquered all Japan, I shall conquer all China. What do you think of that? He had talked over the matter with Nobunaga and had declared that it was possible to conquer China as easily as a man rolls up a mat and goes off with it under his arm. From the documents in the possession of the Marquis Maida, it would appear that Hideyoshi's real motive was not territorial conquest at all, but the desire to make a channel of communication with the Ming dynasty in China. The Koreans refused, and Hideyoshi thereupon became angry. It is important to note that, if we accept these documents, the original object was diplomatic and not military. Diplomatic refusal led to military action. It was explained that the Korean emissaries had ceased to come on account of the menace of Japanese piracy, but the regent readily connected the omission with their contempt for him and his lowly birth. A few pirates, however, were drastically dealt with, and the ambassadors came to receive from Taiko Sama a somewhat cavalier welcome. After being kept kicking their heels at court for a long time, they were sent back with an arrogant message, which showed that at this stage war had been resolved upon. Hideyoshi, tossing up a few coins, was pleased to find that the result of Heads Up was predictive of a successful campaign, though he was a little disconcerted at the refusal of the foreign merchants to lend him their ships. Ships are necessary to Japan, said an imperial edict of over a thousand years ago, and Hideyoshi must have foreseen the need even before bitter experience stressed the lesson. He tried in vain to get help at sea through the Portuguese Jesuits, and the failure to do so was largely the failure of the whole enterprise. But what the Japanese lacked, the Koreans possessed, and together with the ships and great naval genius in the Korean admiral, Yu Sun, the inventor and first to employ the ironclad which played such deadly havoc with the Japanese transports. Yi Sun was killed in the course of his sixth naval victory and died, like Nelson, conscious of having broken the ambition of his foe. Apart from the lack of sea power, the strategy of the Japanese army was not unlike that of the campaigns of 1894 and 1904, but the one difference was determinative. One army was under the command of the Christian general, Konishi Yukonaga, the Don Austin of the Jesuits, who bore as his banner the paper medicine bag which proclaimed him the son of a druggist. The other was commanded by no less a distinguished Buddhist hero, Keito Kayomasa, son of a blacksmith, and now worshipped as a god. No love was apparently wasted between the two leaders, and the lack of coordination which resulted had very mischievous consequences. Naturally, the Japanese pushed ahead rapidly for a time, defeating the forces opposed to them as easily as bamboo is split. There seemed so far good ground for Hideyoshi's prediction that the Mikado would enter Peking in 1594 and divide the estates of China among his nobles. But the naval successes of the Koreans put another face upon the matter, and when the armies of the peninsula were reinforced by a powerful expedition from China, Konishi was forced to beat up a precipitate retreat, though he was still able to inflict a severe defeat on the enemy who had the temerity to pursue him. Soon after, the Christian general fell into a diplomatic trap. He received assurances, as he believed, that the Chinese were willing to invest Hideyoshi with some high-sounding title, giving him rank with the Emperor of China. Thereupon, the regent consented to the opening of negotiations with Peking. In anticipation of this exaltation to imperial rank, he had even employed a 100,000 men to erect a hall of audience, such as be worthy of the approaching inauguration. Unfortunately, before this splendid pavilion could be used, a series of terrible earthquakes levelled the entire edifice, but another sort of earthquake followed the physical. The expected embassy arrived in 1596 with a great show of solemn pomp and proceeded to the investiture of Teku-sama. But what was the horror of Hideyoshi when he discovered that the specious document which was being read was, in reality, transforming him into the vassal of the Middle Kingdom? The regent was by no means ready, as had been Yoshi Mitsu, to submit to so grave an insult. Boiling with rage, he at once broke off the negotiations. He became inflamed with a great anger and fury, 
as if a legion of devils had taken possession of him. So lightly did he vociferate and perspire that vapour exhaled from his head. Some say that he tore at the paper, but the counterstatement is that the offensive document is still to be seen, or was until the earthquake, in the archives of the Imperial University at Tokyo. Hideyoshi was now more than ever resolved to carry on the war. Kato and Konshi were sent back with large reinforcements for the garrisons, and the interrupted campaign was vigorously resumed. A slightly better showing was made at sea than before, but the Japanese gained only barren victories on land. On October the 30th, 1598, a great battle resulted in the taking of 38,000 heads by the victorious islanders, and barrels of pickled ears and noses were sent back as trophies. They formed the mound in the enclosure of the Hokai at Kyoto, known as the Minizuka Ear Mound. Another victory shortly after led the Chinese to ask for terms of peace. Meanwhile, the news had arrived of Hideyoshi's death. Tekusama had met the last grim adversary of all, and the banner of the Golden Gourd was at length brought low. The great soldier's last pathetic cry was, Don't let my soldiers be made ghosts in Korea. Hideyoshi had evidently no illusions with regard to the collapse of his grandiose designs. The disillusionment of the tired soldier, as well as the resigned pessimism of one who at heart was Buddhist, was reflected in the deathbed verse. Ah, as the dew I fall, as the dew I vanish, even Osaka fortress is a dream within a dream. Yet even out of the Korean campaign came some measure of good. Many Korean artisans returned with the Japanese soldiers. The poverty of the daimyo at the end of the war was such that they were glad to use the foreign potters for the revival of industry. So it came to pass that the ensuing age was the great time for Japanese ceramics. Through the same channel, moreover, the use of movable type for printing was introduced from the continent. Just before the Korean War, Hideyoshi had named as his heir his nephew, Hidetsugu is a man of quick and penetrating wit and an excellent judgment, with all a most courteous and obliging manner. But ere long Hideyoshi's wife, the Lady Yodo, gave birth to a son, and to this son Hideyoshi immediately transferred his favour. This was natural, but the treatment meted out to the ex heir was cruelly unnatural. Hidetsugu and his pages were ordered to commit seppuku, and immediately after all his family, the attendant ladies of his court, even the little children from three to five years old, were carted out to the common execution grounds in the bed of the Kamu, murdered with barbarous and insulting cruelty, and their bodies cast into a pit called the Pit of Beasts. The Taiku-sama, still fearful lest his son, Hideori, should be robbed of his inheritance, appointed five councillors of state, under whom were three middlemen, Churo, and five commissioners, Bugyo, who were called upon to sign a solemn oath in the presence of the gods, to protect the interests of the miner. One of these councillors was Tokuwara Iyasu, who was, moreover, selected as regent to govern over Hideori until Hideori came of age. Some have claimed that Iyasu was given discretion to judge of Hideori's capacity and character and to act accordingly, but this is doubtful and unlikely. The Bogyo kept secret for a while the Taku's death, which occurred on September the 18th, 1598. But by the end of the year, all was ready for the stately obsequies. A special shrine was built behind Kyoto and solemnly and formally dedicated to the new war god of Japan. So, the ugliest man in Japan was raised ad astra among the kami. In life, writes one of the Jesuits' fathers, he was a very diminutive statue, pretty fat and extremely strong. He had six fingers on one of his hands and something hideous in his presence and in the traits of his countenance. He had no beard, and his eyes stood out from his head in such an ugly fashion that it was painful to look at him. The Jesuits had ceased to expect anything of him after the persecution of 1597, so it is not surprising that they wrote of this unhappy prince. None were sorry for his death, but such as proposed to enrich themselves by his life. For the nobility, they were all much better pleased to see him on the list of dead gods than in the land of living men. Nevertheless, most recognised his greatness, and few today will deny that he ranks among the greatest men the Orient has produced. The principles which guided him throughout his life, says Denning, were that he sacrificed little to the great temporary advancement and honour to the attainment of his ultimate aims. 
he put up with affronts and rebuffs, refused to take offence at what was intended to offend, submitted for the time being that he might conquer eventually. Hideyoshi was singularly lacking in guile, and refused the present of a shrike, known as the hundred-tongued bird, because it suggested a man of many voices. He had that indefinable something which we inadequately term presence, a something which exercised a kind of compelling influence upon his associates, whether superiors or inferiors. To quote Mr. Denning again, nothing that he personally superintended failed, because, before commencing operations, his keen foresight had anticipated every difficulty, and made ample provision for it, and the stars were not more punctual than his arithmetic. The Momoyama period, as the epoch of Hideyoshi is called, from the Peach Hill, Momoyama, palace built for the dictator in the suburb of Kyoto, was inevitably a time of many changes. The age had been long ripe for some transformation, but had been waiting the right men to carry through the transition. Nobunaga had done something towards this by breaking down old traditions, but it was reserved for Hideyoshi to secure unity for the empire and inaugurate the new era waiting for its opportunity. Some changes were, of course, the result of new foreign contacts. It was certain that the introduction of firearms to the Portuguese, the old methods of warfare, must be superseded. The substitution of musketry for bows and arrows led to entirely different tactics. The personal prowess of the Knights of Japan was no longer of the same importance as in the old days. Moreover, the peasantry, now trained to bear arms, attained quite a new significance. The new architecture, as in the case of Hideyoshi's castle at Osaka, made from henceforth a siege something very unlike what it had been in earlier ages. Many of the changes, however, were the result of Hideyoshi's own personality and capacity for government. While not indisposed to enrich his own relatives, the dictator's unique power of reading character saved him from mere nepotism. He generally secured capable and trustworthy subordinates. His shrewdness of judgment is reflected in the many instructions of his which survive, such as, in a quarrel the one who forbears shall be recognised as having reason, or set up fences in your heart against wandering and extravagant thoughts. These mottos represent his practice as well as his philosophy. It is clear that the fact of Hideyoshi's having risen to supreme authority from the lowliest station had a good deal to do with the development of democracy in Japan. In the selection of instruments, while seeking first of all for ability, Hideyoshi had no prejudice against the employment of commoners. Moreover, though he could be, on occasion, as ostentatious as the best aristocrat of them all, his general frugality, simplicity and accessibility secured him a degree of popularity which had its part in breaking down the barriers of caste. For all these reasons, it may be truthfully said that with Hideyoshi begins the history of modern Japan. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of An Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 19. The First Tokugawa Shogun. Dr. Hara has said, that Nobunaga quarried the stones for the new Japan. Hideyoshi rough-cut them, and Ayasu gave them the final touch which fitted them for their proper place. Ayasu moves in an entirely different orbit from that of Hideyoshi, but he is certainly a star of the first magnitude in the firmament of Japanese history. At the time of Hideyoshi's death, the landed estates of Japan were in the hands of some 240 daimyo, of these, by far the most powerful was Tokugaru Ayasu, who was practically the possessor of eight provinces in the Kwanto, or eastern part of the main island. Hideyoshi had made him president of the Council of Regency and special guardian of his son, Hideyori. Ayasu derived his descent from Miramoto no Yashi. The name Tokugaru is taken from the village of that name in the province of Shimotesuki, but for a long time the family bore the name of Matsudara. Ayasu had, as we have seen, served both with Nobunaga and with Hideyoshi, 
but he had never been entirely free from the suspicion of self-seeking. There was some doubt as to the parental parentage of Hideori, and, in any case, he was a minor and a weakling too obviously under the influence of Ishida Mitsunari, Ayasu's enemy on the council. His mother too, the Lady Yodo, had her own ambitions and was in league with some of the nobles who were plotting against the Tokugara. One may credit Ayasu with the same desire to save the country from protected anarchy, which is assumed in the case of Hideyoshi. According to the standards of the time, it would be as difficult to condemn the conduct of Ayasu for his dealings with the family of Hideyoshi as to blame the latter for his setting aside of the house of Oda. Each followed the bent of his own nature. Apparently, Hideyoshi had determined to trust Ayasu implicitly. Once on the road to Kyoto, one of the chiefs had suggested to Ayasu a good opportunity to slay the Tako. Possibly Hideyoshi overheard, for he presently remarked quite casually to the Tokugara, I am an old man, won't you carry my sword for me? In the Council of Five, however, after Hideyoshi's death, and immediately after arrangements had been made for bringing back the troops from Korea, dissension broke out. In the council, both Mitsunari and Naganori were hostile to Ayasu, and they commenced intriguing at once to embroil him with others. For example, Mitsunari would ask Maidira Toshi to invite Ayasu for a visit, whereupon his fellow conspirators would warn the Tokugaru against accepting. By ways like this, dissension was only too easily fermented, and although the seven generals, as the leading supporters of the Tokugaru were called, urged a way out by the murder of Mitsunami, Ayasu, for some unknown reason, pardoned the offender. The dividing line between parties and the country itself is difficult to draw. Generally speaking, the north was on the Tokugara side, while the south sided with Ishida Mutsunari. With the south, too, went the influence of the Christians, and the leading southern generals, Mitsunari, Yokinaga, and Otani, were all Christians. So, without any overt act on the part of Ayasu, the forces were aligned for civil conflict. Hideyoshi's son, of course, played only a minor role in this whole business of clashing ambitions, while his cause was weakened by the claims put forth by some on behalf of another of Hideyoshi's children. The spark which, amid all this combustible material, kindled a flame of open war, was supplied by the request or summons addressed by Ayasu to Uyasugi Kagakatsu, one of Ishida's allies and lord of Aizu, asking his presence at Kyoto. This is the chief who had already planned an attack on the Tokugara, refused, and the refusal was naturally regarded as tantamount to the opening of hostilities. A large army was raised by Ayasu, possibly of some 70,000 men, and against this force the Confederate Western leaders were able to place in the field a much larger one. But of the 120,000 in the Western army, there were several chiefs whose forces constituted the right wing, who really were on the fence and only waiting for a favourable moment in order to change allegiance. The decision of the contest, as Murdoch put it, was to depend upon the men who lied most honestly. It was a foggy morning in October 1600 that Ayasu marched out with his troops. His standard of a golden fan and a white flag embroidered with the Tokugaro hollyhocks at their head. He was in the highest of spirits, and when the diviners announced that the road was closed before him, he replied, then I shall open it by my knocking. The opposing armies met him at Saigarahara, a place not far from the capital, the Plain of the Barrier. As soon as the fog lifted, the battle was commenced with vigorous cannonade and the firing of all kinds of foreign guns. But the use of these weapons was not sufficiently general to satisfy the spirit of the combatants, and the armies were very soon engaged in the more familiar Japanese way. The conflict was one of extreme bitterness, and for a time the issue seemed doubtful. Then Ayasu, determined to bring to a decision the clans he knew were hesitating, this he did by firing upon them. The result was exactly as he had foreseen. With the accession of the right wing of the Western Army, Ayasu was able to charge upon the rest of the line, and from this moment the Tokugara arms began to prevail. The slaughter was prodigious. Japanese accounts give the toll of the Confederate dead alone as 40,000. This is probably an exaggeration, yet the figure may very well have been not much short of that total. There was no rallying after the enemy line had once been broken. The familiar story is that when the decision was gained, Ayasu, who had fought through all the battle bareheaded, sent for his helmet, and when the attendants expressed surprise, made use of the epigram, After victory, tighten the strings of your helmet. 
Acting on this principle, he proceeded at once to reap the fruits of his success by capturing the castles of Hakanami and Fushimi, and the cities of Kyoto and Osaka. Many were the fugitives who were seized and executed. Among them were the leading generals on the other side, such as Isida Mitsunari and Konishi Yukanaga, who as Christians were beheaded instead of being forced to commit seppuku. Hideori, with his near relatives, fled to the castle of Osaka, where Ayasu made considerable advances with little result. The Battle of Sekikara, October the 21st, 1600, deserves to be regarded as one of the decisive turning points of Japanese history. The victor used his triumph with tact and moderation. The third of the Kuku epigrams is put into the mouth of Ayasu and runs as follows. Nakanu Nara, Nakomadi Mato. Otojisu. If the cuckoo to sing be not inclined, I will wait until he change his mind. Like the others, it is eminently descriptive and applicable. Hayasu did nothing, at least at this stage, to exasperate his enemies, and for a number of years Hideori was left unmolested. The Tokugaru chief, however, was determined that the history of Nobunaga and of Hideyoshi's children should not repeat itself with his own line. With far-seeing statesmanship, he at once took steps to make supremacy secure, both for his own lifetime and for that of his successors. Whatever we may think of the date of what is known as the legacy of Ayasu, to which we shall make reference a little later, as far as the principles of the document are concerned, Ayasu began to apply them to the situation from the beginning. The immense spoil which the victory of Sakahara had placed in his hands in the shape of the confiscated fiefs he used to ensure the weakening and dividing of his foes, and the strengthening of the Tokugawa clan. In a short time, 158 of the fiefs were held by members of his own family. He was equally solicitous with regard to the validating of his own authority, and in 1603 received from the Emperor Goyose the proud title of Seatan Shogun, which had once been bestowed upon Yaritomo. Then, following up the suggestion of Hideyoshi, Ayasu made Yedo the capital of his administrative machine. He spent vast sums on making it the capital equal importance to Kyoto and Kamakura, but free from the traditions of effeminacy and misrule. The work in Yedo had indeed been begun as early as 1590, but the transformation of a sea-beaten beach, with only fishermen's huts thereon, into an imposing metropolis now began in earnest. It was the outward and visible sign to the empire that a new era had indeed commenced. Ayaso differed from his immediate predecessors in being devoutly attached to Buddhism, in which religion he favoured the Yodo sect. He wore the image of Amida on his person, and ascribed all his victories to the intercession of that divinity. But his attitude towards the Christians was determined by political rather than by religious motives. For the first years of his rule, a period of comparative peace and prosperity ensued under Bishop Louis Sekaria. In 1606, Ayasu received the bishop of Kyoto, or Fushimi, and granted him favours. The new religion continued to flourish, particularly in Kyushu. Daimyo were converted, colleges established, hospitals founded, and in 1606, the beatification of Ignatius Leola was celebrated at Nagasaki with a splendid procession in which Dominicans, Franciscans, and Augustinians joined with the Jesuits. Nor was it only in the south that the work prospered. With the bull of Pope Paul V permitting the sharing of the work by orders other than the Jesuits, missionaries came in increasing numbers. The work was carried even to Yizo, Hokkaido, in the north, and to remote districts as to Sugaru and the island of Sado. We must not, however, ignore the reverse side of this pleasing picture. Some of the princely converts gave to their subjects the alternative of Christianity, or banishment, and in many places the Buddhists were deprived of their lands and temples. The causes for Ayasu's change of policy, rather than the change of heart, may be succinctly stated as follows. 1. The unpleasing exhibition of bigotry manifested in some of the districts where the Christians had the upper hand. 2. The quarrel between the Spanish Dominicans and Franciscans on the one hand, and the Portuguese Jesuits on the other. 3. The evil report given of the faith by the Dutch traders who were naturally embittered with memories of the Inquisition in Europe. 4. Ayasu's personal suspicion of the political intentions of the missionaries. This was quickened by reports from Philippine islands and by misunderstandings connected with the survey of Japanese waters by the Spaniard, Sebastian, with the help of the Franciscan, Father Sotelo. When Will Adams, 
The English pilot declared that in Europe such procedure would be viewed as an act of hostility. Ayasu replied, if the rulers of Europe do not tolerate the acts of these friars, why should I? 5. The fact that the Christians, as a body, supported the cause of Ayasu's enemy, Hidiori, Camphor, the Dutch historian says that the young emperor, Fididori, who was put to death by his tutor Iusus, was suspected of being a Christian. The political elements at the back of Iusus' policy of persecution are so commonly overlooked that it is particularly necessary to stress them. First of all, there was Iusus' fear as to his position at the head of the government. It is exceedingly important to note that when edicts were promulgated forbidding the circulation of Christian literature, Precisely similar edicts forbade the distribution of literature touching upon the affairs of the house of Toyotomi, Hideyoshi, or upon those of the emperor. In the second place, Ayasu was undoubtedly exceedingly sensitive as to the possibly political aims of the foreign friars. Even the procession in Nagasaki in celebration of the beatification of Loyola seemed to him to smack of foreign aggression. With the opposition of the shogun to Spanish and Portuguese as ambitious foreigners, so bound up with his dislike for a foreign religion that the one seemed hardly separable from the other. It is easier to understand the policy of persecution which Ayasu sanctioned in the last years of his life. The general situation is remarkably well illustrated in the account given in the affair of the Madre de Dios, sunk in the harbour of Nagasaki under instructions from the shogun in 1609. So it came to pass that Christianity, described in the legacy as an evil faith, Jakoyo, or as a false and corrupt school, was formally disallowed by the Edict of 1614. Measures must have been taken even earlier, since we find Will Adams writing to Spalding, in the year 1612 is put down all the sects of Franciscans. He states further that 86 churches and houses of Jesuits were raised. The deportation of all foreign teachers was ordered, and by the same edict the native converts were banished to the north. Some remained in hiding but the persecution inaugurated was on such a scale and so searching and far-reaching that few escaped. Murdoch asserts that no European missionary was put to death until 1617, after Ayasu's death, and that the priests then executed were beheaded like Japanese gentlemen, which may have been some consolation. Yet, there can be no doubt that the ruthless attempt to exterminate the faith which was carried out by Ayasu's successor was based upon the Christian inquiry inaugurated by Ayasu himself and stimulated by the rewards he caused to be offered for the betrayal of converts. The continuation of this tragic, heroic story we must leave to a later page, but it is doing no injustice to Ayasu to place upon his shoulders the main responsibility for one of the most terrible religious persecutions of all time. For many years after the discovery of the islands, the Portuguese did, in a commercial way, exceedingly well. Kampfer's remark on a certain natural resemblance between Portuguese and Japanese is made to explain the ease with which trading operations were carried on. The daimyo competed with one another for the advantage of receiving the merchant ships. The Portuguese married the daughters of the richest inhabitants. With Macau as a convenient base for their trading expeditions, the gain was at least cent per cent. The Portuguese affirmed that the profits of oriental trade had, for some years, provided the whole crown revenues of the kingdom and they boasted that 20 years more would have made Macau like Jerusalem in the days of Solomon, a place where silver was nothing accounted of. But the fall of the Portuguese was due to the disillusionment of the Japanese with regard to the friars, and to the slowly gathering opposition of the officials to Christianity itself. The Dutch and the English claimed that they were able to provide all the trading advantages secured by the presence of the Portuguese without interference with the native religion. Letters captured on a Portuguese ship subsequently proved to be forgeries appear to confirm the reports of political conspiracy retailed by the Hollanders. Then came the order of Ayasu to the daimyo of Arima to destroy the Madre de Dios, and after a terrific fight in the harbour of Nagasaki, the gallant captain blew up his ship. Together with it and its crew, many hundreds of the Japanese assailants were hurled to death. So at last, if we may anticipate by a few years, came the Edict of 1637, with a special provision that the whole race of the Portuguese, with their mothers, nurses, and whatever belongs to them, shall be banished to Macau. Measures taken for this deportation were adequate, and soon after 1639, a complete end was made of Portuguese exploitation of Japan, which had begun so auspiciously and had continued for something less than a century. 
The last episode is one of mingled tragedy and pathos. In 1640, four noble Portuguese, wise, virtuous and prudent men came as an embassy from Macau. They were immediately marched in bonds to the Mount of Martyrs and there beheaded with their retinue. Portuguese influence was from henceforth only to be remembered by the retention of a few words, such as the terms for soap, towel, clock, cards, glass, cake and the like. The claim that there was also influence exerted upon architecture and in the theatre has not been substantiated. When Philip II of Spain and Portugal in 1594 closed the port of Lisbon to the Dutch, he was unwittingly preparing, after the manner of the selfish everywhere, for the overthrow of his own trade with the Orient. The Dutchmen were already eager for independent venture, and when Jan Huygen van Lindstotten, who had been for so many years a kind of literary factum to the Dominican Archbishop of Goa, wrote in 1595 his famous Itiaria, a way was shown for breaking down the monopoly of the peninsula traders. Then came the experiment of Cornelius de Houtman, a cunning trader and a commercial diplomatist, who had spent four years in Lisbon trying to discover the secrets of Indian navigation. Using his experience as a pilot, he inaugurated so lucrative a venture that in a very short time, six companies were formed and in 1598, 22 shifts left for the Indies. One of these was the Delifda, the charity, sole survivor of a fleet of five sail, which had harrowing experiences on the American coast with Indians. Of the English pilot, of this pioneer in the Dutch trade with Japan, we shall presently speak. The ship reached the archipelago on March 24th, 1600. The first Dutch factory was at Harado, Ferrando, where the daimyo was the more disposed to welcome them since he had quarrelled with the Jesuits. Letters patent for free commerce were issued in 1601 by Iyasu, who himself derived revenue from the foreign trade, and was at this time greatly interested in its extension. The newcomers were bitterly opposed by the Portuguese, who regarded them as rebels and pirates, but the Hollanders, with time playing into their hands, were both willing and able to retaliate. At the same time, they pushed their fortunes shrewdly and let no opportunity slip for wooing the interest of the islanders. They imported all kinds of monsters and curious animals. Nothing was too whimsical or ridiculous, as long as it attracted the curiosity of the Japanese. Nevertheless, with all their practicality and shrewdness, they too made mistakes. One was for a request, after the death of Ayasu, for a renewal of their letters patent. This the Japanese considered unnecessary, and a reflection on their own good faith. So the letters were granted, but on less advantageous conditions. Later on we shall show the limitations of the Dutch trade still more strongly marked, but that is a story belonging to a future chapter. As one travels from Tokyo to Kamakura, something more than halfway one comes to Yokosuka. Interesting for many things, but to foreigners especially is the burial place of the first Englishman who ever resided in Japan. Will Adams was born in Gillingham in Kent in the spacious days of Queen Elizabeth. In 1598 he took service with the Hollanders as pilot major of a fleet of five sail. After leaving Spanish America, the charity was separated by storm from other vessels and came on to Japan, reaching the neighbourhood of Nagasaki on the 19th of April. Adams remained in Japan till his death in 1620, and as mentioned above, lives buried at Yokosuka. Although privately slandered by Ayasu by the Jesuits and the Portugals, he secured the ear and favour of the future shogun, became shipbuilder, diplomatic agent and trusted advisor to the government, and was eventually given a high position with lands at Himi, retainers and a Japanese wife. A son and daughter were born to him in the land of his exile, and henceforth his affection was divided between the land and family he had left behind and to that which fate had brought him. His letters printed in the papers of the Halkut Society reveal a man of the genuine Elizabethan mould. The whole romantic story of the English seaman as familiar with the Indies as with Limehouse and the Docks, one who may very well have seen Shakespeare and Ben Jonson, still awaits the hand of the dramatist and the novelist, though a Japanese sketch on the subject was performed before Prince Arthur of Connaught on his visit to Japan in 1906. Adams had a good deal to do with the establishment of the English factory, though it was against his advice that it was placed at Torado. He was never allowed to revisit his native land, though his tombstone looks out across the ocean. In the capital, a street, Anjin Cho, Pirate Street, perpetuates his memory. 
It is stated that there is an annual celebration in his honour on June 15th. Adam's last will and testament remains the property of the India office in London. There are a few more striking illustrations in the history of the power of a single individual to alter permanently the currents of the human story than the failure of the English factory at Harado through the obstinacy of Sir John Saris. In 1599, the Dutch, having gained control of the spice trade of the Orient, raised the price of pepper from three to six and eight shillings per pound. Much moved thereat, the London merchants assembled in conclave with the Lord Mayor and the Chair, and agreed to form a company to contest the monopoly of the Hollanders. So was created the London East India Company, which was incorporated on December 31st, 1600. At first, very little enterprise was shown. Englishmen continued to serve as pilots on Dutch vessels, although Lancaster's voyage yielded 100% profit. So little energy was displayed by the company that the government took it upon itself to send Sir Edward Mitchellbourne to trade with the Cathay, China, Japan, Korea and Cambia, notwithstanding any grant or charter to the contrary. It was on this voyage on December the 27th, 1605, that John Davies, after whom is named in the strait between America and Greenland, lost his life in an affray with Japanese pirates in Singapore. This was the first conflict of Japanese with the West. But at last, in 1610, the clove, under the captain John Saris, was fitted out, and all too late the English company began its venture in Japan. When Saris reached Bataan, he was encouraged by news from Will Adams to the effect that the emperor, i.e. Ayasu, had heard of the likelihood of seeing English ships, at which he was very glad and rejoiced that strange nations had such good opinion. Arrived at Harado, Saris, accompanied by Adams, proceeded to interview Ayasu. Now the shogun was exceedingly anxious to encourage foreign trade, but he was by no means desirous of strengthening and enriching the southern daimyo, largely supporters of Hideyori, by permitting them the monopoly of the business. Could he but have the ships in the neighbourhood of his capital, Yeddo, nothing would suit him better than to have the vessels come. So he offered Saris privileges of trade which, had they been accepted, would probably have saved Japan from a long period of segregation, and so changed the whole history of the Orient. The main provisions of the agreement of October the 1st, 1613, were as follows. 1. The globe might carry on trade of all kinds without hindrance, while subsequent visits of English ships would be similarly welcomed. 2. Ships might visit any ports in Japan they chose, and in case of storms, put into any harbour. 3. Ground would be given in Yeddo for the erection of factories and houses, and in the event of the return of the factors to England, they were permitted to dispose of the buildings in any way they wished. 4. If any Englishman committed an offence on Japanese soil, he should be punished by the English general according to the gravity of the offence. The reader will note not only the offer of extraterrality to English offenders, but also the extraordinary liberality of the privileges granted as compared to the belated concessions to Perry, in 1854. Now, English obstinacy has often in history proved valuable to the plans and purposes of the race, but in the case of Saris, we encounter an obstinacy the results of which turned out tragically. Saris evidently was, as Brinkley describes him, self-opinionated, suspicious, and of shallow judgment. Moreover, he despised Adams, of whom he wrote, he is only fit to be master of a junk. Worst of all, he did not see that the Dutchmen who advised his staying at Harado were playing a game of their own. They lowered their own prices in order to make competition impossible, and so made the English factory a failure from the start. It struggled on for ten disappointing years, sometimes even associating with the Dutch in filibustering expeditions. At length, in 1623, the agents were ordered to withdraw. At noon of the 24th of December, 1623, the bull set sail for Batavia. The English factory at Arado was a thing of the past, and the curtain was rung down upon the story of a great opportunity rendered, frustrate and vagabond by one man's willfulness. Half a century later, an attempt was made by King Charles II to reopen intercourse with the Shogun, but it was sufficient for the Dutch to impart the information that the English monarch had married a Portuguese princess to secure an order for the immediate withdrawal of the ships. While encouraging trade with foreign lands, Ayasu was not unmindful of certain potential dangers within the empire itself. The emperors at Kyoto constituted but a negligible menace to the security of his control. 
In the view of this, the Shogun contented himself with the erection of a palace for himself at the capital, whence he might observe carefully the movements of the court. The traveller of today, passing from the splendid decoration of the Imperial Palace of Kyoto over to Naijo, or the Palace of Iyasu, with its definitely military character, will have at a glance a comparison of the Imperial and the Shogunal status at the time. By increasing the royal revenues and by paying all due deference to the sanctity of the throne, he was better able to consolidate his sway over material things. In another direction, however, Iyasu centred a more real danger. This was at Osaka, where the great Cyclopean fortress with its ram-curved walls fenced Hideori and his friends from the dictator's will. Sir John Saris saw the castle and described it as marvellously large and strong, with very deep trenches about it and many drawbridges with gates plated with iron. The walls were at least six to seven feet thick, all of solid stone. Here lived the dispossessed son of Hideyoshi, with his energetic and high-spirited mother, the Lady Yodo. For some time, Ayasu considered him of too tender an age to be regarded with apprehension. But the years had been passing, and there were nobles and warriors, not a few, such, for example, as the veteran Keito Kiyomasa, who were only waiting Hideori's coming of age to test the sincerity and disinterestedness of the Tokugara. But in 1605, Ayasu plainly intimated that he had no intention of surrendering the powers of the shogunate to any outside his own family so he ostentatiously resigned the office to his son, Hiditada, while continuing without abatement his own active administration of the same. It was a kind of gesture by which, without losing control of state affairs, he might step aside for a while to admire the working of the machine he had constructed. During these years, he made several efforts to secure the presence of Hideyori at Kyoto. When the youth at length overcame his reluctance and visited the capital, his quondam guardian was much struck by his dignity and sagacity. It is to be feared that from that moment the fate of the house of Toyotomi was sealed. Ayasu did everything possible to secure his ultimate object by means of other than war. Some of these were not particularly creditable. The castle of Osaka was filled with spies and with women in order that the environment of Hideyoshi's heir might be as luxuriously effeminate and demoralizing as that of the emperor's. Ayasu strove to ruin the house of his rival by forcing upon it extravagant expenditures. He had used this method with success in other cases, as when he built the great castle at Nagoya, with the double idea of possessing a splendid palace and impoverishing the daimyo. So he requested of Hideori the building of a daibutsu and a temple. Then when the temple and the image were finished, the casting of the great bell had to be undertaken, and it was the inscription upon this bell which became at last the Kozai Balai. It is quite certain that there was no veiled insinuation against the Tokugara in the innocent ideographs. The inscription was Koko Anku, which means May the State Have Peace and Tranquility. But suborned priests were found to swear that in these innocent ideographs there lurked a cryptic reference to Ayasu and an intimation that he was to Hideyori as the waning moon to the rising sun. The wolf in the fable was not more certain of the guilt of the lamb. The absurd demand was made that Hideyori should leave the castle of Osaka and acknowledge himself a vassal of the Tokugara's or that the Lady Yodo should henceforth live in Yedo as a hostage. Delay in answering these unreasonable conditions brought about the first attack upon the castle. Then, upon his repulse, Ayasu opened up his insincere negotiations for peace, in which he took oath by drawing blood from his ear instead of, as was proper, from his gums. Peace was sought simply that the ex-shogun's proposal might be carried out to level the parapet of the mighty castle and fill up the surrounding moat, as an act of politeness to Ayasu. After the fortress had been thus dismantled, there was, of course, so much less the risk in resuming the war. So what is known as the Summer Campaign was launched, and in this Ayasu's purposes were abetted by every kind of intrigue carried on from within the stronghold. The hopelessness of Hideori's position, assailed both from within and without, was soon plain enough to himself. But even yet the defence was vigorous enough to make Ayasu feel at times the risks of the siege. On one occasion he is said to have given up all hope, and to have asked one of his guard to be ready to decapitate him. Numbers, however, at length prevailed, and with the castle on fire, the unfortunate son of Teiko-sama realised that no alternative remained but seppuku. The determination of the unscrupulous victor to exterminate the whole house is shown by the fact that, 
even an illegitimate child of Hideori, about six or eight years old, was hunted down and slain after the capture of the castle. And so fell Osaka Castle, and so was the house of Toyotomi destroyed. Hideyoshi, after crushing of his enemies, had thought of no better plan than to keep those who distrusted him employed in foreign lands. Ayashu, on the other hand, to ensure his own maintenance of power, set himself earnestly to work for the consolidation of his games by erasing, as far as possible, the scars of war, and by creating an administrative machine such as might survive even the weaknesses of his least capable successors. The principles of Ayasu's government are set forth in what is known as the Legacy of Ayasu, though this famous document was in all probability penned by some Chinese scholar fully a century after the first Tokugara shogun had been gathered to his fathers. As passed on from shogun to shogun, the legacy contained a hundred selections, of which 55 are connected with politics and administration, 22 refer to matters of law, while seven relate to certain episodes in the life of Ayasu. Whatever its state and authority, the code reflects accurately enough the principles by which the Tokugawa shogunate established and maintained itself. Porter declares that the pharaohs, Diocletian, the Byzantine emperors, and Louis the Fourteenth never framed more effective measures for securing their power than Ayasu. Ayasu's administration, in the first place, secured him much more independence of Kyoto than had ever been enjoyed by the Kamakura Bakufu. The attitude of the shogun toward the emperor must always be one of reverential homage, but at the same time little vestige of real power was left to the sacrosanct descendant of the sun goddess. A resident of Kyoto and a governor of Osaka, representing the shogun, curtailed whatever initiative the earlier emperors had possessed. The prohibition of progresses by the emperor to the national shrines kept him severely to the Kyoto palaces. Even the edict forbidding intermarriage between the Kuj or court families and the feudal families made the capital more and more isolated from the real instrument of government. Ayasu himself broke the rule in his own interest by arranging a marriage between his granddaughter and the heir to the throne. With regard to the feudal chiefs, Ayasu made arrangements similarly increasing his power. All the hereditary vassals of the Tokugawa family, who had been on Ayasu's side prior to the fall of Osaka, were put into a special class of daimyo, known as fude. The others of equal rank, but not hereditary vassals, were called tozama. The lands of these two classes were so redistributed that no possible combination of tozama could be formed hostile to the interests of the shogun. Two other classes, or feudal groups, also made their appearance at this time, though the names are older. These were the Hatamoto, Bannermen, special samurai, responsible immediately to the Bakufu, and the Goniken, landed gentry. All the daimyo were nicely graded according to the amount of rice produced on their estate. The smallest amount for a daimyo to have his credit being 10,000 koku. The daimyo were kept sufficiently subordinate to the shogun by such expedients as an annual term of residence at Yedo, the provision of hostages at other times of the year, and the requirement of costly presents, visits and schemes of building. Governors appointed by the shogun administered the domains of Ayasu, which amounted to about a third of the country. In the rest of the empire, though the feudal lords were the administrators, a special class of travelling officials, known as Metsuki, played the part of inspecting and spying upon the doings of the clans. Beneath the samurai, by which we mean all the warriors from the shogun down to the hanshi retainers, were the farmers, artisans and merchants in the order named, while beneath all these were the Etta house castes. Local government was based on groupings of five families, as in other oriental communities, under a headman. It was probably introduced from China in the early days. What we might call the central government consisted of an upper and a lower council of state, the members of which were chosen from the fundai nobles. There was also generally an inner circle of statesmen, and a place was given to the superintendent of the Buddhist and Shinto shrines. Altogether, the Tokugawa machine was wondrously strong and efficient, and it's easy to see that with the years it became increasingly difficult to break it. Moreover, it was so constructed as to grind exceedingly small, since by a series of sumptuary laws, almost incredible meticulousness, everything in the life of man was regulated by authority. The perfecting of this complex instrument of tyranny occupied the last years of Ayasu's life, together with the encouragement of learning and the printing and collecting of books. It was a common saying that Nobunaga had mixed the dough, 
Hideyoshi had baked the cake, and that it was left to Ayasu to eat it. His part in this feast, however, was not destined to be much prolonged. The wounds he had received in the siege of Osaka Castle had never healed. The wounds of age were more serious still, for he was seventy-three years old. So it came to pass that on June the 1st, 1616, a few days after William Shakespeare had breathed his last on the other side of the planet, the great Tokugara passed to his rest. He had expressed a wish to sleep his last sleep at Nikko, and here his successor, Hiditada, prepared the shrine and mausoleum to which in 1617 the remains, according to some, nothing but a hair of his head, were transferred from Kumu. The tomb was in no way imposing, and in accordance with the ex-shogun's frugal desire, but afterwards by his grandson, Ayumitsu, it was made so extraordinarily magnificent that travellers from all over the world stand in wonder before the place. Opinions have differed as to whether one sees Nikko best amid the cherry blossoms of spring, or the gorgeous maples of the autumn, or the powdery snow upon the cryptomeria of the winter. At any time it is beyond description. Even more than Ayumetsu, one envies the poor daimyo who could contribute nothing to the planting of an avenue of cryptomeria. He could have had no idea of the distant beauty of his gift. It is with a kind of pain that one tears oneself away from the general effect to study of detail of lacquer, of gold, scarlet and black, but with a kind of relief that one leaves all of this to climb the two hundred steps which lead upward to the tomb itself. What a beautiful resting place for the greatest of the Tokara! Where on earth is there another couch for human dust, more impressive than here among the waving of giant trees and the splashing of cataracts reduced to falling mist, and to which the genius of the artist has brought his noblest gifts? Few will deny Ayasu's claim to the application of the familiar lines. Here's the top peak, the multitude below. Live for they can, there. This man decided not to live, but no. Buried this man there? Here. Here is his place, where meteors shoot, clouds form, lightnings are loosened, stars come and go, let joy break with the storm, peace let the dew stand, lofty designs must close in like effects, loftily lying, leave him still loftier than the world suspects, living and dying. Ayasu's courage and astuteness dominated not only the period of his own life, but also that of the two centuries more which followed. In his person he was by no means prepossessing, nor was he without many an unlovely trait of character. A miserly man, writing a bad hand, he had an ugly mien, says the Yaya Miwa. But the writer adds, when he gave commands on the battlefield or when hawking, he looked like a veritable war god, and his voice was then heard to a distance of seventeen or eighteen cho. I asked his countrymen regard him as a god, and as Goigan Sama, he is reverenced in his sumptuous shrine. Noble of the first degree of the first rank, great light of the East, great incarnation of Buddha. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of An Outline History of Japan。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 20 The First Successors of Ieyasu, 1605 to 1651. It is a generally held opinion that since the period of the Tokugawa shogunate was one of isolation from the rest of the world, it was therefore a period of stagnation. This is far from being the case. While we might readily discuss the advantages which, in all probability, Japan forfeited through her long seclusion, it is quite clear that seclusion is not in this case equivalent to lack of progress. In the first place, it must be noted that the period is one of practically unbroken peace. To those who think Japan as naturally belligerent and aggressive, it should come reassuringly that in less than fifty years, the empire was transformed from a medley of warring clans into a peaceful and peace-loving state. It is true that there was still plenty of fighting spirit in the south and in the northern part of the main island, also that peace was preserved through the efforts of an extraordinarily vigilant military feudalism. But the fact remains that peace was established and that this Pax Tokugawana, 
was maintained down to a time subsequent to the first treaties with the United States. In the second place, these two centuries were centuries of cultural progress. Education was improved and extended. Books were printed and circulated in large numbers. Art was cultivated over a wide range. The Tokugawa period, if in any sense an era of winter sleep, was nevertheless a real preparation for the new Japan which was to have its springtide in the age of Meiji. The Tokugawa shoguns, fifteen in all, carried out in the main the policy laid down by the founder of the line. The greatest of them, next to Ieyasu, were the third Iemitsu and the eighth Yoshimune. Murdoch regards the last named as the most respectable of the whole fourteen successors of Ieyasu. The majority simply followed along the channels created from the beginning. It is not too much to say with Murdoch that what really governed Japan for the next two centuries was not so much one or another of Ieyasu's commonplace successors as the system itself. Government by the abacus became the rule. There were only a few clashes between Kyoto and Yedo, and these were of small importance. Indeed, the two systems drifted so far apart that in Iemitsu's time, envoys had to be sent to the emperor's court to take a course in the Kuge etiquette. The conflict in the time of Hidetada was over certain irregularities in the imperial household. That of Iemitsu's time was over the irregular promotion by the emperor of certain Buddhist court chaplains. Regarded as a whole, the period was one of great and general prosperity, a period in which, as we have seen, Japan advanced notably in the cultivation of the arts and of learning. Yet the seeds of dissolution were very early planted by the Tokugawa themselves, and the revolution of 1867 would certainly have come about even without the black ships of Commodore Perry. We may think that the Tokugawas made a great mistake in conniving at Japan's long breach with her earlier history, but there must always be felt a certain reverence for the strong-willed clan which guided for so long the destinies of the island empire. The Tokugawas, who died prior to the revolution, six lie in the necropolis at Ueno, six at Shiba, and two at Nikko. The second Tokugawa shogun, son of the successive Ieyasu, was born in 1579 and had been his father's second in command at the Battle of Sekigahara, though he arrived too late on the scene to render any effective service. He succeeded the shogunate on Ieyasu's abdication in 1605, but exercised little authority until after his father's death in 1616. From that date till 1623, Hidetada ruled personally and with a good deal of judgment. Then he too retired in favor of his son Iemitsu, merely to see the opportunity during the next ten years of exercising control over the affairs of state without the responsibilities of office. He was not, like his predecessor at the helm, a great warrior, as his tardy participation in the Battle of Sekigahara would suggest. But his rule generally, the Christian persecution accepted, was characterized by justice and moderation. Murdoch describes Hidetada as a hard, painstaking, conscientious plotter. The work for which he is best known is the building of the great castle at Yedo, now the imperial residence. Some writers have said that so far as magnitude is concerned, this is comparable with the erection of the pyramids. But the principal interest of the reign is of a more tragic kind, since under the orders of Hidetada was launched one of the most ruthless religious persecutions the world has ever known. Less than six months after the death of Iyasu, a new edict was issued against the Christian religion in which the penalty of death was expressly stated. The threat had no terror, however, for the friars, whether you regard them as fanatics or as heroes. Undeterred by the fate of others, the vice-provincial of the Dominican and Augustinian missionaries came out from their hiding places and suffered decapitation. The populace, too, so far from being terrorized, were filled with admiration at the courage greater even than that of their own samurai. Many converts were made and went willingly to death. An old woman of ninety and a child a year old shared a common fate. Miracles were reported at the coffins of the martyrs. An old Franciscan priest, Father Juan de Santa Marta, who had already suffered extremes of torture, was brought to the block in 1618 and his body cut into little pieces. Soon after came the great martyrdom of Nagasaki, in which a large addition was made to the noble army of martyrs. Mr. Gubbins gives the following general summary of the persecution. We read of Christians being executed in a barbarous manner in sight of each other, 
of their being hurled from the tops of precipices of their being buried alive of their being torn asunder by oxen of their being tied up in rice bags which were heaped up together and the pile thus formed being set on fire others were tortured before death by the insertion of sharp spikes under the nails of their hands and feet while some poor wretches by a refinement of horrid cruelty were shut up in cages and there left to starve with food before their eyes let it not be supposed that we have drawn on the jesuit accounts solely for this information an examination of the japanese records will show that the case is not overstated even more horrors were to be experienced in the succeeding rule of iemitsu intimately connected with the effort to suppress christianity was the inauguration of a policy for the restriction of trade in sixteen seventeen foreign commerce was confined to the two ports of hirado and nagasaki in sixteen twenty one japanese themselves were prohibited from leaving the islands and in sixteen twenty four all ships with a capacity of over two thousand five hundred bushels were ordered burned from this time onwards it was lawful to build only small coasting junks the consummation of this policy also was destined to be witnessed in the ensuing reign estimates of the third tokugawa shogun vary greatly some regard him as the very greatest of iyasu's descendants others speak of him as a carpet knight and as without a genius it would however seem fair to concede that he left a distinct impress upon the tokugawa administrative machine born in sixteen three he succeeded his father nominally in sixteen twenty three actually in sixteen thirty two and held the office till his death in sixteen fifty one there was no question as to the significance of his policy twice he had occasion to make a demonstration against kyoto as a warning to those concerned and when he called the feudal chiefs before him in yedo he said bluntly it is my purpose to treat you all without distinction as my hereditary vassals he caused them all at the same time to swear allegiance by drawing blood from the third finger of the left hand the system of alternate residence by which every daimo lived for half the year at yedo leaving behind him for the remaining months hostages from among his wives and children was now regularly enforced iemitsu was the first shogun to employ the title of tycoon using it in a letter to the korean envoys to such displays of pride he was particularly prone yet the realm generally prospered under his sway yedo enlarged by the residence of the daimyo and their families was much improved aqueducts were built five lookouts established and bells hung to intimate by signal the locality of a conflagration in addition the great shrine at nikko was erected mints established for coinage and a survey of the entire empire carried out when iemitsu was upon his deathbed he suggested to his prime minister the propriety of observing the old custom of junshi following in death hota obeyed with a number of his retainers others who declined the invitation to follow their master to the yellow springs were much criticized the coup de grace to the custom was not administered till the time of Iezuna in 1668. The third Tokugawa shogun, like his grandfather, lies buried at Nikko, somewhat lower but in almost equal splendor. The persecution inaugurated by Hidetada was continued more and more systematically and relentlessly under Iemitsu. Fresh edicts were issued in 1624, 1633, 1634, and sixteen thirty seven by the shogun's orders the inquisitor or christian bugio did his work with frightful efficiency it is stated though the number is probably exaggerated that as many as two hundred eighty thousand persons suffered up to sixteen thirty five iemitsu required of every daimyo a definite profession of buddhism and of every temple an accurate role of its parishioners every person in the empire was supposed to be enrolled in one or other of these temples no government ever devised more atrocious methods of compelling recantation the kosatsu notice boards everywhere warned against the evil religion and offered rewards for the betrayal of its professors the ceremony of a bumi literally picture trampling in which the inmates of every house were forced to trample upon a picture of christ and the virgin mary was used systematically tortures and horrible forms of death such as the torment of the fossa were common everywhere so persistent and thorough was this attempt to exterminate the faith 
that mr w e h lecky cites it as at least one instance of a persecution which apparently achieved its end yet this was far from being the case many converts succeeded in spite of everything in handing down to later generations the tradition of their creed march seventeenth eighteen sixty five is now observed by the roman catholics as a feast under the name of the finding of the christians because of the discovery on that date of many eventually numbering two thousand five hundred in the neighborhood of nagasaki who had kept the faith a large proportion of the roman catholic christians of japan are still to be found in the districts evangelized by xavier and his successors moreover the steadfastness of the japanese christians in the days of persecution was marvelous and the number of apostasies exceedingly small the dutch trader caron testifies the number of christians was not perceptibly lessened by these cruel punishments they became tired of putting them to death and attempts then made to make the christians abandon their faith by the infliction of the most dreadful torments which the most diabolical invention could suggest the japanese christians however endured these persecutions with steadiness and courage very few in comparison with those who remained steadfast in the faith were the number of those who fainted under the trials and abjured their religion the persecution culminated in the district of shimabara though the great revolt which tacked for its suppression the resources of the bakufu for a hundred days actually came like a veritable bolt out of the blue goaded not only by the persecuting fury of the enemy but by the extortionate system of taxation the people of shimabara rose in rebellion saito says that the leader was basuda tokisada a hereditary foe of the tokugawas to gain support from the people he is said to have claimed divine aid and the power of working miracles by means of the influence thus gained he conquered amakusa murdered the governor of shimabara and shut himself up with thirty-three thousand persons including thirteen thousand women and children in the castle of that place here they withstood a violent siege until april twelfth sixteen thirty eight as the japanese guns were unequal to the task of breaching the walls dutch assistance was asked and koku becker head of the dutch factory came apparently without reluctance mr longford says to his own eternal infamy to the everlasting dishonor of his country he not only sent his greatest and most powerfully armed ships to shimabara which lay on the sea safe against any ships that the japanese possessed but went in command himself the dutchman's excuse was that according to instructions he was to save at any price the commerce with japan when at length the castle fell there was an indiscriminate massacre only a handful being spared the leaders were crucified decapitated or else compelled to commit sempuku still along the gulf at nightfall the pale red globes like colored bubbles drifting up and down the tide really the light from countless animalcules are known as the souls of christian martyrs not all dutchmen approved of the help given to the shogun by the factory dr kimfer the dutch historian comments as follows by this submissive readiness to assist the emperor in the execution of his designs with regard to the final extinction of christianity in his dominions tis true indeed that we stood our ground so far as to maintain ourselves in the country and to be permitted to carry on our trade although the court had then some thoughts of a total exclusion of all foreigners whatever but many generous and noble persons at court and in the empire judged quite otherwise of our conduct and not too favorably for the credit we had thereby endeavored to gain when the portuguese in sixteen thirteen tried to get the hollanders expelled from japan the shogun wrote as follows if the dutchmen were as black as the devils that came out of hell while they behaved honestly in their trade and minded nothing but trade they would be treated in japan like angels come from paradise somewhat smirched angels they must have appeared but at the sacrifice of accepting very humiliating conditions the dutchmen did secure the much coveted exemption from deportation which was the fate of the peninsula merchants but it was also clear that they were under an extreme form of surveillance in sixteen thirty eight they were ordered to demolish the warehouse at hirado on the pretext that they were too solid and handsome having been erected of stone the sign of the cross too suggested by the date a d on the front had to be obliterated the dutch share in putting down the shimabara revolt was not after all regarded as entitling the merchants to special consideration 
as the dutch historian somewhat naively remarks the better we deserved of them the more they seemed to hate and despise us so it came to pass that in sixteen forty one the traders were forced to accept for a residence the little island in the harbor of nagasaki called the shima just two hundred yards long by eighty wide it had already been connected by a causeway with the mainland in anticipation of its occupation by the portuguese here the hollanders found at once their commercial foothold and their prison they were allowed to merge only once a year for the purpose of making a ceremonial visit with presents to the shogun kempfer says so great was the alluring power of japanese gold that rather than quit the advantage of a trade indeed most advantageous they willingly underwent an almost perpetual imprisonment for such in fact is our stay in deshima and chose to suffer many hardships in a foreign and heathen country to be remiss in performing divine service on sundays and solemn festivals to leave off praying and singing psalms in public entirely to avoid the sign of the cross the calling upon christ in the presence of the natives and all outward marks of christianity and lastly patiently and submissively to bear the abusive and injurious behavior of these proud infidels towards us than which nothing can be offered more shocking to a generous and noble mind iemitsu's edict in sixteen thirty nine ran as follows for the future let none so long as the sun illuminates the world presume to sail to japan not even in the quality of ambassadors and this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death so falls the curtain upon japan for the space of two centuries at the very time when the english east india company was considering suggestions from holly bix mouchamp and Steele, their agents in the orient to send men to japan to show our manner of chivalry the door of opportunity which had stood open so invitingly to Saris was being closed and bolted while forecasting an era when will undoubtedly ensue that inestimable treasure by the trade of japan that all the world may dread the state of great britain for it is not only the purchase of china but all india will be at the beck of england the course of events was being inexorably shaped towards the complete exclusion of english shipping for more than two centuries as for the dutch ships restricted first to seven and eventually to one a year they were unable to do more than preserve to europe the knowledge that the empire of the rising sun still existed it is interesting to note too that during the napoleonic wars from eighteen eleven to eighteen fifteen after the capture of batavia by the english deshima was the only spot on earth where the dutch flag was still permitted to fly japan had willed an era of absolute segregation the sun goddess amaterasu had once again withdrawn within her cavern all trade even with the philippines with annam siam and china was definitely limited nor were japanese sailors driven by storms or ocean currents from the islands permitted to return the shellfish had resolved to guard itself against the fisherman's net spread over eastern seas by closing tight its shell to the outside world the consequences of such a policy for good or for evil we must now endeavor to trace End of chapter 20、Chapter 21 Chapter twenty one Ietsuna to Ietsugu, sixteen fifty one to seventeen sixteen. Ietsuna was the son of Iemitsu by a secondary wife, the late shogun's lawful wife having borne him no children. He was born in sixteen forty two, and so was only a child when called upon to succeed as shogun. Partly as taking advantage of his minority, and partly by way of reviving some of the old anti Tokugawa sentiment. There were in the first years of the new reign several serious mutterings of revolt. What is known as the Great Ronin Conspiracy of 1651 had indeed been plotted under Iemitsu, and but for a chapter of fortunate accidents might have proved successful. The most active leader was a remarkable man, one Yuino Shosetsu, and his plan was to burn Yedo 
and in the confusion secure the destruction of pakufu when the conspiracy was discovered yui committed suicide and other leaders were captured tortured and crucified an attempt was made to throw the blame upon the christian scum but there seems no ground for such a charge it might seem quite a work of supererogation to destroy yedo by arson since apparently by sheer accident yedo was in two successive years at about this time swept by terrific conflagrations in the former of these in sixteen fifty seven over one hundred thousand persons are said to have perished these fires however did not seem to hinder materially the growth of the bakufu capital and it was getting more and more difficult to supply the city with food one result of what is called the great ainu revolt a comparatively small affair in itself of sixteen sixty nine to sixteen seventy was the relaxation of the laws against shipbuilding so as to permit the transport of the tax rice to yeddo it was suddenly discovered that a week's interruption of the food supply would have brought the city close to starvation iyetsunu continued the policy of his father in most respects but there was considerably less strictness in enforcing the rule as to hostages remaining in the capital yet it was plain that the tokugawa shogun was beginning to degenerate and was in the not distant future to sink to the status of a mere figurehead as was the case with earlier lines of the shogunate as with these others so now it was beginning to be thought necessary for the shogun to have an adviser or prime minister who gradually became the responsible head of the government iyetsuna's prime minister was sakai tarakaio a man whose name has become a byword for cupidity and corrupt ambition possibly there is some injustice in this ill fame in any case sakai possessed real authority for he compelled an emperor to retire in favor of his heir apparent because the sovereign's unworthiness was properly associated with certain contemporary disasters the court of kyoto was most rigidly restrained from taking any part actively in the government even when the emperor gokomyo sixteen forty three to sixteen fifty four announced his intention of taking lessons in fencing he was pointedly reminded that the study of military matters did not become the imperial court what we have made here what is comparatively rare for these times an allusion to the sovereign we may remark further that gokomyo was the successor of the empress myosho sixteen twenty nine to sixteen forty three who herself was the granddaughter of the shogun Hidetada, and the first woman to occupy the throne of japan in eight hundred years the fall of the ming dynasty of china in sixteen forty four and the consequent invasion by the manchus threatened for a time to involve japan the famous pirates cheng chi lung and his son cheng chung kung better known as koshinga were resident in japan where the elder had married a japanese wife koshinga's exploits against the manchus remind us not a little of the feats of hereward the wake against the normans for twenty years the island of taiwan or formosa conquered from the dutch was held by the pirates as an independent kingdom had the mings made a more respectable showing against the invaders it is quite possible that when koshinga appealed to the yedo bakufu in sixteen fifty eight aid might have been vouchsafed the story of the famous buccaneer or at least some incidents thereof is given after very melodramatic fashion in a play by chikamatsu monzayemon entitled kukusenya kasen the battle of koshinga apart from this little flurry of foreign complication outside interests were as negligible as ever though king louis the fourteenth of france did prepare a letter to the emperor requesting an opening for the french east india company and although the english made another attempt to open the factory at hirado the french letter was never sent and the english effort ended once more in failure iyetsuna's one authoritative act was performed on his deathbed though even here the decision was more that of hota masatoshi one of japan's most famous ministers than the shogun's own the news had come that sakai takakiyo was conspiring after the old kamakura fashion to offer the shogunate on Yetsuna's death to an imperial prince oto masatoshi interposed objection to the dying ruler took immediate steps to defeat his prime minister's plan and to secure the accession of his brother tsuna yoshi thus Iyetsuna, having served even in the hour of dissolution the tokugawa idea 
died and was gathered to his fathers of the fifth tokugawa shogun tsuna yoshi we have a first-hand description from dr kempfer who interviewed him on several occasions the picture is perhaps unduly a flattering one and is worth transcribing at least in part zinajo that is tsuna yoshi who now sits on the secular throne of japan is a prince of great prudence and conduct an heir of the virtues and good qualities of his predecessors and withal eminent for his signal clemency and mildness though a strict maintainer of the laws of the country bred up in the philosophy of confucius he governs the empire as the state of the country and the good of his people requires happy and flourishing is the condition of his subjects under his reign united and peaceable taught to give due worship to the gods do obedience to the laws do submission to their superiors do love and regard to their neighbors civil obliging virtuous in art and industry exceeding all other nations possessed of an excellent country enriched by mutual trade and commerce among themselves courageous abundantly provided with all the necessaries of life and withal enjoying the fruits of peace and tranquillity how much of this is truth and how much is mere servile rhapsody certainly we must make a clear distinction between the tsuna yoshi of the early days and the tsuna yoshi of the latter there are several things to the credit of the former for example there is the shogun's insistence upon keeping the law as to shipping iemitsu had in spite of the law built a great ship the ataka maru which required a crew of several hundred men and a vast sum for its annual upkeep when tsuna yoshi ordered the breaking up of this vessel he replied to the remonstrances of his ministers that he did not wish so formidable a vessel at such a charge upon the treasury of the state tsuna yoshi also sought and rewarded people for filial piety and other commendable virtues and caused the biographies of such to be written and circulated the shogun also profited by the advice of his elders in the matter of studying the principles of confucianism chinese learning had become a perfect mania about this time and tsuna yoshi not only built a shrine to the great chinese sage at Ueno, but loved nothing better than to give lectures on confucius to his nobles or to listen to lectures given by hayashi nobuatsu so far all seemed roseate and this was coincident with the ascendancy of the very able minister already referred to hota masatoshi masatoshi had been largely responsible for tsuna yoshi's accession and he continued to make himself responsible for his sticking to the narrow way of duty but alas the minister's reward was to be assassinated on october eighth sixteen eighty four in the shogun's palace by a junior minister named inaba masayasu the assassin was related to his victim by marriage and the apparent absence of motive has given rise to the suspicion that possibly the deed was prompted by the shogun himself it was a national calamity of the first order the assassin was slain by the bystanders tsunoyoshi now showed himself tired of virtue and fell under the domination of a man of the very opposite type to hota masatoshi this was a squire of low degree yanagisawa yasuaki who has been called tsunoyoshi's earliest pupil in the confucian standards which both had professed to respect he persuaded the shogun that his failure to have male issue was because he had in a previous existence been unkind to dogs then followed the absurd craze for protecting dogs which went on till the whole land was overrun with them and yedo was filled with mangy curs whose yelping made sleep impossible at night human life was freely sacrificed to avenge any slight suffered by these highly privileged canines it was this eccentricity which earned for tsuna yoshi the name of the dog shogun kimfer has a somewhat different version as follows the now reigning emperor who was born in the sign of the dog hath for this reason so great an esteem for this animal as to the great roman emperor augustus caesar is reported to have had for rams the natives tell a pleasant tale on this head a japanese as he was carrying up the dead carcass of a dog to the top of a mountain in order to its burial grew impatient grumbled and cursed the emperor's birthday and whimsical commands his companion though sensible of the justice of his complaints bid him hold his tongue and be quiet and instead of swearing and cursing returned thanks to the gods that the emperor was not born in the sign of the horse because in that case his load would have been much heavier 
According to one account, the shogun was eventually slain by his own wife because of the insults to which the favorite Yoshiyasu had exposed her. The story is probably without foundation, as it appears that Tsunayoshi really died of smallpox. After his decease, as many as 6,737 offenders against his dog-protecting laws were released from the jails of Yedo alone. It was in this same reign that occurred a famous event which has been made familiar to Western readers in Lord Reedsdale's Tales of Old Japan. This is the Akko Vendetta, in which figure the 47 Rovmins, Knights Errant, or Gishi, loyal servitors, whose graves of the Sankakuji in Tokyo are still the object of devout attention to many thousands of visitors. The Haka, tombs, are still adorned daily with incense sticks and flowers. It was on February 3, 1703, that the forty-seven swordsmen, who had concealed their fell purpose for over two years by all sorts of strange devices, forced their way into the house of Yoshinaka Kiro to avenge the death of their liege lord, Asano Naganori, lord of Akko. After the bloody deed, the assassins were placed for a time under the charge of various daimyo until the decision of the shogun was rendered, ordering them to commit harakiri. This they did, and the graves of the forty-seven together, together with that of the Satsuma man who repented his misjudgment of their leader, are pathetic reminders of the tragic story. In regard to the ethics of the act, various opinions were expressed at the time, but Mr. Chamberlain says, The enthusiastic admiration of the whole people during two centuries has been the reward of their obedience to the ethical code of their time and country. The last years of Tsuna Yoshi's life were overclouded with misfortune. His unbridled extravagance brought on a period of dire poverty. Terrible earthquakes also devastated the country, and an eruption of Fujisan, the last on record, took place in 1707. The years from 1688 to 1703 are known by the year-period name of Genroku, a term synonymous with traditions of great artistic splendor and achievement. It was generally regarded as a triumph of the Tokugawa peace that so many had turned aside from the boorish devotion to arms and had taken to the arts. The isolation of Japan, moreover, had conduced to this artistic renaissance, and Tsunayoshi was a liberal patron of both the Kano school, represented at Yedo, and the Tosa school, which was patronized chiefly in Kyoto. Amongst those artists who became famous in this period may be mentioned the great Kano Tanyu, whose work is fortunately much in evidence at Kyoto, Sototatsu and Korin of the Tosa school, and not least Iwasa Matabe, who founded the Ugeyoe school, which, leaving subjects of medieval aristocratic life, went on to contemporary scenes and figures, and produced not only genre pictures in this style, but the now sought-after xylographs. Morunobu was another of the great artists of the close of the 17th century not to be overlooked. When we reflect upon the learning, when in the province of Satsuma, he came upon achievements of the period not only in painting, but in pottery, lacquer work, and metallurgy. We are quite ready to agree with those who speak of it as the heyday of Japanese art and culture. The close of Tsunayoshi's reign furnishes with a convenient point for summarizing the literary accomplishments of the first century of Tokugawa rule. Hideyoshi's wars had at least necessitated intercourse with Korea and China. Indirectly, this intercourse brought about the rise of a school of learning entitled Kangakusha, or the Chinese school. The earliest of the famous scholars associated with this movement was Fujiwara Seikwa, who was born in 1560. Eager for the study of Chinese, he was on his way to the motherland of the commentaries of the neo-confucian philosopher chu he from that day till his death in sixteen nineteen seikwa was the apostle of chinese learning and was fortunate in finding many enthusiastic disciples neo-confucianism took two somewhat divergent forms one school followed the above name chu he eleven thirty to twelve hundred called in japanese shushi the other followed wang yang ming 1472 to 1528, called in Japanese Oyome. The school generally regarded as orthodox was the former. Seikwa's pupils included Hayashi Rasan, or Doshun, 1583 to 1657, who was so devoted to study that the story is told of his seizing a few books in the midst of a great conflagration and continuing his annotations while being carried away in his sedan chair. Another was the famous Kaibara Eken, 
1630 to 1714, to whom is attributed, though wrongly, the authorship of the well-known Onadaigaku, Greater Learning for Women, a little handbook which eventually became an indispensable part of a bride's trousseau box. Ekken, however, did write much for the common people in the way of commentaries, essays on education, botany, and geography. In another literary category, we have a new form of drama, of quite a different sort from the classical no-dramas of the Ashikaga period. This is the joruri, or epical drama, of a romantic and even melodramatic character, written first for the ayatsuri, or puppet plays, such as survive today at Osaka, and later adapted by the kabuki shibai, or popular drama. In the later form, the dramas are known as the kyakuhon. The century actually opened with the dramatic dances performed by a woman, Okuni, who is generally regarded as the founder of the modern drama in Japan. The green sword, Shibai, in front of the temple on which Okuni performed, has given the name now used for all forms of the Japanese drama. The greatest dramatic author of Japan, Chikamatsu Bonzayemon, 1653-1724, the Shakespeare of Japan, belongs to this period. Chikamatsu, who was first of all a ronin, wrote fifty-one plays which were extremely popular, alike in Yedo, Kyoto, and Osaka. The contrast between these dramas and the early, again, the contrast between these dramas and the older No is so great as to suggest some Portuguese or Spanish influence, but no evidence has been discovered to support the theory. In the realm of poetry, we have a striking development or rather curtailment of the tanka in the reduction of the length of the poem from thirty-one to seventeen syllables the result is known as the haikai or hoku of which the classical example is a poem by lady chiyo which runs as follow asagao ni tsurubi tolerete burai mizu literally translated the verses by convolvulus well bucket taken gift water understanding might still lag painfully behind translation were it not explained that the poet visited her well in the morning to draw some water found the tendrils of the asagao morning glory twined around the rope rather than do violence to the delicate flower the poet went elsewhere for her day's supply mr frere champney has rendered the haikai as follows the morning glory's fragile tendrils twine around the rope with such bewitching spell i cannot bear to break the tender vine but draw my water from my neighbor's well it is a good example of the fact which every student of things japanese should heed that elsewhere language expresses thought and sometimes conceals it it is used generally in japan to suggest and stimulate it the greatest exponent of the haikai was basho sixteen forty four to sixteen ninety four a delightful bard of wandering propensity a mystic of the zen sect of buddhism and human at the ripe red of the heart to follow him in his wanderings and hear him expound why it is not poetry to write pluck off the wings from the dragonfly and behold a red pepper and why it is the genuine thing to write add wings to a red pepper and behold a dragonfly is to learn much of japanese poetry not in the court but in the village and among the common people there are few figures in the literary history of japan who more immediately inspire love and respect than basho Tsunayoshi was succeeded by his nephew, Ienobu, a man of mature years who had been designated as heir some five years previously. His brief reign gave promise of good things which, unfortunately, were not destined to be fulfilled. He was shrewd enough to perceive the dangers of the Tokugawa ascendancy, which the last few years had revealed, and set himself to counteract them with a good deal of energy. For example, he lost no time in abolishing the absurd rules for the veneration of dogs which Tsunayoshi had adopted at the grave of his predecessor he is credited with the following sensible and candid apology you desired to protect living animals and strictly interdicted the slaughter of any such you will that even after your death the prohibition should be observed but hundreds of thousands of human beings are suffering from the operation of your law to repeal it is the only way of bringing peace to the nation Ienobu found the financial condition of the empire, through the extravagance of the late shogun, well-nigh desperate, and his ministers were strongly inclined to seek relief by debasing the coinage. This evil was averted by the genius of one 
who without holding office was called to replace as adviser that sinister incubus the late shogun yanagisawa yoshiyasu arai hakuseki whose name arai spark was a reminder that he was born three weeks after the great fire of yedo in sixteen fifty seven is one of the best representatives of the kangakusha or chinese school of learning it was he who advised the shogun to abandon the old custom of forcing all members of the royal family except the very highest to take buddhist vows advice which led to important results since emperors have all been descended from a prince whom this exemption enabled to found a family hakuseki succeeded in placing the currency of the empire on a sound basis he conducted successful negotiations with korea and he was the shogun's unofficial adviser in many difficult transactions he is best known to us today as a writer and has given in a charming autobiography a very vivid description of the life of the time the title of the book burning faggots was suggested by a poem of the emperor gotoba whose memory of early days had been stimulated by the scent of the wood fires of his simple hearth in this and other works we have a picture of the author's early life with its spartan simplicity every day the little boy was compelled to write three thousand chinese characters and every night a thousand more keeping buckets of water close beside him on the veranda to throw over his head and shoulders when beset by fits of drowsiness hakuseki's greatest work is a history of the daimyo from sixteen hundred to sixteen eighty called the han kampu in thirty volumes it is like an open window on the manners and customs of the period and on the character of its chief personalities for example we are told of a celebrated judge of criminal cases Hide, that in judging a case he was always wont first to worship the gods of the atago next to grind tea in a tea mill to test the steadiness of his nerves and lastly to set a screen between himself and the accused lest he should be prejudiced by an unpleasing countenance incidentally we learn something of the shogun when hakuseki lectured on the chinese classics ienobu listened with the greatest respect refraining in summer from brushing off a mosquito and in winter when he had a cold in his head turning away from the lecturer before wiping his nose with the paper of which he kept a supply in his sleeve you may imagine he adds how quiet the rest of the audience were closely associated with the story of arai hakuseki is that of father sedotti an italian priest who managed to land on the satsuma coast in seventeen eight he was of course arrested soon after and then sent on to yedo where he was turned over to hakuseki for examination the account preserved of the discourse which ensued upon the merits of the christian religion serves to illustrate the difficulty which an intelligent japanese of the time must have experienced in understanding the doctrines of the faith Sidoti was reported as worthy of punishment, and Hakuseki suggested that the shogun had the choice of three courses. The prisoner might be deported, imprisoned, or executed. The second plan was decided upon, but it practically included the third, since the brave missionary died soon after in his dungeon. The seventh Tokugawa was the son of the sixth, and was fortunate in being able to avail himself of the services of hakuseki till an unlikely difference with his fellow ministers led to his retirement between the death of the late shogun and the appointment of the son there was an interval of five months but as a child five years old the new shogun could of course take no part in state affairs after less than four years occupation of the office ietsugu died with him expired the direct line of hidetada the foresight of ieyasu in naming the three families from which in such case choice could be made was now vindicated end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of an outline history of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 22. From Yoshimuni to Iiharu, 1716 to 1786. It should be remembered that Iiyasu had bestowed the right of succession, in case of failure of direct issue, on two other subordinate branches of the family. He had given to the three branches the important fiefs of Ki, Owari and Mito, respectively, 
and the three lines were known as the Gosan Kei, the three noble families. On the death of Ietsugu, it was from the Kii family that the new shogun Yoshimune was drawn, the great-grandson of Ieyasu and the grandson of Yorinobu. He was thirty-nine years old at the time of his accession, and had lived from early years among the fisher folk in quite straitened circumstances. This early experience familiarized him with the life of the common people, and helped to form the habit of simple living which distinguished him from some of his predecessors. He retained this simplicity throughout his life, wearing only cotton in summer and garments of hemp in winter. He labored hard to extend the principle of economy into the court life of Yero. With extraordinary courage he attacked not only the extravagances of the nobles, but of the ladies-in-waiting as well. An amusing story is told of his requesting the names of the fifty most beautiful ladies at the court. The compilation of this list excited the highest hopes in many female breasts, but conceive of the disgust of their fair ones when they learned that the fifty conspicuous beauties were to be sent packing, because they should have no difficulty in finding husbands, whereas those less favored by nature might legitimately expect the charitable hospitality of the shogun. It was from through Yoshimune's desire to rid himself of the cost of keeping up the defenses of Yedo Castle, that he planted around the walls the beautiful and graceful pines which are the admiration today of every visitor to tokyo also the fine plum and cherry groves in the neighborhood of the capital are due to the shogun's taste and eye for beauty yoshimune's policy harked back to the earlier and sterner days of the tokugawas and at the same time made him a precursor to the era of meiji he always prefaced his edicts with the words in pursuance of the methods fixed by the Golgan, and he worked hard to revive something of the old spirit of Bushido by the encouragement of horsemanship, hawking, and other outdoor sports. It was for this reason that he was sometimes called the Falcon Shogun. No Shogun ever strove so earnestly to make justice prevail in the land. He revived the use of the complaint box, putting a box into which people might drop their petitions in front of the Supreme Court building. He was also the first to cause the laws to be expounded in the presence of the people. The compilation of the code known as Oshiyoki Ojomoku, under the chief commissioner Matsudaira Norimura, gave Japan what has been termed the first genuine Japanese code. The Hundred Articles of Kwampu of 1742 must certainly be regarded as of the highest importance. It was also through the shogun's efforts that a chief justice was discovered for Yedo, whose remarkable decisions gained for him such titles as the Solomon of Japan and the Lord Eldon of Japan. This prodigy of learning and acumen was Oka Tadasuke, who assisted in the compilation of the work known as the Rules for Judicial Procedure. Yoshimune was a forerunner of modern Japanese statesmen in his zeal for advancing the industrial interests of the empire. He revised and stabilized the currency and did everything possible to encourage agriculture even making the way open for the skillful and pious farmer to become a samurai and bear a family name. Sugar, rice, tobacco, the orange, the sweet potato, and drugs were extensively grown. Fish curing was improved and irrigation extended. As for learning, although Yoshimune patronized the Neo-Confucianism of the Shushi school, he was the most open of all the shoguns to the advantages of foreign learning. He rescinded Iemitsu's edict prohibiting the importation of foreign books, keeping the ban only upon literature which was Christian. He was fond of astronomy and had a telescope erected at Kanda for his use. Thus, while the driving of specifically Japanese learning to the Kyoto court was preparing the way for a reaction against the Bakufu, the introduction of Western learning to Yero was preparing from another direction the like downfall for the machinery of the Tokugawas. All unconsciously, Yoshimune was a forerunner of the revolution in which the shogunate was to disappear. The permission for Japanese students to study the learning of the West in books of the Hollanders may surely be said to mark an epoch among the events slowly marching towards the appearance of the new Japan. The newer outlook is illustrated both by the appearance in Japan of such works as A Universal Geography and a History of Russia, and by the response given to the new light by a small transfigured band of Japanese scholars. 
in this connection aoki konyo a confucian scholar and the superintendent of the shogun's library may be mentioned because of his enthusiasm for the cultivation of the sweet potato as a means of averting famine aoki is known by the nickname inscribed upon his tombstone the sweet potato master he went to nagasaki in seventeen forty four and there gained a very considerable acquaintance with the dutch learning his services to his country were recognized in the forty-first year of meiji nineteen seven by the bestowal upon him by the emperor of posthumous honors there is a certain irony in the situation seeing that this pioneer of the new order through which the emperor was restored and the shogunate abolished was the personal representative of the shogun himself at nagasaki so little are the most sagacious capable of judging the ultimate results of their most deliberate policies yoshimune resigned his office in seventeen forty five to his son ieshige and without altogether relinquishing his control of affairs of state lived for six years longer of the three sons of yoshimune the second was decidedly the ablest but the ex shogun was looking forward to some additional years of personal control and he had already his eyes upon the third generation in the person of his grandson ieharu the son of ieshige so for the sake of the son who was in all probability destined to succeed him ieshige was appointed shogun and the two remaining brothers were consoled with an arrangement known as the gosan kyo analogous to the system of the gosan ke established not without subsequent advantage by ieyasu by means of this plan three chosen families were specially endowed with the revenue in order that in any future emergency they might one or the other provide a shogun from their ranks there is nothing much which it needs to be said of ieshige and little that is good the short-tempered shogun as he was nicknamed was not only a man of violent passions but he was weak debauched and incompetent while yoshimune was alive these ill qualities were to a certain extent concealed or nullified but after seventeen fifty one the shogun went from bad to worse and there was none to regret his abdication in sixteen seventy or his death just a year later ieshige was succeeded as yoshimune had anticipated by his son ieharu who born in seventeen thirty seven was now a young man of considerable promise but alas from the first he disappointed his well-wishers and placed himself under the direction of a favorite who has had few equals in infamy this notorious parasite was tanuma okitsugu and under the regime of this individual the fortunes of the empire sank to almost unbelievable depths bribery and corruption prevailed everywhere and social life was putrid with gambling and every other form of immorality to the misery brought about by human weakness and wickedness must be added that entailed by seven years of the wrath of heaven the series of dreadful natural calamities is almost unprecedented in the autumn of seventeen seventy one a hurricane swept over the country and destroyed a great part of the crops in the spring of seventeen seventy three a pestilence killed ninety thousand people in four months in seventeen eighty two a volcanic eruption burst forth from mount asama and buried a number of villages under mud and rocks in seventeen eighty three a famine reduced the people to such extremities that they subsisted on dogs cats rats herbs roots and bark the poverty was so general that at length ogitsugu issued an edict for the turning into the bakufu of all the gold from the temples this edict proved his last and the death of the shogun followed not long after the dismissal of his unworthy minister signs were already multiplying to show that the tokugawa dynasty of shoguns had about exhausted its mandate in the extreme north though almost unobserved by the agents of the bakufu the problem of foreign intervention was again raising its head through the advance of the russians towards the south from kamchatka but the most potent danger to the tokugawa supremacy was from within rather than from without even a century before the days of ieharu the seeds of a future revolt had been sown by a member of the tokugawa family no less a personage than mitsukuni the prince of mito sixteen twenty two to seventeen hundred grandson of ieyasu himself mitsukuni wrote or compiled the daini honshi the great history of japan in two hundred forty volumes this remarkable work which however was not printed until eighteen fifty one has been in its revolutionary influence compared with the famous dictionary of bale 
for the first time it directed the minds of men to the older traditions of the empire when such a thing as duarchy was unknown accordingly sir ernest sato looks upon mitsukuni as the real author of the movement which culminated in the revolution of eighteen sixty eight the prince of mito added to the services which he rendered to his country by the compilation of the dai nihonshi by securing the making of an anthology of the wabun or japanese style which may be said to have inaugurated the new literary movement away from kangakusha or chinese school this movement is known as the wagakusha or japanese school a movement destined slowly but surely to undermine and destroy the authority of the shogun it involved among other consequences what has been called the revival of pure shinto that is the freeing of japanese religion from all the buddhistic and other foreign influences which had especially associated themselves with the shogunal form of government it involved also a new enthusiasm of loyalty for the emperors and for everything connected with the imperial court at kyoto connected with this highly significant reaction are several of the most famous of japanese authors two of them belong particularly to the period covered in the present chapter namely kamo mabuchi sixteen ninety seven to seventeen sixty nine and motori norinaga seventeen thirty to eighteen one the former who to his own satisfaction traced his descent back to the divine three-legged crow which guided jimmu tenno in his conquests was called by his successor the parent of the study of antiquity he credited all the crimes which had ever visited japan on the pursuit of chinese learning and asserted that a philosophy which produces such efforts must be founded on falsehood motori was mabuchi's most celebrated pupil he wrote voluminously in favor of reviving the ancient faith and forms of japan to the outside world motori is best known by his beautiful tanka descriptive of the spirit of japan if one should ask you what is the heart of island yamoto it is the mountain cherry blossom which exhales its perfume in the morning sun motori's work was carried on after his death by a writer scarcely less famous hirata seventeen seventy six to eighteen forty three who brings the wagakusha movement well into the nineteenth century coincident with this remarkable revival of interest in things japanese as already illustrated in the case of yoshimune we find an increasing desire to become better acquainted with the wisdom of the west so far as this could be discovered through the books of the dutchmen curiously enough as we have already pointed out the two opposite movements ultimately served the same end namely the destruction of the shogunate even a sato finds the origin of the revolution in the historical research of the prince of mito professor ukita of waseda university traces it specifically back to march fourth seventeen seventy one when two japanese students sugita genpaku and meino ryotaku proved the superiority of western science by dissecting the dead body of a criminal and comparing the results with the dutch books of anatomy sugita genpaku seventeen thirty two to eighteen seventeen had carefully studied the old chinese system of medicine but all to no effect then his zeal for science led him to undertake the study of dutch and this in turn led to those attainments which earned for him in nineteen seven posthumous honors meno ryotaku known as the ranqua seventeen twenty three to eighteen three was a pupil of aoki konyo who taught him five hundred dutch words and started him on his career as a physician ranqua followed up his medical work with translations and the preparation of a dutch vocabulary his zeal earned for him in time the nickname of oranda geshin bewitched with dutch these men are only examples taken out of many of those who overcame the most prodigious difficulties and bore cheerfully all kinds of pains and penalties in order to extricate japan from the isolation to which the tokugawa policy had condemned her End of chapter twenty two
Chapter 23 of An Outline History of Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Luke Oldham An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan Chapter 23 Ienari to the Coming of Perry 1787 to 1853. For the next fifty years, there were brief interludes of time when the Tokugawa shogunate seemed almost to have renewed its vigorous youth. The young successor of Ieharu, Ienari, a great grandson of Yoshimune, proved an able and well intentioned ruler, even if he were unable to toil terribly, as did Yoshimune. He had the good fortune to reign longer than any of his line. 48 years in his own right. He had the still better fortune to secure the assistance of one of the very best of the Tokugawa ministers. This was Matsudaira Sadonobu, who had attracted notice by his publishing in 1786 the Sangoku Tsudan, Study of Three Countries, in which he directed attention to the growing Muscovite menace in the north. Sadonobu, who was a member of the Three Families, was attentive to everything in the empire, from the greatest to the least. He revised and reissued the Tokugawa Code, which had been promulgated in the days of Yoshimune under the name of the Hundred Laws and Regulations of the Tokugawas. He provided against famine by arrangements for the storing of grain. He made laws dealing with sumptuary matters of so meticulous a sort that they ordered the cost of wedding presents to be cut in half, prescribed the proper size for children's dolls, and forbade women to employ hairdressers for the arrangement of their hair. After the terrible fire in Kyoto in 1788, one of the most widespread conflagrations that ever devastated the imperial city, Sadanobu even undertook, on behalf of the Bakufu, to rebuild the royal palace. It is interesting to note, in view of the almost total eclipse of the Japanese sovereigns during this period, that the contemporary emperor, Kokaku, was a man of full age and ripe ability who was doing his best, considering his very limited opportunities, to fulfill the duties of his exalted station. It was a matter of general congratulation that there was at this time a wise emperor in the west, Kyoto, and a clever treasurer in the east, Yedo. When the 18th century came to an end, the Kwansei Peace, 1789-1800, to seemed to augur a long continuance of power for the Tokugawas and of prosperity for the country. Alas, that it was but a short-lived respite. The end of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe was the prelude to a new era of adventure on the seas for the nations involved. But even before this prolonged conflict had run its course and the new energies were released, there were indications that Japan's isolation was not so secure as she had imagined. In 1799, the London East India Company reported through its committee that the export trade to Japan could never become an object of importance to our manufacturers or serve as a vent for our produce on the ground that the only returns must be in copper, an article produced by our own mines, to the full extent of home consumption and foreign exportation. Nevertheless, Captain Broughton, in the Providence, made a survey of Japanese waters in 1795 to 1797, and landed on the coast of Yezo, Hokkaido. The natives he found civil to him on shore, but plainly anxious for his departure, and unremitting jealousy of foreigners seemed to prevail in every part of those seas at which the Providence touched. It is said that the merchants of Calcutta sent a richly laden ship under Captain Tory to Nagasaki in 1803, but the vessel was ordered to quit the coast within 24 hours. In 1808, the British frigate Phaeton, under Sir Edward Pellew, entered Nagasaki Harbor in search of Dutch prizes. It made no stay, but caused great excitement for a time. Several high Japanese officials committed suicide because of having allowed the great vessel to escape. It was from Russia in the north that the shoguns first found cause for apprehension. Here the knockings at the closed door were loud and insistent. The menace was sufficiently real to suggest the sending by the shogun of an expedition under Mamiya, which had the result of proving that Sakahalin, hitherto supposed to be a peninsula, was an island. 
The strait between the mainland and Sakahalan was named Mamiya Strait, in honor of the Japanese discoverer. In 1792 came Laxman, with the excuse of returning to their fatherland some Japanese shipwrecked sailors. In 1804, more castaways were brought by Rezanov to Nagasaki, only to be put off and eventually refused admission. About the same time, Captain Krusenstern came and opened up commercial negotiations, the Japanese asking whether Russia could furnish sugar, rye, skins, medicine, and many other articles, also expressing curiosity as to the number of ships which might be sent to Nagasaki. But next year, the exasperated northerners, under Twastov, invaded Sakahalin and threatened violence, an episode remembered to the Russian disadvantage when the Diana came under Captain Golonin in 1811. Golonin was on a cruise to survey the coast of Yezo when he landed with several of his crew at Kunashier. He was seized and sent first to Hakodate and thence to Matsumaye, where his imprisonment and that of his men lasted for about two years. Eventually, Captain Record arrived with proof that Golonin had had nothing to do with earlier depredations on the coast, and the captives were set at liberty. The incident proved the occasion for an exceedingly valuable and interesting narrative written by the captain, who had learned to appreciate the good qualities of the Japanese. He was prescient enough to write as follows. What must we expect of this numerous, ingenious, and industrious people who are capable of everything and much inclined to imitate all that is foreign, should they ever have a sovereign like our Peter the Great, and build ships on the model of those of Europe? I therefore believe that this just and upright people must not be provoked. Other similar failures might be mentioned, all of them showing a growing concern on the part of the Japanese and a growing disposition to take to heart the hitherto neglected matter of coast defense. American ships, too, now began to make their appearance in Oriental waters. The whole history of the American Republic, from the first period of colonization through its westward expansion to the Pacific, has been described as an episode in the long story of the rediscovery of the Orient. From the time when Hendrick Hudson ran aground off Albany, believing that he was nosing his way into the harbor of Canton, and from the day that La Salle disappeared into the Canadian forests with the word La Chine upon his lips, the obvious trend of American history has been to fulfill the dream of the voyagers of the 15th and 16th centuries. From the time of Captain Cook's discovery of the Hawaiian Islands, there were not lacking men who looked to the Orient for the fulfilling of American dreams of wealth. There were visionaries, so-called, like John Ledyard, merchants like Robert Morris or Stephen Girard, or John Brown, who, out of the proceeds of the Eastern traffic, founded Brown University. Cities like Salem, Providence, and Boston, which waxed rich upon the China trade. Joseph Hergesheimer has given us a vivid picture of this in Java Head. It was, of course, China that was the chief and earliest lure, since it was to the ports of that land that the whalers and fur traders could take their cargoes, or the New England Puritans, without too much prick of conscience, take sandalwood to the heathen for incense or opium for their smoking. The first American vessel to visit Japanese waters was the Eliza under Captain Stewart, an Englishman passing as an American. She did not, however, go to Nagasaki on her own initiative, but hired by the Dutch. On her own responsibility, she endeavored to return in 1803, but failed. From 1798 to 1803, the annual vessels were all American, hired by the Dutch, and the Japanese began to complain. They said that if there were no longer any Dutch ships, the reason for the Dutch occupation of Deshima no longer existed. But Cook's great discovery was already transferring the eyes of men to the Pacific in a new way. The founding of Astoria, the revival of whaling after the War of 1812, the possibility of marketing furs of the Northwest with huge profit in Canton, all led to rapid and unforeseen developments. Then the grievances of shipwrecked sailors, treated as though they had been criminal, began to appeal to the nation. The question soon came to be debated. If Decatur was sent to Algiers, why should not a squadron be sent to Japan? However, 
In the time of Shogun Iyanadi, the only steps taken were, first, the suggestion of John Quincy Adams as to the responsibility of the United States in the matter of reopening Japan, and, secondly, the plan of President Andrew Jackson in 1832 to send Edmund Roberts as American envoy to the Oriental courts. The interesting extensions and consequences of this new policy we shall see during the reign of the succeeding shogun. Meanwhile, the Dutch continued along their accustomed way, though their trade had now passed from the Golden and the Silver Age to that which, for several reasons, is known as the Brazen Age. But the Dutch influence upon the eager young patriots, who were becoming impatient of the restrictions imposed upon their curiosity by the shoguns, was greater than ever. In 1823 arrived the famous Bavarian physician, Dr. Siebold, in the service of the Hollanders, and to him flocked many of the students of the time. They reported that, while study at Yedo was like fighting on a mat, the studies at Nagasaki were like fighting in a real battle. Dr. Siebold found that the students who sought him might be divided into two classes. One class was chiefly concerned with the prospect of political reform, and the other with advance in medical knowledge. Among the latter was Unagami Zuiho, who, on one occasion, to gain food, begged at a farmer's door, after having administered a strong drug to the farmer's cow. On the alarm being given that the cow was violently sick, Unagami presented himself as a qualified medico and prescribed the antidote. The money offered by the grateful peasant enabled the needy student to get on to the next town. The career of Hirata Atsutane, 1776-1843, the follower of Motori as an exponent of Wa Gakusha, is almost coextensive with the rule of Ienari. Hirata was by no means alone in his reassertion of the divine right of the Mikado to rule as well as reign. He believed also in the divine descent of the Japanese people and to this attributed their immeasurable superiority in courage and intelligence to the natives of all other countries. Although, however, the turn of the tide against the claim of the shoguns is clearly observable, devotion to Chinese learning and philosophy was by no means exhausted. The struggle between the two Neo-Confucian schools of Chu Si and Wang Yang Ming, which was really one between dualism and monism, continued with the odds in favor of the former. Hitherto, literature had been largely aristocratic, but this age witnessed very interesting and important developments in the direction of popular and even sensational works of fiction. The two best-known novelists of the time are Santo Kyoden, 1761-1861, who wrote, among other things, an edifying storybook, a work sadly belying its title and Bakin, 1767-1848, who has been called the Japanese Dumas. Bakin, who resembles Scott much more than Dumas, is probably the most famous of all the fiction writers of Japan. His chief work is the Hakenden, Story of the Eight Dogs, an enormous work of over a hundred volumes in the Japanese. It contains the adventures of eight heroes of semi-canine origin who are intended after the manner of Fairy Queen, to represent the eight cardinal virtues. Another important novel of Bakin's is the Yumi Harizuki, recording the adventures of the great Minamoto archer Tametomo. A less important work, the Sei Yuki, Journey to the West, is the adaptation of a Chinese romance describing the adventures of Hyo and Sang, the famous Buddhist monk with his magician monkey. Many of Bakin's novels, Till the two friends fell out, were illustrated by the celebrated artist Hokusai. The Japanese art of this time is varied and important. Many great names suggest themselves. In pictorial art, we have Okyo, founder of the naturalistic school, Sosen, the Japanese land seer, Kiyonaga, and Hokusai, whom Whistler calls the greatest pictorial artist since Van Dyck. Okyo, 1732-1795, in his youth copied the Dutch, imitating with his brush even the line of the engravings. He was particularly interested in animal life, and the beautiful story is told of his working in the cave studio to paint a live wild boar. Over and over again he painted the animal, only to obtain from the hunters, whom he consulted as critics, 
the disappointing verdict that his boar was dead. When, at length, over his latest effort, they declared that the beast was alive but still asleep, he knew that he was making progress. Okyo painted other subjects besides animals, and the Daijo Temple at Kamizan, in which every room carries out a separate idea, is a crowning example of his superb art. Sosen, 1747-1821, was also a lover of animal life and lived long in the forests to learn how best to depict the monkeys, which are regarded as his masterpieces. The name of Hokusai is probably the greatest in the history of Oriental art. Although the Japanese might not altogether concur in the enthusiasm of the Western estimate, the old man mad with painting, as Hokusai called himself, lived from 1759 to 1849, only to feel his long life inadequate for expressing the full fecundity of his genius. At the age of 75, he wrote as follows. From my sixth year onwards, a peculiar mania of drawing all sorts of things took possession of me. At my fiftieth year, I had published quite a number of works of every possible description, but none were to my satisfaction. Real work began with me only in my seventieth year. Now, at seventy-five, the real appreciation of nature wakens within me. I therefore hope that at eighty I may have arrived at a certain power of intuition which will develop further until my ninetieth year, so that at the age of a hundred I can proudly assert that my intuition is thoroughly artistic. And should it be granted to me to live a hundred and ten years, I hope that a vital and true comprehension of nature may radiate from every one of my lines and dots. Hokusai lived, in fact, into his ninetieth year working and learning, like Michelangelo, up to the last. He left behind him five hundred volumes of drawings, which served to illustrate almost every phase of Japanese life and scenery. Another branch of art which at this time attained its most striking manifestation is that of color printing. The woodcuts of Japan, which reflect common rather than artistic life, have become deservedly famous. The primitive masters began as early as 1625, with Norunobu. From that time onwards, the outstanding figures are those of Haranobu, 1764-1780, Shigemasa, 1740-1819, Masanobu, 1716-1816, Utamaro, 1753-1797, and Hiroshige, 1796-1858. This last has been regarded by many as the foremost landscape painter of Japan. His farewell verse has become as well known as some of his pictures. I leave behind my brush at Azuma and go on to the journey to the Holy West to view the famous scenery there. In many other directions than those mentioned, not least in the casting of bronzes and the carving of Netsuke, this period of Japanese art is noteworthy and indeed deserving of intensive study. In 1836, the empire was facing a very serious condition of famine and poverty. So desperate had men become that a patriotic official, Oshio Heihachiro, after stripping himself of all his possessions in order to relieve the necessities of the poor, led a revolt at Osaka against the shogun charging that much of the prevalent ill fortune was due to the wrongful treatment of the emperor. The attempt was premature and, on its failure, after 18,000 buildings had been burned at Osaka, Oshio committed suicide, leaving behind him an explanation of his action. A more practical effort in the direction of remedying a bad situation is seen in the life and activity of the famous Ninomiya Sontoku, 1787-1857. This great agricultural reformer and sage, who in his early days endured the nickname of Crazy Kinjiro, had an immense deal to do with the development of Japanese agricultural resources through the Hotoku Society and by the inculcation of the virtue of thrift. He said, If you are in debt, you must paste up the amount in front of the kamidana, god shelf, so as to see it every morning. He told how Junsaku kept the old rope of wisteria vine which had been used by his ancestors to bind heavy burdens on their backs. On it was written, Our descendants must not forget the industrious spirit of their ancestors. 
He scolded a servant for exhibiting indecision of mind by not slicing the radish through. How Suntoku restored the impoverished Soma estate and brought it to prosperity is one of the most interesting stories of Japanese industry, tact, and real religious optimism. In the case of the shogun, the miseries of the time led to his abdication in 1837 in favor of his son, Ieyoshi, though for some four years more he lived to take more or less part in the administration. Under the new coming shogun, the signs of imminent downfall multiplied around the Tokugawa edifice. The main causes may be summarized as follows. 1. The empty treasury which no economies, it seemed, availed to fill. 2. The increasing restiveness of the Tozama daimyo, or outside feudatories, who were beginning to see the possibilities of a rallying point in the imperial court. 3. The growing ardor of devotees of foreign learning for the restoration of intercourse with the outside world. 4. The pressure exerted from without on the part of Western nations to obtain admission to the Japanese ports. The history of Ieyoshi's tenure of power gathers about these four heads. Of the former two, little needs to be said here. To replenish the treasury, a very able statesman, Mizuno Tadakuni, generally known as Echizen no Kami, labored for many years, but fate was against him. The whole period of the so-called Tempo Reformation, 1830 to 1844, was one in which, wave after wave, natural calamities came to add to the economic despair. Moreover, Echizen no Kami overshot his mark, and by the severity and extravagance of his demands created widespread irritation and opposition. The agitation among the outside feudatories was the culmination of long and only slightly concealed hostility to the Tokugawas. To make use of this accumulating disaffection, the opportunity was at last at hand. In 1846, the Emperor Komei succeeded his father Ninko and began at once to assert himself, alarmed apparently by the French menace in the Ryukyu Islands and by the signing of the Treaty of Nanking by the Chinese in 1842. The College of Nobles, which had been established in Kyoto by his predecessor, was also exhibiting tendencies which seemed dangerous to the ascendancy of the Tokugawas. Komei began to insist upon the submission to him of all questions of foreign policy and, moreover, carried his point. While much has been written with regard to the pressure exerted by foreign nations upon the stubborn, seclusive policy of Japan, little has hitherto been said concerning the forces which were operating from within to effect a change. It is necessary, therefore, to stress somewhat the point that the latter are at least as important as the former. As in some terrible mine explosion through which hundreds of men are entombed, we may know more of the efforts made from outside to break through the imprisoning wall of rock, yet must also take account of the constant tap-tap of the picks working for deliverance from within. So it is manifestly our duty to supplement the familiar story of the coming of Perry with the less known but nevertheless important episodes which bring us before some of the prophets of the new day in Japan herself. The story of these heroes, who were ready to brave imprisonment and death to hasten the re-emergence of the sun goddess from her cavern, is a very inspiring one and should be better known than is unfortunately the case. They were aware that the new sunlight, when at length it should stream through the gap, would shine upon their own dead bodies. They might even be entirely without recognition to the cause they served unknown. But they believed, nevertheless, that the outside light might burst upon them and dispel the fumes of their night. Robert Louis Stevenson, in his Familiar Studies of Men and Books, has written of one of these heroes of whom he accidentally heard through his friend, Mr. Masaki. He says in commencing his essay on Yoshida Torajiro, The name at the head of this page is probably unknown to the English reader and yet I think it should become a household word like that of Garibaldi and John Brown. Alas, the great novelist's hope has not yet been realized. Most of these great-hearted gentlemen are still among those who lie in the myriad graves of old with never a story and never a stone. Yet the fame of men like Rin Shihei, 
Kwazan Watanabe, Shozan Sakuma, and the rest must sometime reach the West for its enlightenment and its inspiration. It will not be amiss, even in such a summary as the present, to say something of one of them. This distinguished pioneer of the New Japan was born some thirty miles from Sendai in 1804 and fled from the house of his adopted father in 1820 to pursue learning in Yedo. Here he barely saved himself from starving by practicing massage at night after a strenuous day of study at school. After a time, he put himself under a student of Dutch medicine, and it was while gathering herbs over the countryside that he became impressed with the general poverty and misery of the populace. After periods of hardship during which he had even to sell himself for a time to discharge a debt, Takano was enabled to get to Nagasaki, where the famous Dr. Siebold had but lately arrived. Here he began to work and write for the redemption of his country from disorder and misrule. A list of 51 separate works in 213 volumes includes such subjects as a treatise on analytical chemistry, on pneumonia, on ulcers, a treatise on coast defense, on soap, the essentials of gunnery, a comparative grammar of Chinese, Japanese, and Dutch, a treatise on the eye, a treatise on astronomy, on the thermometer, etc. But the most important work of all, an epoch-making work in its influence on the reopening of Japan, was the Yume Monogatari, The Story of a Dream, in which the author, who had got wind of the expected coming of the ship Morrison, defended the idea of renewed intercourse. The argument was put into the form of a dream to avert the wrath of the authorities, but in this it did not succeed. From that day to the end, Nagahide led the life of a hunted criminal, imprisoned and escaping, through a fire, only to be recaptured eventually through the treachery of one to whom he had played the part of benefactor. When the fugitive, who had burned his face with saltpeter to avoid recognition, knew that the toils of the law were drawn tightly about him, he made the requisite preparations and, with all the old heroic etiquette, took the way of the samurai out of life. Such a summary does little justice to the story of a great career, but sometime the life and death of Takano Nagahide, Kwazan Watanabe, and their fellows will be fully and worthily told. Meanwhile, the ships of the foreigners were more and more insistently appearing on the coasts of Japan. The shogun was beginning to realize that he was between the hammer and the anvil, for with all his desire to maintain inviolate the seclusion of his country, none knew better than he the weakness of the land in the face of the naval forces such as had recently made a break in the brazen walls of the Middle Kingdom. Moreover, there were many enemies at Kyoto who were only too eager to detect signs of weakness in the Bakufu. The Morrison, in 1837, was chartered by Mr. C. W. King, an American merchant residing at Macau, to take back to Japan a little company of seven shipwrecked sailors. It came with men on board such as Peter Parker, Gutzloff, and S. Wells Williams, but was fired on in Yedo Bay, so that the merciful mission had no other apparent result than to increase the prevalent exacerbation. It is said that the account written by Mr. King of his adventures here and elsewhere is the first American book about Japan. The story of some of the Japanese sailors saved by the foreign ships has in it quite an element of romance. There is, for example, the Japanese found adrift and taken to China who became known as Sam Patch because he was forever wailing Shimpai, trouble. More interesting still is the story of Manjiro Nakahana, who drifted away in 1841 and lived for nearly six months on a little rocky island upon turtle and bird's eggs. He was taken off on June 27, 1841, by Captain Whitfield of the John Howland, and christened John Mung. Subsequently, he visited America with the first Japanese mission to the United States, in 1860, and later still became a professor at the Imperial University of Tokyo. In 1843, the Japanese had issued an edict forbidding the return of any Japanese shipwrecked sailors in vessels other than those of the Dutch or the Chinese. This was because they suspected ulterior motives on the part of the Americans 
as in the case of the Morrison in 1837 and the Manhattan at a later date, who attempted to discharge what seemed to be but a humanitarian duty. But, apart from such things as this, many circumstances were conspiring together to make American intervention for the reopening of Japan a certainty. After the American Treaty with China in 1844, the United States minister, Mr. Caleb Cushing, was given full power to make overtures to the Japanese authorities for a similar arrangement. In this, there was no suggestion of a desire for political advantage, but merely the wish to protect the American whalers who, after 1820, had begun to be numerous in the northern waters of Japan. It was in line with this wish that, in 1845, Mr. Zadok Pratt, congressman for New York, urged the sending of an embassy to Japan and Korea, even advising hostile action in the event of a refusal. So, in 1846, Commodore Biddle was dispatched with instructions to secure communication with the emperor. So far was he from succeeding that, after ten tedious days of waiting, the commodore received an unsigned and undated letter requesting him to leave the harbor of Yeddo at once and to refrain from returning. It is said also that a gentle push from a Japanese soldier hastened his retreat from the junk on which he had been awaiting an answer. Mr. Everett of the United States Legation at Macau wrote to the Secretary of State at Washington that Biddle's attempt had placed the subject in a rather less favorable position than it stood before. While Biddle was at Yeddo, though unknown to him, there were quite a few American sailors held in some form of durance as spies or for attempts to escape from the islands. In addition to the shipwrecked survivors of the Ladoga and the Lawrence, there was the famous Ranald MacDonald of Astoria, who may, with good reason, be regarded as the first American resident in Japan. He was the son of a Scotsman and an Indian woman who, when off the coast of Japan, had insisted on being put ashore in a small boat. He was, of course, imprisoned, but became, nevertheless, the first teacher of English to a few Japanese who sought his help. His cage at Nagasaki is said to have been a house of reception lit with wax candles on low square stands. Men of all orders came to see and talk with the first teacher of English in Japan. To rescue these, as well as to repair the failure of Biddle, Commander Glynn was sent early in 1849. After some preliminary difficulties, during which the Japanese made some threats of an offensive demonstration, the prisoners were delivered up to the American ship, the Preble. On returning to the United States, Commander Glynn strongly advised the government to press further for the establishment of intercourse with Japan in the interests of civilization as well as of American commerce. He pleaded further that this should be carried out by naval officers of tact and that the proper steps should be taken to conciliate the Dutch and to allay the suspicions of the British. It was in consequence of this appeal, as well as in accordance with the personal policy of President Fillmore, that Commodore Aulick was sent in June 1851 to obtain from Japan the threefold right to take off shipwrecked sailors, to obtain supplies for the ships, and to trade at one or more of the Japanese ports. Aulick apparently was not one of the naval officers of tact, for within the year he was recalled but the plan was by no means given up. The settlement of the Oregon question and the acquisition of California had made more important than ever the prestige of American commerce on the Pacific. Pressure, from being spasmodic and occasional, was becoming continuous. The Yeddo government must have come to realize the shadow of impending change. The presence of a French vessel at the Ryukyu Islands and the letters of the King of Holland in 1847 and 1849, advising the opening of the ports, had been disturbing enough. Now it was the persistent effort of the United States which had to be reckoned with. The final blow, following upon which the long closed doors were to be thrown open to the world, came in 1853, when Commodore M. C. Perry, was appointed to take up the unfinished task of Aulik. The story of this epoch-making adventure we give in the ensuing chapter. End of chapter 23
of an Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Luke Oldham. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 24 The Reopening of Japan, 1853 to 1854. Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry, who on July 7, 1853, entered the Bay of Uraga on his memorable mission, has been called the last executor of Columbus, as the man destined to pick up the broken thread of westward expansion and carry it on to the Orient. He had with him on his first visit 560 men in two steam frigates, the Susquehanna and the Mississippi, and two sloops of war the Plymouth and the Saratoga. In the excited imagination of Kyoto, the number was swollen to a total of a hundred ships and a hundred thousand men. Perry's mission was to use persuasion, if possible, but there can be little doubt that in the last resort he was prepared to use force in order to achieve his object. That this was the current impression among those Americans who did not either ignore or ridicule the expedition is plain from the following quotation from the New York Herald of the time. The Japanese expedition, according to a Washington correspondent, is to be merely a hydrographical survey of the Japanese coast. The 32-pounders are to be used merely as measuring instruments in the triangulations. The cannonballs are for procuring the base lines. If any Japanese is foolish enough to put his head in the way of these meteorological instruments, of course nobody will be to blame but himself if he should get hurt. So again, the London Punch puts it, Perry must open the Japanese ports, even if he has to open his own. The general tendency, however, at least in America, was to deal with the matter indifferently or ironically. Dr. Edward Everett Hale wrote, the funeral of Bill Poole, or the filibustering operations in the Gulf of Mexico, have, naturally, awakened more interest among the people than has the opening, by peaceful diplomacy, of the Italy of the East to the intercourse of the world. Dr. Nitobe says, Looking through a number of newspapers and periodicals of the time, I am struck with the absence of public sympathy covering an enterprise of which the United States can be so nobly and justly proud. A Philadelphia paper reported, through its Washington correspondent, There is no money in the Treasury for the conquest of the Japanese Empire, and the administration will hardly be disposed to pursue such a romantic notion. Only two days before the sailing of Perry, the Baltimore Sun said, of the expedition, It will sail about the same time with Rufus Porter's aerial ship. Nevertheless, Perry did sail with his formidable fleet and with instructions which are sufficiently clear. It was to be impressed upon the Japanese that the mission was one of peace. The United States were quite independent of the British, who had so recently waged war upon the neighboring empire of China. All that was wanted was friendship, commerce, the humane treatment of shipwrecked sailors, access to coal, and provisions. As to the treatment of sailors, President Fillmore's letter affirmed, we are very much in earnest about this. Between the two visits, a new administration came into power at Washington, and the new president, Mr. Pierce, thought it necessary to send, through his secretary of the Navy, an additional warning to the effect that peaceful negotiation was all that was intended. When Perry presented his letter, which was addressed by President Fillmore to the emperor, the shogun Ieyoshi, and his minister, Abe Masashiro, upon whom the weight of decision most immediately lay, found themselves in a sad dilemma. Against all Tokugawa tradition, Ieyoshi decided to call a meeting of the feudatory princes. The court at Kyoto, more consistent but less well-informed as to the extent of the danger, appealed to the gods of the various shrines, as in the old days of the Mongol invasion. In the case of the shogun, action of some kind was plainly imperative, and that immediately even though it disregarded the opinion of the daimyo and the court officials. So once again, in flagrant disregard of all Tokugawa precedent, the Americans were allowed to land and leave their letter, instead of transmitting it through the usual Dutch channels from Nagasaki. 
it is clear that the shogun's ministers felt the necessity a very humiliating one, but there was no help for it, and greater concessions were to follow. Dr. S. Wells Williams, who had come with the expedition as interpreter, was well warranted in writing in his journal of July 14, 1853. This closed the eventful day, one which will be a date to be noted in the history of Japan, one on which the key was put into the lock and a beginning made to do away with the long seclusion of the nation. It is therefore fitting that the site of the landing should be marked, as it is, by an obelisk with the inscription contributed by no less a man than Prince Ito. Perry was well advised in not pressing for an immediate answer. He sailed away to his winter quarters in China, where, owing to the Taiping Rebellion, the presence of American ships was warmly welcomed. He had promised to return early in the spring, and the promise was only one of the many anxieties left with the Bakufu. Eight days after Perry's departure on July 27, 1853, the shogun Ieyoshi died, and the succession of Iesada, to whom we shall refer again presently, did nothing to allay the consternation of the government. Beacon fires flamed from hilltop to hilltop, yet, to those who knew, the defensive power of the empire was at the lowest ebb, and while expectation of Perry's black ships was heavy upon them, the Russian admiral, Putiatin, was on his way with the double purpose of watching the Americans and of demanding a commercial treaty of his own. Moreover, the French frigate Constantine was also in the neighborhood, and who could say how many other eagles were gathering for their share in the prey? As we have seen, the shogun Ieyoshi escaped from his perplexities by an opportune demise, but his successor, even with the help of Abe Masahiro, was in no way better fitted to deal with the embarrassing situation. Ieyasada was a kind of semi-idiot, a witling, as Brinkley calls him. He had been selected for office against the strongly expressed desire of many for Keiki, the very capable representative of the Mito branch of the Tokukawa family. But Keiki's tendencies were towards liberalism and the reception of the foreigners, so the degenerate son of Ieyoshi was preferred. It is possible, of course, that the personality of the shogun now counted for little in any event, as the struggle was really between principles which were gradually being set in battle array one over against the other. After Perry's departure for the winter, it was plain that there were three parties in evidence. There was the Liberal Party, now represented by the shogun's ministers, prepared perforce to make a treaty with the foreigner. There was, secondly, the Party of Compromise, prepared to yield temporarily in order to obtain a respite for the purpose of providing a more adequate national defense. There was, lastly, the chauvinistic party, with its slogan, Sun O Jo I, Revere the Emperor, Expel the Barbarian. Hasty efforts were indeed being made everywhere, and by all parties, to remedy the evils which had accrued through long immunity from war. Forts were built, the old edict of Iesada against shipbuilding rescinded, cannon cast from the bells of temples, books on military science sought for high and low. But the ministers of Iesada knew all the while, as the other parties did not, the hopelessness of resistance and, even before the return of Perry, they had chosen their policy, whatever the patriots might say about it at Kyoto. Commodore Perry returned on February 13, 1854 with greatly increased forces. Eventually, he found himself in command of ten ships and two thousand men. It did not take long now to establish such contact with the government as to bring about the desired result. The first meeting was appointed for March 8th. It is amusing to note that in landing, the American officers in anticipation of a substantial feast took their knives and forks with them. They resented greatly the flimsy banquet, which gave them no opportunity to use these weapons. On March 31st, a day forever memorable in the history of the Pacific, Japan gave her adhesion, through the Bakufu, to the first formal treaty with any Western country. The Commodore was evidently very much possessed with the importance of the occasion and showed a certain histrionic ability to utilize the opportunity. When he landed at Yokohama for the ceremony, First went two gigantic Negroes carrying the American flag, then followed the Commodore and his officers in full uniform. 
After these came the band playing Yankee Doodle. And lastly were the sailors with naked cutlasses guarding the presents. Perry may be excused for being a little rhetorical at the time, but his declaration that, if the Japanese came to the United States, they would find the navigable waters of the country free to them, and that they would not be debarred even from the gold fields of California, does not today have about it the ring of an inspired prediction. The Treaty of Kanagawa contains twelve articles, of which the principal provided for the hospitable treatment of shipwrecked sailors, the provisioning, under certain circumstances, of foreign ships, and the use of the two ports of Shimoda and Hakodate, the two worst harbors in the country. In the exchange of courtesies which followed, we find mentioned a long list of presents to the emperor, empress, and princes. They include much Madeira, whiskey, champagne, and perfumery, but also such more generally useful articles as books, telegraph wire, model engines, agricultural implements, charts, clocks, stoves, etc., down to rifles, revolvers, and swords. Griffiths asserts that the emperor never saw his presence, as in 1872 they were still lying in mildew, rust, and neglect in the ancient home of the Tokugawas. When Perry sailed away with his ships, there was great commotion in Japan, but few people outside realized that a new era had commenced for the whole of the Oriental world. The American treaty, negotiated by Perry, was speedily followed by the signing of a similar treaty by Admiral Stirling at Nagasaki on behalf of Great Britain, October 31, 1854. A like arrangement was made with Russia on February 7th of the next year, and one with Holland on January 30th, 1856. The only change made in these was the substitution of the open ports, Nagasaki and Shimoda in the English treaty for Shimoda and Hakodate in the others. As these treaties, however, did not provide for any extension of commerce, the United States government entrusted the securing of a commercial treaty to its first consul general for Japan, Mr. Townsend Harris, who, as provided by the Kanagawa Treaty, was permitted to take up his residence in Japan, August 1856. The story of Mr. Harris's labors is, Mr. Longford writes, one of marvelous tact and patience, of steady determination and courage, and straightforward uprightness in every respect. Dr. Natobe also bears witness as follows, a man of stern rectitude and gentlest powers of persuasion. He, indeed, more than any other, deserves the epithet of benefactor because in all his dealings with us, the weaker party, he never took advantage of our ignorance, but formulated a treaty with the strictest sense of justice. Harris began his work with the Bakufu government at Shimoda, and, by June 1857, had secured the grant of the treaty requested. But, as delays were constantly occurring, the consul general journeyed to Yedo and, after a remarkable display of tactful persistency, and possibly some hint as to the lessons to be learned from the contemporary operations of the British in China, succeeded in getting the treaty signed on July 29, 1858. By this important document, Kanagawa and Nagasaki were to be opened from July 4, 1859, Niigata from January 1, 1860, and Hyogo, Kobe, from January 1, 1863. Yedo and Osaka were likewise to be opened for residence and trade. The trampling on the cross and other enactments hostile to Christianity were to be abolished. The principle of extraterritoriality, whereby Americans were to be tried in their own consular courts, was conceded. Americans were permitted to move freely in the neighborhood of the open ports in a space of about 25 miles and to have, in the regions open to them, the extension of religious tolerance. A tariff was fixed by treaty, and the importation of opium was prohibited. The United States, at the same time, offered to sell to Japan ships of war, steamers, and arms, and to lend officers and artisans for instruction in the various arts, including, of course, that of war. The treaty, with its somewhat galling implication of Japanese inferiority, was destined to remain in force many years. One modification was tacitly permitted. 
The merchants from outside were in such a hurry to enter the ports that Yokohama was occupied for business while the diplomats were arranging for their settlement at Kanagawa. Shimoda was closed within a few months of the signing of the treaty. It was, of course, necessary, if the treaty was to be strictly legal, for the emperor's consent to be gained, and it was while efforts in this direction were being made that certain important political changes were made. The minister, Hota Masahiro, who tried in vain to overcome the reluctance of the emperor Komei, resigned and was succeeded by the famous statesman who is generally known as I Kamon no Kami. This was the man fated to endure, and suffer for, the odium incurred by making terms with the foreigner. At this stage, too, occurred the death of the physically incompetent shogun Iesada, with or without medicine. It did not escape the notice of the Japanese that on the occasion of each of the treaty signings the event was coincident with the death of the shogun, who was held officially responsible. The accession of the new shogun was preceded by a sharp conflict at Kyoto over the succession. The desire of most men was for Keiki Yoshinobu, son of Nariaki of Mito and already a man of matured convictions. But it was this, together with the fear of his liberalizing tendencies, which threw the influence of the court party into the scales in favor of Iemochi, the thirteen-year-old son of Nariyuki, of the key branch of the Tokugawa family. So Iemochi became the fourteenth Tokugawa shogun, with I Kamo no Kami as his title or prime minister. The first important business was to carry through the provisions of the Treaty of 1858, which had, of course, been followed up by similar treaties made with Great Britain, through Lord Elgin, Russia, through Putyatin, France, through Baron de Gross, and also with Prussia and Holland. In consequence of the British treaty, Mr. afterwards Sir, Rutherford Alcock, arrived in the following spring as the first British diplomatic representative. Lord Elgin has recorded the impression made by his own visit to Japan as a green spot in the desert of my mission to the east. He adds, One feels as if the position of a daimyo in Japan might not be a bad one, with two or three million of vassals, submissive but not servile, because there is no contradiction between their sense of fitness and their position. The experience of Sir Rutherford Alcock, as given in his Three Years in Japan, hardly bears out this sanguine opinion, as we shall see a little later. One interesting result of the treaties, in the way of new departure, was the resolve of the shogunal government to send missions abroad to foreign nations, bearing copies of the epoch-making documents. The first of these missions visited the United States in 1860, in the last year of President Buchanan, and has been but lightly touched upon in the histories. The envoys and their suite came in the USS Powhatan, and at the same time came the Japanese steamship Kanrin Maru, under Captain Katsu, the organizer of the modern Japanese Navy. Landing at San Francisco on March 9th, the envoys were warmly received, the board of supervisors of the city taking occasion to express the earnest wish that the amicable relations happily existing between the imperial government of Japan and the United States of America and their people may be perpetuated and productive of great and mutual advantages. From San Francisco, the envoys went to Panama and thence to Washington, where they were entertained at the Willard Hotel and, on May 17th, received by the President and Secretary Cass. The diary of Murakami, one of the envoys, is full of amused and interested appreciation of all the new things to which they were introduced, from the group dance of both sexes, ball at Washington, to the presentation of a handsome watch to each by the Walton Company of New York. The mission to Great Britain and other European countries was dispatched more than a year later, leaving Yokohama in HBMS Odin on January 23, 1862. Before we note the direct results of the coming of the foreigner through the new commercial treaties, it is important to set down a few results which were indirect, such as appear in the quickened desire of the shogunate and of Japanese individuals to defend themselves against foreign aggression by the use of foreign learning. It was plain that the stirrings of a new springtide were in the air, and Japanese, especially those in contact with the newly opened ports, 
were anxious to awake to whatever new opportunities an enlightened patriotism might offer. From 1855 onward, the government was taking steps, through a translation bureau and through the establishment of a school of foreign languages, to meet the new situation. The steps came but slowly and at intervals, and it was not till 1862 that the shogun's government itself sent abroad students for instruction in foreign lands. Some went to Holland to learn navigation, among them Enomoto, afterwards Viscount and Minister of the Navy. Some went to study medicine, and others law. The Satsuma clan sent some students abroad, and a few, such as Ito and Inouye, went on their own account, in defiance of the law. The shogunate also took some steps to secure the presence of foreign instructors, from France for the army, from Great Britain for the navy, and so on. But all these official movements were inferior in importance to some which came from individual initiative. Two or three of these must be mentioned. In 1836 was born Yukichi Fukuzawa, known later as the Sage of Mita. Very early he began to show interest in foreign learning and in 1854 went to Nagasaki to study Dutch. Later on he realized the superior value of English but could find no one to instruct him. So it was with the aid of an English-Dutch dictionary that he finally acquired a knowledge of the language. In 1858, he laid the foundations of Keio University in the compound of the Okudaira mansion, but the name was not given until 1867. Mr. Fukuzawa visited the United States in 1860 in attendance upon the first mission to that country and returned to give his life to the cause of Western education in Japan. The present writer, in 1923, found a great university with its 20 buildings and its library of 100,000 volumes. Very interesting, too, was the little wooden building now famous as the first place in Japan in which public speaking was permitted and taught. But most interesting of all was to meet the present president, son of the illustrious founder, and his own son, preparing to follow in the steps of his father and grandfather. Another great pioneer of Western education, whose inspiration dates from the time, is Joseph Nishima, founder of the first Christian university in Japan, which is now known as Doshisha in the city of Kyoto. The story of the samurai boy, born in Tokyo in 1843, and becoming so obsessed with the idea of foreign learning that he escaped at last on an American schooner lying at Hakodate in 1864, and the subsequent career of the young man in the United States till he was able to return with blessing to his native land, is one of the great romances of modern history. A visit today to Doshisha certainly provokes the quotation, Si momentum requius circumspice. Still, another life forces itself upon the attention, irresistibly, that of another martyr of the new Japan, Yoshida Shoin, born in 1830. Here we have not a dependent of the Tokugawas, but one burning with desire to see the emperors enjoying their ancient status. One of the earliest stories of him is of his making a model in mud of the emperor's palace, saying that he was repairing the desolated imperial court, as had done Oda Nobunaga of old. As a boy of eleven, he gave lectures before his clan lord and at sixteen was much concerned over the menace of the foreigners. At twenty-one, he lectured on coast defense, but reckoned most on getting away from the country to study. He called a meeting of friends and wrote down in large characters the words, I have a purpose and have determined to carry it out, even though Mount Fuji crumbles and the rivers are exhausted. Five times he attempted to get to Perry's ships as a stowaway, and five times he failed. Then he began writing and strikingly anticipated some of the later Japanese policies when he advocated the opening up of Hokkaido, the taking of Kamchatka and the Kurile Islands, the annexation of Ryukyu Islands, the payment of tribute by the Koreans, the taking of Formosa, and a part of Manchuria. His school was really in the interest of overthrowing the Tokugawas, and eventually he was imprisoned by E. Kamon no Kami, and on several charges condemned to death. He wrote a pathetic little book, The Record of a Baffled Spirit, and on October 25, 1859, by the hand of the headsman, his refined and burning and reform-loving spirit was severed from his five-foot body and caused to ascend to the high heaven. The Record of a Baffled Spirit begins with the poem, 
although my body is east out to decay, on the Musashi Plain, yet my Japanese spirit will remain. The erection of a monument to Yoshida Shoin on October 18, 1909, by his clan shows that his faith was not in vain. For a few months after Harris's success in obtaining the Commercial Treaty of 1858, it rained treaties, but there was much difference between obtaining the signatures to the treaties and carrying them into effect. The first difficulty came over the settlement of Kanagawa, already alluded to. The treaty had designated Kanagawa, but the traders were in such a hurry that, in spite of the diplomats, it was Yokohama which was occupied. Mr. Rutherford Alcock considered this partly due to the connivance of the Japanese government, which he suspected of desiring to make another deshima of the foreign residency. A sign of the haste with which Yokohama was seized upon is, or was, visible in the odd numbering of the houses. The first Englishman who came called his place number one, and the next, wherever he settled, followed with number two, and so on. The foreigners who came were of all descriptions. Many of them were needy adventurers who desired only to take advantage of whatever opportunity presented itself for self-enrichment. The worst illustration of this came to light in what is known as the gold currency question. It was, in part, a renewal of the old difficulty which Hideyoshi had encountered in the case of the Portuguese. In the trade regulations appended to the treaty, it had been required that the Japanese should change foreign bullion weight for weight for the native current coin. Now, as the relative value of gold and silver in Japan was only three to one, and in the rest of the world, fifteen to one, it was plain that men could buy silver in China, steam over to Japan, and make a certain profit of 200% on every trip. The rage for financial operations of this sort grew rapidly, and even American naval officers threw over their commissions to engage in the lucrative business of exchange. Japan was rapidly being denuded of her gold before it was possible for the government to intervene, stop the export of gold, and readjust the domestic ratio of gold and silver. The question, however, did little to increase the love of the Japanese for the intrusive foreigner. So, while the Jōi, barbarian expelling, party were gaining new influence in Kyoto, the populace was becoming more and more incensed. They had before them not only the shocking conduct of the barbarians, but also the visible displeasure of the gods. Yedo had been visited by a great earthquake in 1855. A terrible fire followed in which 100,000 persons lost their lives. Great storms swept over the eastern coasts, and a general epidemic of fire, pestilence, and flood terrorized the land. Nature herself seemed protesting against the presence of the foreigner. It was perhaps too early for the Japanese to make the proper distinction, but it must be remembered that there were other foreigners attracted by the reopening of the ports than those who had come in the service of Maimon. The resurrection of the Christian religion in Japan dates from the year of the commercial treaty. The discovery of the Christians, already referred to, proved an incentive to the sending of new evangelists. The first came from the United States in the persons of Rev. J. Liggins and Rev. C. M. Williams, afterwards Bishop of Yedo, of the Episcopal Church. Soon after followed Dr. Hepburn of the American Presbyterian Board and Dr. Verbeck of the Dutch Reformed Church of America. Roman Catholic missionaries also renewed their acquaintance with the country in 1859, and others soon followed. Persecution once again raised its head in the wake of propaganda, and several thousand Japanese Christians were arrested and deported from their native villages. It was not till 1873 that the persecution of Christians came definitely to an end. A repercussion of the hostility felt at this time against the foreigner is to be seen in the murder of the talented and courageous minister of the shogun, who had been responsible for the carrying out of the terms of the treaties. On March 24, 1860, E. Kamon no Kami, surrounded by his retainers, was on his way to the shogun's palace when he was suddenly attacked by what appeared to be a band of ronins. The assailants were really the emissaries of the Lord Mito, who, a little later, received the bloody head of his illustrious victim. All who took part in the attack were slain or committed seppuku shortly afterwards. The murder cast a shadow over the capital, as Mr. Alcock put it, 
a shadow of doubt and uneasy anticipation. But it would not appear that as yet the abolishing of the shogunate was seriously contemplated. The assassins of the Taido solemnly declared, Our conduct does not indicate the slightest enmity to the Bakufu. We swear before heaven and earth, gods and men, that our action proceeds entirely from our hope of seeing the shogunate resume its proper form and abide by the holy and wise will of the emperor. We hope to see our national glory manifested in the expulsion of foreigners from the land. The fear of foreigners was certainly more conspicuous than mere hatred of the bakufu. Men from the outside world were multiplying apace, and the poor bewildered shogun, with his ministers, had no control over the unruly elements. Twice the British legation was attacked by Ronin at midnight, and considerable bloodshed resulted. The gloomy forebodings of 1860 were deepened at the beginning of 1861 by the murder of Mr. Hewskin, the Dutch secretary to the American legation, on January 15th. The situation was so serious that the representatives of Great Britain, France, Prussia, and Holland decided to move from Yeddo and retire temporarily to Yokohama. Only Mr. Townsend Harris remained, he being convinced of the real desire of the shogunal government to give whatever protection was possible. The new attack on the British legation and the wounding of Mr. Oliphant, shortly after the return of the ministers to Yeddo, prompted the poor shogun to send an autograph letter to Queen Victoria begging that the opening of the ports might be postponed. Then, as a last straw, came in September 1862 what is known as the Namamigi Incident, or the Richardson Affair. Three English merchants, with a lady, riding from Yokohama towards Yedo, came upon the procession of the Satsuma chief, with some 800 of his retainers. The foreigners drew up their horses to the roadside, but did not dismount, as was customary when a great lord was passing by. Mr. Richardson was immediately attacked and slain, and his companions, severely wounded, escaped only by precipitate flight. Demand was immediately made for reparation, and, as the shogun was unable to enforce his authority against so powerful a clan as the Satsuma, a British squadron bombarded Kagoshima, the capital of the clan. A typhoon arose during the bombardment, and, as the forts were still firing when the ships drew off, some Japanese claimed the whole affair as a victory, especially as the assassins were never given up. The barbarian expelling party at Kyoto took so much heart out of the situation that dates were actually fixed for the expulsion of all foreigners in June 1863. One powerful clan, the Choshu, undertook to precipitate the clash and fired upon American, French, and Dutch ships which disregarded the blockade imposed upon the Choshu coast in the neighborhood of the Straits of Shimonoseki. The powers concerned joined with the British to teach what was considered a much-needed lesson. The forts at Shimonoseki were bombarded and reduced, and a heavy indemnity demanded from the clan. As, however, the clan refused to pay, the debt had to be transferred to the Bakufu, now at his wit's end. The indemnity was far in excess of the damage inflicted, and the last installment of the three million dollars was paid only in 1875. It was equally apportioned between the four powers, but the United States returned its share of $785,000, as the Americans had sustained no damage, and the small chartered ship, with but 20 blue jackets, which assisted in the bombardment, incurred for the nation little or no expense. The bombardment of Shimonoseki seemed at first to have increased the prestige of the shogun's government. Probably it had not been undertaken without some assurance of the Bakufu's tacit approval. But the payment of the indemnity assumed by the government was a serious and unforeseen difficulty. Mr. Robert Pruyan, who had succeeded Townsend Harris as the American representative, was disposed to prefer the opening of another port to the payment of an indemnity, since the latter, he maintained, would really be paid by the foreign merchants in enhanced burdens laid upon commerce. He had, moreover, already seen the importance of obtaining the emperor's ratification of the treaties which had been negotiated, and had even proposed steps for securing this prior to his resignation in 1865. About the same time, the British representative, Sir Rutherford Alcock, was rewarded for the success of the Shimonoseki affair by promotion to Peking. He had acted contrary to the instructions then on their way from England, 
but success was regarded as atoning for this unintentional sin. His place was taken by one of the most interesting and dominating personalities of the time, Sir Henry Parks, whose long experience in China had added much assurance to his natural powers of leadership. From the moment of his arrival, Parks set the pace in the policy of the powers. Known as an exponent of the gunboat policy, he persuaded the foreign representatives, on the strength of very general instructions, to countenance a naval demonstration off Hyogo for the purpose of compelling the ratification of the treaties by the emperor. It was desired also to secure the regulation of the tariff and the opening of the ports of Hyogo and Osaka. It was a somewhat high-handed action, and the joint treaty of June 25, 1865, which followed the Japanese acceptance of the foreign terms, has been termed by Tyler Dennett one of the most thoroughly un-American treaties ever ratified by the American government. Nevertheless, it settled the vexed question as to imperial responsibility and, of course, it had considerable bearing on the domestic changes which were soon to appear. In September 1866, the shogun died, and the previously rejected heir to the thankless office, Keiki, or Yoshinobu, now became the inevitable occupant. He was by no means keen about it, though he used his brief hour of authority to send men abroad for instruction and to import instructors for the military services. Six months later, February 3, 1867, the anti-foreign emperor, Komei, died, giving place to the young boy, Mutsuhito, who was destined to become the illustrious Meiji Tenno. The feeling was gaining strength that the time was ripening for an extrication from political complication by a return to the old ways of Japan, as laid down by the Taikwa Code. Already in 1865, the two great Satsuma vassals, Saigo Takamori and Okubo Toshimichi, had entered into a secret arrangement with Kido Takayoshi, a vassal of the Prince of Nagato, for the abolition of the shogunate. The accession of Keiki had made it possible for such a proposition to be directly made. So, from the hands of the Tosa Daimyo, Keiki received the invitation on the part of the feudal lords to restore to the emperor his former authority. The shogun did not long delay his reply. After taking counsel with others, he dispatched the following letter bearing date November 3, 1867. A retrospect of the various changes through which the empire has passed shows us that after the decadence of the monarchical authority, the power passed into the hands of ministers of state, and that, owing to the civil wars of the period Hogan, 1156-59, and Heiji, 1159-60, the administrative power fell into the hands of the military class. My ancestor received more confidence and favor from the court than any of his predecessors, and his descendants have succeeded him for more than two hundred years. Though I fill the same office, almost all the acts of the administration are far from perfect, and I confess it with shame that the present unsatisfactory condition of affairs is due to my shortcomings and incompetence. Now that foreign intercourse becomes daily more extensive, Unless the government is directed from one central authority, the foundations of the state will fall to pieces. If, however, the old order of things be changed, and the administrative authority be restored to the imperial court, and if national deliberations be conducted on an extensive scale, and the imperial decision be secured, and if the empire be supported by the efforts of the whole people, then the empire will be able to maintain its rank and dignity among the nations of the earth. Although I have allowed all the feudal lords to state their views without reserve, yet it is, I believe, my highest duty to realize this ideal by giving up entirely my rule over this land. The emperor's reply came, in terse enough form, under the date of November 12th. Tokugawa Keiki's proposal to restore the administrative authority to the imperial court is accepted by the emperor. To his own supporters, Keiki wrote, It appears to me that the laws cannot be maintained in the face of the daily extension of our foreign relations, unless the government be conducted by one head, and I propose, therefore, to surrender the whole power into the hands of the imperial court. 
This is the best I can do for the interests of the empire. A few days later, an imperial edict ushered in a new epoch of the history of Japan in the following terms. Now that Tokugawa Keiki has restored the administrative authority to the court, the court directly controls the imperial polity, quite free from bias, laying great stress on public opinion and keeping all undisturbed those good customs and usages preserved under the Tokugawa regime. The clans shall be quite bold to fight for justice on the one hand, and to strive for the augmentation of the glory of the empire on the other. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of an Outline History of Japan」「This is a LibriVox recording」「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain」「For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org」「An Outline History of Japan」by Herbert Henry Gowen」Chapter 25 The Beginnings of Meiji The opening of the new era, which commences officially with January 1st, 1868, was shadowed by an unfortunate conflict between the adherents of the ex shogun and the clans whose influence had brought about his resignation. These clans, known as the Satchoto, from the alliance of Satsuma, Chosu, and Tosa, were suspicious, lest the Tokugawa should still, under the guise of facilitating the transition to the new order, be determined to reassert control of the government. The Tokugawas and their friends, on their part, were chagrined at being passed over in the organization of the imperial bureaucracy. The new government had been hastily organized with the boy emperor at its head. A cabinet with a premier, vice-premier, and seven departmental chief, and a body of counselors. But the posts were well-nigh monopolized by the Satcho Todaimyo, and no Tokugawa found a place. As Dr. McLaren puts it, when the shogun resigned, it was no part of his intention to retire completely from the administration of the affairs of the country. But it soon became apparent to him that under the new regime of direct government by the court, the power was being monopolized by the western clans, especially Satsuma and Chosu. Hence, when Keiki's retirement to Osaka was announced, dated January 7, 1868, a great protest arose from the clan and the ex shogun out of loyalty to his followers, was practically forced to march to Kyoto with them. The Aizu samurai had already been dismissed from their hereditary position as the palace guards on January 3rd, and now insisted upon accompanying Keiki to Kyoto with an escort of 10,000 men. This formidable train was viewed by the Satchoto as implying an attempt at premeditated rebellion. Accordingly, a force of Satsuma and Chosu men, estimated at not exceeding 1,500, interposed itself, and fought a three days battle at Fushimi, which ended on January 30th in the complete defeat of the ex shogun supporter, a result due, however, in large part to the treachery of the Tsu clan. This battle of Fushimi is described by Longford as the fifth decisive battle in Japanese history. Keiki, declining the suggestion that he should commit suicide, fled to Osaka, whither his enemies followed, and achieved in part the burning of the famous castle. Thence, he took ship to Yedo, where, after a few days, he surrendered himself to the government. With unusual magnanimity, his enemies permitted him to retire, first to his estates at Mito, and then to Suruga. His followers, however, were not so easily placated. A fierce battle took place in the grounds of the Uyeno Temple on July 4th, 1868, which was decided against the Tokugawa, caused by the troops of Hizen. With matters thus hopeless, the greatest devotion was still manifested towards the defeated cause. The Byakotai, an association of boys from 15 to 17 years of age, fought briefly to the last. There were even a few women who fought armed with spears. Admiral Enomoto, who had some years before been sent by the Bakufu to study naval warfare in Holland, took his seven ships from Yedo to Hakodate, 
where he held out for Keiki a year longer. Eventually, the Galen sailor was induced to give himself up to save his associates, and the government was generous enough to pardon him, recognizing that his action was the outcome of loyalty to his daimyo. So perished forever the cause of the Tokugawa shoguns. Kiki lived for many years the life of a private gentleman, and in 1906 was visited by Lord Redesdale, who found in him all the old-time dignity, charm, and good looks. The period of Meiji, or enlightened government, as the new era was entitled, rapidly justified the choice of the name. A definite and conciliatory policy towards foreign nations was inaugurated on February 3, 1868, when the emperor announced to the various representatives that he had assumed control of domestic and foreign policy, and would be pleased to grant them an interview on March 23rd. The condescension was one which shattered all precedent and naturally created a great deal of excitement. The Dutch and French ministers had obtained their interview when a determined attack was made on the party of Sir Harry Parks, the British representative. Two men, one an ex-priest, the other a ronin, were assailants. They fought so madly that thirteen men were more or less badly wounded. The emperor expressed his deep indignation at the outrage and the frustrated interview was consummated two or three days later. The promulgation of the Emperor's Charter Oath on April 17th was due only in part to his intention to conform the government to Western usage. There can be little doubt that the clans, not wholly trusting one another's disinterestedness, were anxious to provide safeguards against the rise in the future of autocracies similar to that of the lately deposed Tokugawas. The event, however, is of such importance that the five clauses of the oath may well be quoted in their entirety. 1. A deliberative assembly should be formed and all measures be decided by public opinion. 2. The principles of social and political economics should be diligently studied by both the superior and the inferior classes of our people. 3. Everyone in the community shall be assisted to preserve in carrying out his will for good purposes. 4. All the old, absurd usage of former times should be disregarded, and the impartiality and justice displayed in the workings of nature be adopted as a basis of action. 5. Wisdom and ability should be sought after in all quarters of the world for the purpose of firmly establishing the foundations of the empire. The real importance of the Charter Oath, says Professor Uyehara, lies in the fact that it was the first step in the determination of the leading statesmen of the period to undertake the national reorganization with the cooperation of the people and adopt Western civilization in order to preserve the independence of the country and free it from foreign aggression. The movement which ushered in the era of Meiji was called by its initiators Fuko, or the return to antiquity, and by some more radically inclined Ishin, or the renovation. Dr. Hara is undoubtedly right in saying that while there was much in the movement which was a return to Taikwa, and much which may legitimately be called renovation, there is still some excuse for the use of the term revolution employed by the majority of foreigners. Yet, the revolutionary steps taken by the new government were gradual and hesitating. It cannot fail to strike the student that for quite a number of years after the restoration, there was, and in all probability, fortunately, an element of opportunism of patchwork, and even of the haphazard in the development of constitutional government. In the cabinet, the premiership was given to a royal prince, Arisugawa, and two imperial princes and five court nobles were heads of the seven departments. But among the office holders and councillors were those who looked forward rather than backward. Okubo and Kido were prominent. And among the younger men were the Chosu clansmen, Ito and Inoue, who had escaped to Europe 
and now returned to share in the new order. Had the martyred Yoshida been able to see how many of his old pupils were now at the helm, he must surely have smiled a smile of content. There was as yet no national army or navy, nor any steady source of income. Hesitating as were some of the early steps in the direction of innovation, some of them failed through neglect to observe that water poured into a narrow necked bottle will spill rather than fill. In the April of 1869, an attempt was made to convene a deliberative assembly of the feudal chiefs in order to discuss such subjects as the reform of the land tax, the enactment of a criminal code, the freeing of the eta or outcasts from their age-long opprobrium, and the like. The assembly, which was called the Kogisho, turned out a complete fiasco, and on October 4, 1870, it was prorogued sine die, to be abolished by an imperial rescript of June 1873. As a specimen of the voting in a body which has been described as a quiet, peaceful debating society, we find on the question of the abolition of harakiri the following result. A yes, three, no's, three hundred, not voting, six. Yet, apart from the kogisho, reforms were carried out by the administration which are noteworthy. In the imperial court, a large number of obsolete offices and sinecures were suppressed. Of particular importance was the change in November of the imperial capital from Kyoto to Yedo, the capital of the Tokugawa shoguns. Okubo's suggestion of Osaka as the new capital was rejected. Yedo now became Tokyo, or eastern capital, while the venerable city of Kyoto as some compensation for the desertion was to be known as Saigyo, or western capital. The choice of Yedo was a striking vindication of the strategic judgment of Hideyoshi 300 years earlier. Ito once declared that feudalism stood on thoroughly worm-eaten, though externally lacquered and gilt pillars. Yet, to the reformers of early Meiji, feudalism must have presented a formidable front. It is extremely doubtful whether they were actually conscious at the first that the abolition of feudalism was a sine qua non of national unification. The patriotism of the act whereby a whole class surrendered the privileges of a thousand years has been frequently commented upon. It is certainly remarkable that what took centuries to accomplish in Europe was in Japan carried through in the course of a few months. It was, however, by no means a general impulse on the part of the daimyo, but primarily the act of the four great daimyates of Satsuma, Chosu, Tosa, and Hizen, inspired by a few men of whom Kido, Okubo, and Saigo were the chief. The rest of the daimyo merely followed the lead of such as these, and out of 276, only 17 declined to act voluntarily. In any case, it was a unique sacrifice performed in the great cause of national unity. We reverently offer up, said the memorial, all our feudal possessions with the prayer that the imperial court will enact laws, so that a uniform rule may prevail throughout the empire. It was decided that the daimyo should retire on an income of one-tenth of their former revenues, while provision was also made for the pensioning of the great army of retainers. It was on August 29, 1871, that the abolition of the feudal system was actually accomplished. Dr. Griffiths speaks of the farewell of the daimyo of Echizen to his 3,000 retainers as among the most impressive of his life's experiences. By this edict, the 400,000 samurai still remained the pensioners of the state. A further edict was promulgated on 1873, offering to commute the pension on the basis of six years' purchase for those held merely for life. This commutation was rendered compulsory in 1876, and by this date, 
the system of national conscription had been adopted to supersede the old plan of drawing soldiers from a particular class to carry through the gigantic changes involved in the abolition of feudalism it was necessary to add to the national debt the sum of one hundred and sixty five million dollars the only important event of the year eighteen sixty nine for which no opportunity to mention has hitherto been found was the marriage of the emperor to the princess haru destined to be for forty-three years the beloved spouse and for some two years more the survivor of meiji tenno and now one with the spirits of the dead as the empress shoken the marriage festivities were marked by a striking accession of loyal feeling on the part of the people and new zest in the cause of reform what the emperor wrote in verse was taken by all as representing the profoundest desire of the heart oh how i wish to make this country inferior to none adopting that which is good and rejecting that which is bad from the beginning of eighteen seventy reforms come thick and fast a telegraph line was opened in that year from tokyo to yokohama and a railway projected between the same points which was completed in eighteen seventy two the distance was only eighteen miles but it was a notable beginning the postal system also dates from eighteen seventy and in eighteen seventy one it was extended to foreign countries about the same time lighthouses were erected at dangerous points along the coast a mint was established for the new coinage and the first newspaper worthy of the name was printed by a scotsman named black in tokugawa times however there had been occasionally published newsletters containing court news and other happenings these printed from crude wooden blocks were known as yomiuri that is sold by hawking about in social directions an epoch is marked by the emancipation of the eta and by the revocation of all edicts against christianity in the religious field a bureau of ecclesiastical affairs or jingi jimu kyoku as its first act in eighteen sixty eight separated shinto from buddhism and made of the former a kind of state ceremonial buddhism remained under proscription until eighteen seventy two when the ecclesiastical department or kyubusho recognized both shinto and buddhist priests as moral instructors as denoting the desire for still wider political outlook it is worth the noting that at this time several distinguished statesmen including iwakura kido okubo and ito left for foreign lands to press the subject of treaty revision the matter of extraterritoriality and the necessity for accepting a treaty-made tariff had been from the first extremely irritating to japanese pride it should be added that the use of the gregorian calendar was begun on january first eighteen seventy three although japanese chronology was still reckoned from the accession of jimu tenno in six hundred sixty b c and the chinese system of year periods was retained a little later sunday was set apart as a weekly day of rest korea had always been regarded as in some measure tributary to japan on the strength of the legendary exploits of jingo kogo as well as on the ground taken by hideyoshi during the shogunate the koreans had so far yielded to the claim as to send tribute bearing envoys to greet in turn the tokugawa shoguns now the old custom was broken and insult was added to neglect by the declaration of the koreans that they could not recognize a nation which had turned its back upon the ideals of the orient the relation of korea to the outside world and her obstinate conservatism are in no respect better illustrated than by a brief summary of her treatment of the christian missions hideyoshi's christian general konishi had first made christianity known to korea by bringing with him on his campaigns father Cespedes and a japanese priest as his chaplains between these however 
and the first real effort to propagate Christianity, there was a wide interval. The first Korean Christian was baptized in Peking in 1784, and this convert, after converting others upon his return home, apostatized under persecution. He nevertheless was put to death with six other converts, and as Mr. Longford puts it, marched to death with martyrs, but was not a martyr, was beheaded as a Christian, but died a renegade. Somehow or other, Christianity continued to spread, and although executions were continuous, it is estimated that there were 10,000 Christians in Korea at the beginning of the 19th century. The desire to have a vicar apostolic led to the sending of Brugier from China, but he died within sight of his goal in 1835. His successor from Tattery crossed the frontier through a drain pipe. In 1837 came the first bishop to tread Korean soil, the heroic Imbert. The French priests died as martyrs after torments unspeakable. The prosecutors were eternally vigilant. Yet, the result was that all heard of Christianity and, from this time, Koreans ceased to despise Christians. The first native priest, Andrew Kim, obtained his orders after having been smuggled across to Shanghai. Then came the great persecution of 1866 with its cry, Hatred to Europeans, and the torture and death of Christians till the faith was as completely extirpated as human power could ensure. Swords were insufficient, a guillotine was invented which took off 24 heads at once, and 8,000 Christians were slain besides those who perished in the mountains of cold and hunger. The inability of friends, occupied with Prussia in the West, to stop or avenge these massacres makes doubly significant the interposition of Japan. The question of interference, which was raised in 1868, became acute in 1872 when it coincided with the domestic problem of what to do with the disbanded samurai. Saigo of Satsuma at once seized the opportunity presented to save the honor of the two sworded men by an immediate declaration of war. War had indeed been practically decided upon when the propriety of awaiting the return of Iwakura and his party was suggested. The expected envoys returned in September not only without the coveted version of the treaties, but strongly impressed with the conviction that Japan had much leeway to make up before she could think of engaging in a foreign war. The debate was long and embittered, and the final verdict against the war led to Saigo's retirement to Satsuma, where he began to drill, probably at this time, with no serious thought of insurrection, the famous warriors of his redoubtable clan. Meanwhile, the government proceeded to carry out its plans for conscription. The war cloud seemed quiet to have passed over when the trouble arose in Farmosa, on account of the ill treatment received by some natives of the Ryukyu Islands. The Farmosan expedition was a very small affair, but it led to an important international question since the Ryukyu Islanders had existed for some centuries in a happy state of uncertainty as to whether they were tributary to China or to Japan or to both. China, of course, now put in her claim, but, through the mediation of Sir Thomas Wade, the matter was finally settled by China's recognizing the Japanese claim to the group and paying the expense of the expedition to Formosa. Then, once again, the Korean question came to the front, presuming on the way in which they had got rid of the American squadron, which had been sent to open the Hermit Kingdom in 1870. The Koreans bumptiously fired upon the Japanese survey ship Unyokan. The following January 1876, warship and transports under General Kuroda 
arrived to demand satisfaction. The Peninsula Kingdom was as helpless as she was proud, and following the example of Japan, in a similar case twenty years earlier, signed a treaty of commerce and conceded the opening of certain ports for trade. Thus, among the early fruits of the reopening of Japan, we have the opening up to the commerce of the world of a kingdom which had hitherto proved obdurate to all the demands of the Western world. For many years, Sakhalin had been a bone of contention between Russia and Japan. The march of the Colossus of the North to the country south of the Amur had made plain the strategic importance of an island which up to this time had been undoubtedly Japanese. Russia at first made efforts to gain possession by stimulating the immigration thither of her subjects, but this was countered by the offer of Japan first to divide the territory which was actually done in 1905 or secondly to purchase the Russian claims. Opposition, however, was encountered to both plans and no settlement was reached until 1875 when it was decided to concede Sakhalin in Toto to Russia on condition of Russia's recognition of Japanese sovereignty in the Kurils, Chishima. The arrangement was, as Captain Brinkley puts it, the purchase of an area of Japanese territory by Russia who paid for it with a part of Japan's belongings. It had been for some time evident that trouble was brewing in the southern part of the empire. Possibly Saigo Takamori had not intended any trial of strength between his clan troops and the newly conscripted army of the nation, but his school for samurai could hardly be regarded in any other light than as a menace, especially after the abortive insurrections of Saga in 1874, Kumamoto and Magi in 1876. The Satsuma outbreak when it came, through the enthusiasm of Saigo's pupils sweeping their idol with them into rebellion, was a very serious affair. There were perhaps 40,000 Satsuma men, splendidly drilled and armed, and inspired as well by the chivalrous traditions of their race and class. Yet, although the government had only the raw conscript troops, untested till now in actual combat, the rebellion which began on January 29, 1877, was suppressed before the end of September. Much of the Satsuma strength was wasted in the siege of the old castle of Kumamoto, which had been built by Kato Kiyomasa in the 16th century. The government had time to collect its forces and to send an expedition into Kyushu with disastrous results to Saigo. The slaughter on each side was prodigious, and all the rebel leaders perished either in battle or by their own hands. The new national spirit was severely tested by the campaign, since among those entrusted with the putting down of the revolt were Saigo Tsukumachi, the younger brother of the Satsuma leader, and Admiral Kawamura, also a connection and a Satsuma man. It was the latter who, after the last tragic act, took up the bleeding head of his former friend, washed it, and attended to the rites of burial. The general affection in which Saigo Takamori is still held is shown by the plans for celebrating the 50th anniversary of his lamented fate. One important result of the victory, affording some compensation for all the loss entailed, was to give to the newly trained national troops a prestige equal to that of the seasoned clansmen. To the old-fashioned people of Japan, the government seemed at this time to be turning the country upside down in the endeavor to obtain Occidental standards. It was employing Frenchmen and Englishmen and Germans and Americans to teach all things from military science to law and medicine and education. Yet, the outside world was still more or less unconvinced as to the reality of the transformation.
This comes out sufficiently in the account of Iwakura's mission to Washington in the matter of unequal treaties. The envoys, with their ancient court dress and their wooden shoes in the Washington hotels and the White House, felt themselves the incongruity of the apparel which moved the American cartoonist. They were chagrined when Mr. Hamilton Fish, General Grant's Secretary of State, pointed out the need of credentials before their mission could be recognized. Okubo and Ito had to go all the way back to Japan to obtain these and threaten to commit seppuku if they were not given, a threat which by no means moved the foreign minister, Soyashima. The few references to the mission in the American literature of the time betray little but amusement. Oliver Wendell Holmes used the event to give point to a presidential election when he wrote, There's a bit of a row when we choose our tycoon, and especially now. Though, he did also declare, the eagle was always the friend of the sun. Walt Whitman's reference was somewhat more appreciative. Over the western sea, hither from Nippon came, courteous, the sword-cheeked, two-sworded envoys, leaning back in their open barouches, barehanded, right today through Manhattan. In Japan, the people were by no means satisfied with the advance made towards constitutional government. Undoubtedly, more had been read into the Charter Oath than its framers had intended, since at the time of its promulgation, the people, apart from the samurai, had not really been in mind. Now, however, a great popular leader was found in the Tosa statesman, Itagaki Taisuke, who had seceded from the government with Saigo over the question of war with Korea. For a time, it had been conjectured that the Tosa men might even join in the Satsuma revolt, but Saigo and Itagaki had very different objects in view. The government, it should be recognized, was not really disinclined to parliamentary reform, but considered it necessary to feel its way with caution. Yet, when Okubo was assassinated in May 1878 by those who sympathized with the faith of Saigo, it was openly stated that he was slain also to promote the cause of popular government. A step forward had already been taken in the creation of a Senate, Genroin, in 1875, but now, within two months of Okubo's death, a further edict announced the formation of elective assemblies for prefectures and cities. This, however, by no means satisfied Itagaki, who proceeded presently to organize the first political party in Japan, known as the Jiyuto, or Liberal Party. Then came a rather dramatic change. There had been, in January 1880, a remarkable demonstration at Osaka, attended by the representative of 27 associations and in favor of convoking a national assembly. Taking his cue from this meeting, Okuma, the great statesman who now appears prominently for the first time, suddenly decided to go over to the cause of popular representation. Seceding from the cabinet, Okuma, the peel of Japan, placed himself before the people as the rival of Japan's Russo Itagaki, though no difference of principle between them was discernible. Okuma was anxious to have a following of his own, so he created, in the course of a few months, the party known as Shimpoto, or Progressist Party. The school of Okuma was quickly followed by the issue of an imperial edict, dated October 12, 1881, promising that a national assembly should be called in ten years' time. 
So ends the first stage of the movement towards a constitutional government. Popular impatience with the delay in calling the promised National Assembly expressed itself in a somewhat turbulent exploitation of the party system. We have already noted the formation of Itagaki's Liberal Party in October 1881 and of Okuma's Progressive Party in 1882. A little later, a new party of constitutional imperialists known as the Riken Seito was formed as a conservative reaction against the others. It had a program of restricted franchise, bicameral legislature, and the maintenance of the imperial veto. These several parties formed the center of so much heated debate and unbridled discussion in the newspapers that a rather drastic brass law had to be enacted in 1883. In October of the same year, the dissolution of all existing parties was decided upon in the interest of the empire. Several years later, Kuto, who had visited Europe in 1883, tried to unite all the parties in a league whose benevolent motto was similarity in great things, difference in little things. But the attempt, naturally, was a failure. Political enthusiasm at this time gathered unmistakably around men rather than around principles. A period of more constructive usefulness commenced when Ito assumed the premiership in 1885. The man who now became prime minister for the first time was destined to be one of the greatest statesmen of modern Japan, if not, as one has called him, the greatest oriental since Confucius. He was a samurai of Chosu, whose original anti-foreign propositions gradually gave way to the belief in reform along western lines. In 1863, he had as we have seen with Inoue and others, left Japan secretly against the then existing law. He worked his way to London and spent a year in eager and fruitful study of the Occident. In March 1882, he once again, under very different circumstances, sailed for the barbarian lands. He visited America, England, Belgium, and Germany, in the latter country, coming very pronouncedly under the influence of Bismarck. This influence manifested itself very plainly when Ito returned to Japan in September. It is due to Ito that, under the new constitution, there was brought about the rehabilitation of the nobility graded according to the European precedent in the five degrees of Prince, Marquis, Count, Viscount, and Baron. We owe also to Ito the reconstruction of the cabinet system so as to give the Premier much the position which was occupied by the Chancellor in the German Empire. Upon the evidence of this influence in the shaping of the constitution, which was one of the most important results of Ito's foreign tour, we shall dwell presently. There was, however, much else which may be summarized in the following paragraph from Brinkley. The civil and penal laws were codified. The finances were placed on a sound footing. A national bank with a network of subordinate institutions was established. Railway construction was pushed on steadily. Postal and telegraph services were extended. The foundations of a strong mercantile marine were laid. A system of postal savings banks was instituted. Extensive schemes of harbor improvements, roads, and riparian works were planned and put into operation. The portals of the civil service were made accessible solely by competitive examination. 
a legion of students was sent westward to complete their education, and the country's foreign affairs were managed with comparative skill. By the treaty with Korea in 1876, Japan had obtained the significant declaration on the part of the Peninsula Kingdom that she held herself to be independent of Chinese sovereignty. China, however, had by no means as yet recognized this to be the fact. On the contrary, the presence of a Japanese resident at Seoul had led to constant friction between the progressive or pro-Japan element and the conservative or pro-China element. As was to be expected, the friction eventually produced flame, and in 1882, an attack was made upon the Japanese legation at Seoul. The members of the embassy were driven from the city, and the legation buildings burned. Japan naturally availed herself to the opportunity to insist upon her right to maintain troops in Seoul for self-protection. In 1884, however, a further attack was made, and this time Japan, not satisfied with obtaining an indemnity from Korea, was disposed to settle the matter with China, which country was now represented by Yuan Shikai the future first president of the Chinese Republic. Yuan had spent nine years in Korea as a lieutenant of the Chinese statesman Li Hung Chang. Count Ito was sent to Tianjin, and there, on April 18, 1885, a convention was signed by which it was agreed that no troops beyond the legation guards should be sent to Korea by either Japan or China without notice being sent to the other power of intention to do so. By this convention, hostilities were averted, and feeling allayed until fresh incidents of an untoward nature brought about the War of 1894. The subject, as we have seen, had been from time to time postponed, but it had by no means been shelved. The delay had been due in part to Japan's own sense of unreadiness. In addition to the codification of the new laws, the Western powers required some assurance of Japan's ability to administer them. They said, the laws may be all right, but since judges and procurators are not accustomed to the required procedures, we cannot commit to them our own property interests and lives. Nevertheless, the attitude of the powers, and of the United States in particular, had encouraged Japanese statesmen to keep the matter before them. Inoue, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, made another brief attempt to revive the discussion in May 1886, but he failed, and was in consequence compelled a year later to resign his portfolio. His successor, Okuma took up the difficult negotiation in February 1888 and had made some progress when he too was forced to retire from the office. In October 1889, he was made the victim of an attempt at assassination and had the misfortune to lose a leg. The subject of revision, however, was by no means dropped, though no solution was to be reached for some years to come. Our survey of this period would not be complete without some reference to the epidemic of foreign fads which swept over Japan from the year 1873 to 1889, after which there came a reaction in favor of things Japanese. Professor Clement has drawn attention to the entertaining paragraph on fashionable crazes in Chamberlain's Things Japanese. There was the rabbit ear in 1873, followed by a cockfighting craze in 1874 to 1875. Then came the mania for printing dictionaries in 1882 to 1883, followed closely by that for founding all kinds of societies. Taste turned to athletics in 1884 
And then we have a variety of epidemics, from waltzing to big funerals in 1886 to 1887. German measles, or the rage for imitating things Teutonic, caught on about the same time. And then came the mania for mesmerism, table turning, and planchette, till these in turn gave way to the craze for wrestling. The anti-foreign reaction came, as we have said, in 1889, when Japanese reverted to many of their own ideas. But 1889 brought one thing of the greatest moment. The remarkable document which removed Japan at one bound from the category of oriental despotisms had been long preparing. It was at last promulgated amid general rejoicing on February 11, 1889 the birthday of the nation in a double sense. The great day was marred by only one untoward incident. This was the murder of Viscount Mori, Minister of Education by Nishino Buntaro, a fanatic who had resented his victim's unconscious irreverence at the Shinto shrine at Ise. It is characteristic of the Japanese attitude towards deeds of daring that the assassin in due time became a kami. The work of drawing up the constitution had been entrusted to Ito, Kentaro Kaneko, later Viscount, Kawashi Inoue, later Viscount. The main instrument was Ito, who was also for many subsequent years the constitution's most authoritative interpreter. The influence of Bismarck has been already remarked as in the background, although, of course, the doctrine of the divine right of kings was universally accepted in Japan long before the rise of the Hohenzollerns. The emperor, as the descendant of the sun goddess, was regarded by all the gracious giver of the constitution and the privileges therein conceded were intended to open a wider field of activity for serving the emperor. He was still the fountainhead of all law and of all justice, able to govern in the absence of legislation by means of imperial ordinances, able to dissolve diets, which should prove obstructive to the plans of his ministers, responsible for the command of army and navy, the declaration of war, and the making of peace the conclusion of treaties, and the granting of honors, amnesties, and pardons. The Privy Council, which was however a much more influential body than the English institution of the same name, was only a consultative assembly, and it was not necessary to take the advice which it was privileged to give. The ministers of state who formed the cabinet were responsible to the emperor, and not to the diet, although, as Dr. Uyehara says, of a somewhat later time, there is still a strong tendency for cabinet ministers to rely more and more on the support of a majority in both houses of the diet. The heads of the army and the navy departments were regarded as outside of party politics and could not be interpolated in the diet like the other ministers. The Diet was divided into two chambers, the House of Peers and the House of Representatives. The former includes Princes of the Blood Royal, the Princes of the Empire and Marquises, a certain number of Counts, Viscounts and Barons elected by their peers for a period of seven years, a certain number of citizens nominated by the Emperor, and a certain number of citizens subject to the emperor's acceptance, elected from the highest taxpayers by the prefectures. At the time of writing, the House of Peers consists of 15 princes of the blood, 14 princes of the empire, 33 marquises, 20 counts, 74 viscounts, 70 barons, 121 imperial nominees, and 45 highest taxpayers, a total of 392. Out of this number, 
166 are not peers at all, and only about one-fifth of the peers of the empire have a seat. The House of Representatives, by the Constitution of 1889, was elective, although the property qualification made the electorate necessarily small. At first, there were only 300 members, elected by some 460,000 voters, but modifications have been made from time to time which we must consider later. The election was for four years and the diet was to meet once a year. As we shall see, it was some time before parliamentary government got into good working order, and even now, there is much left to be desired. There was very rarely a working majority in the lower house, favorable to the ministry in the early years. But as it was not necessary for the Diet to pass an annual budget, and as the government could carry on by means of imperial ordinances and by frequent dissolutions, there was not much harm done while the Diet was learning how to function. Between 1890 and 1894, there were four general elections. That the Constitution worked as well as it did in these days is a splendid tribute not only to the genius of the men who compiled it, but also to the tact of the Emperor, who made so little display of his prerogative, and to the loyalty of the people to their empire. The Emperor's own stanza expresses that it was both a conviction and a fact. Methinks there is no greater happiness than to share the happiness of thousands and thousands of my people. So the granting of the Constitution opened up a new era for the marvelous advance of Japan to her high place among of the world powers. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of An Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by K. Dropesky. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 26. The Era of Expansion. As hinted in the last chapter, the first years of constitutional government were not without their trials. They seemed at first to afford the spectacle of continuous disagreement between the legislature and the ministry, qualified by the fact that the House of Peers acted for the most part with the ministers. While it is impossible, within the limits of our space, to go into the complicated story of the reasons for all the various misunderstandings and disagreements, some idea of the situation may be conveyed by a bare statement of the parliamentary changes which took place up to the commencement of the war with China. The first general election was held July 1, 1890, and the first session of the Diet lasted from November 25, 1890, to March 8, 1891. The Yamagata Ministry resigned after this session, and the first Matsukata Ministry was inaugurated in May, 1891. The second session of the Diet was from November 21st to December 25th and was terminated by disillusion. The second general election was held in February 1892, the official party being defeated. But Matsukata, nevertheless, retained office and held it till after the third session of the Diet from May 2nd to June 14th. Then he resigned and Ito entered upon his second ministry in August 1892. A fourth session lasted from November 25th to December 30th, 1892, to receive its coup de grace again in a dissolution. The third general election, in March 1894, like its predecessors, returned a majority hostile to the government, which, however, did not resign. A sixth session of the Diet from May 12th to June 2nd, 1894, ended by dissolution. Then the Chinese War broke out and the fourth general election was held July 1894. The war brought all parties into line and patriotic enthusiasm completely superseded partisan embitterment. Before entering upon the story of Japan's first foreign war, 
it is fitting here to call attention to the success at length crowning the efforts of Japan to obtain the long-coveted boon of treaty revision. The last negotiations, conducted by Count Okuma in 1889, had failed because of the opposition to the appointment of foreign judges in Japanese courts of first instance, and courts of appeal in cases where foreigners were defendants. Okuma, as we saw, lost a leg through the popular hostility to this concession. In the very next year, however, Lord Salisbury, the British foreign minister, himself reopened the question by making several proposals for a treaty abolishing extraterritoriality and granting tariff autonomy, the whole to come into force in five years, so as to give time to the making of similar treaties with other nations. A few minor difficulties had to be overcome, such as the granting to foreign subjects a right of leasing land in Japan, but all was finally adjusted, and the revised British treaty was signed on July 16th, just a few days before the outbreak of the Sino-Japanese War. In the spring of 1894, an outbreak of insurrection in the south of Korea, known as the Tonghak Movement, led to a request from the Min Party, to which the masterful Queen of Korea belonged, for help from China. The Tonghaks were the rustic followers of a Korean fanatic named Choi, who had been executed as a Christian in 1865. His system was really a curious mixture of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, but his use of the title Tian Chu, Heaven Lord, for God, had caused him to be regarded by the authorities as a Roman Catholic. In accordance with the Tianjin Convention, China sent 2,500 troops, but accompanied the notification with the provocative assertion, which contradicted any supposed waiver of suzerainty. It is in harmony with our constant practice to protect our tributary states. Japan countered by sending a similar number of soldiers to the vicinity of Seoul. It is undeniable that from the first, a distinctly aggressive attitude was assumed by the Chinese resident, and the reference to Korea as a tributary state was repeated more than once. Moreover, no attention was paid to Japan's suggestion of joint action for the purpose of restoring order. Chinese activity seemed quite in the other direction, for when Kim ong kyun the Korean progressive leader, was beguiled from Japan only to be murdered at Shanghai. Instead of punishing the Korean assassins, China brought him on one of her warships to receive honors in his own country. Under the circumstances, Japan felt justified in regarding Chinese reinforcements sent to Korea as evidence of hostility. In fact, without notice to Japan, Chinese troops to the number of 11,000 were sent both by land and sea, and it was at once recognized that war was inevitable. Two Japanese cruisers were attacked by three Chinese warships engaged in convoying the transport Kaohsiung. The encounter took place on July 25, 1894, with the result that the transport, refusing to surrender, was sunk with a loss of 1,200 troops, and the Chinese warships destroyed or damaged. The war, formally declared on August 1st, seemed to the onlooking nations likely to prove an uneven conflict, the odds being strongly in favor of China. Yet the million ill-trained troops of the Middle Kingdom were in no way prepared to meet the 70,000 fighting men of Japan, while the Chinese navy, in spite of its superior size, had behind it no sense of national unity. The events of the war constitute an unbroken series of Japanese successes and may be roughly summarized as follows. Seoul was first occupied and the Chinese defeated in the neighborhood of Pinyang. Then came the defeat of the Chinese fleet by Admiral Ito Yuko on September 17th, with the loss of five ships sunk at the mouth of the Yalu River. The crossing of the Yalu immediately after brought the Japanese into Manchuria. With the freedom of the seas secured, an attack was made by Field Marshal Oyama on Port Arthur, and the fortress was soon forced to capitulate with a loss to the assailants of only 400 killed and wounded. The investment and capture of Wai Ha Wei followed, and a further attack on the Chinese fleet resulted in its surrender on February 14, 1895, and in the suicide of the gallant Admiral Ting. The rout of the Chinese army at the mouth of the Liao River completed the victory and brought the fighting part of the campaign to a conclusion. During the seven and a half months of the war's duration, party spirit in Japan was completely forgotten, and all men cooperated loyally with the emperor and, as they believed, 
with the spirits of the ancestors to secure the desired victory. Negotiations, twice offered by China in an irregular manner, were eventually commenced on March 20th between Ito and the veteran Chinese statesman Li Hongchang at Shimonoseki. A regrettable attack upon the life of Li, made four days earlier, undoubtedly served to make the terms easier for the defeated than had been intended. By the Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed April 14, 1895, China agreed to recognize the independence of Korea, to cede to Japan the Liaotung Peninsula, the island of Formosa, Taiwan, and the neighboring Pescadores, to pay to Japan a war indemnity of 200 million taels, to open to trade the cities of Sashi, Chongqing, Suzhou, and Hangzhou, and to hand over to Japan Weihawei until after payment of the indemnity. An interesting, though unwelcome, sequel to the Treaty of Shimonoseki was one which was to have momentous consequences in the years to follow, was the demand made on April 23rd, within a week of the signing of the treaty, by Germany, France, and Russia, that Japan should retrocede her claim to annexations on the mainland in consideration of an additional indemnity of 30 million tiles. Japan at the time was unable to resist the advice, but she secured the retranslation of the German note couched, it is said, in bad Japanese, and treasured up the memory of the episode for future use. Though encouraged, as the Japanese claim, in remote antiquity, education, like all things else, made an entirely new start with Meiji. The early education introduced with Buddhism was fit for priests rather than for men of the world. The Tokugawa system taught boys the elements of the Chinese classics, history, law, mathematics, and literature, but there was little for the common people and still less for girls. With Fukuzawa and the founding of the Keio before the downfall of the shogunate, we have an earnest of the zeal to come. The sage of Mita, it is said, went on with his classes even while civil war was going on in the Ueno Park in the same city with himself. Immediately after the beginning of Meiji, the Charter Oath emphasized the fact that knowledge was to be sought through all the world, and early in 1868, students were urged to attend the schools which had been founded during the shogunate. Some of these students, who were known as tribute youths, were to be educated at the expense of the clans. An ordinance relating to universities, middle and elementary schools, was issued in 1869. In 1871, the first Department of Education was established, just a year after the establishment of a system of government education in England. The promulgation of the first educational code followed in September 1872, and the country, exclusive of the Hokkaido and the Ryukyu Islands, was divided into eight university providences, each providence into 32 middle school districts, and each of these into 210 elementary school districts. It is interesting to note that in 1873 there were over 12,000 elementary schools, 20,000 in 1874, and 28,000 in 1879. Yet there was a good deal of difficulty in applying the code, mainly because some regulations had been borrowed bodily from European systems. So in 1879, there was put forth a revised code which made the curriculum simpler and showed the influence of American rather than French ideas. Another revision came in 1886, when Viscount Mori, who was murdered three years later, was Minister of Education. Under Mori, there was a distinction made in elementary and middle schools, between ordinary and higher courses, while more attention was paid, under the German Hausknecht, to the training of teachers. In all these codes, a unique feature was the emphasis placed on moral training. Yet in the turbulent beginnings of constitutionalism, there was much discussion as to the proper basis for this instruction. Some argued for Buddhism, some for Confucianism, and some for Christianity. The question was settled for the Japanese by the issuance of the remarkable imperial rescript of October 30th, 1890, of which the more important part runs as follows. Our imperial ancestors have founded our empire on a basis broad and everlasting, and have deeply and firmly implanted virtue. Our subjects, ever uniting in loyalty and filial piety, have from generation to generation illustrated the beauty thereof. 
This is the glory of the fundamental character of our empire, and herein also lies the source of our education. Ye, our subjects, be filial to your parents, affectionate to your brothers and sisters, as husbands and wives be harmonious, as friends true. Bear yourselves in modesty and moderation. Extend your benevolence to all. Pursue learning and cultivate arts, and thereby develop intellectual faculties and perfect moral powers. Furthermore, advance public good and promote common interests. Always respect the Constitution and observe the laws. Should emergency arise, offer yourselves courageously to the state, and thus guard and maintain the prosperity of our imperial throne, coeval with heaven and earth. So shall ye be not only our good and faithful subjects, but render illustrious the best traditions of your forefathers. Later on, there was the Second Imperial Rescript of 1908 and the Revised Educational Ordinances of 1900, 1907, and 1911. It suffices here to direct attention to the general fact that in education, Japan was at least keeping pace with the advances made in other branches of reform. We must not, of course, forget to add to the educational efforts made by the government two other voluntary systems. The one was the work of citizens who founded schools and colleges, sometimes as a work of filial piety, and sometimes to accomplish the carrying out of a definite program. We have already mentioned the foundation of the Keio by Fukuzawa and the Doshisha, founded in 1875 at Kyoto by Joseph Nishima. We must also mention especially the University of Waseda, founded by the statesman Okuma. The grounds of the college now include the house where the venerable statesman died, and his spirit seems still to brood over the splendid institution. The other type of voluntary educational effort is to be seen in the many schools and colleges founded by missionaries and missionary societies, such as St. Paul's and the Oyama Gakuin at Tokyo and Christian College at Kobe. These schools, in method and in practice, as well as in ideals, have lent powerful aid towards carrying out the educational purposes of the government. We have already seen how the Restoration opened a door for the re-entry of Christian missions at the same time that it re-established contact with the West. We have also had occasion to mention some of the pioneers of the Christian faith who entered Japan as early as 1859. In their footsteps, others speedily followed. The first missionary was Rev. George Enser in 1869. Even at this date, however, the missionary had to be visited by night and in secret. One man came to Mr. Enser with the intention of assassinating him, but was instead himself converted and became the means of converting others. In 1873, the attitude of the government changed. The kosatsu, or notice boards prohibiting the preaching of Christianity, were removed. There were even Japanese leaders who, merely out of zeal in the acceptance of Western ideas, were moved to suggest that Christianity be made the national religion. Happily, this merely nominal acceptance was averted and the mission work proceeded normally. As it was, there was an avalanche of opportunity, and baptisms were frequent. Writing in 1889, Rev. D. C. Green says, Not less than 30 students of the Imperial University were avowed Christians. Among the members of a single congressional church were a judge of the Supreme Court of Japan, a professor in the Imperial University, three governmental secretaries, members of at least two noble families, while in a Presbyterian church, there are the three most prominent members of the Liberal Party, one of them a count in the new peerage. At the time of the Emperor's ascension, there were, outside of the unknown Roman Catholic adherents, only four Christians in the empire. In 1889, there were 31,000 Protestant and Anglican baptized members and probably around 45,000 belonging to the Roman and Greek communions. The mission of the Russian church, founded at Hokudate in 1861 by Pierre, afterwards Archbishop, Nikolai, has been one of the most remarkable missionary movements of the modern times. In 1914, there were 33,000 converts under the care of this mission. The first attempt to present the New Testament in Japanese was by Mr. Goebel, to whom it is generally accredited the invention of the Jin Rikisha of the American Baptist Mission in 1879. The whole Bible, carefully translated by representatives of all the chief missionary societies, appeared in 1887. As has already been stated, educational work has played an important part in the establishment of missions in Japan, but missionary schools, as schools, 
are at the present time less and less needed on account of the general excellence of the public schools and colleges. The war with China had drawn the party statesmen of Japan close together to meet a great national emergency. The necessity of accepting the advice of certain Western powers in the matter of retroceding the Liaotong Peninsula made very evident the fact that sound policy in the future demanded further military preparedness and a large expansion of both army and navy. Yet it cannot be said that during these years the management of the nation's affairs was much assisted by party government. The Matsukata ministry lasted only from September 1896 to the end of 1897, and Okuma left it after only two months' association. Then came Ito's third ministry, which, however, after six months, gave way to a coalition of liberals and progressivists under Okuma and Itagaki in June 1898. Six months later, this in turn gave place to a conservative ministry under Yamagata, which had the good fortune to survive nearly two years. In October 1900, the new party, known as the Seiyu Kwai Political Fraternal Association, formed August 25, 1900, gave a majority to Ito's fourth ministry, which, by means of an imperial rescript, tided over difficulties with the House of Peers and lasted until May 1901. Then the emperor sent for Viscount Katsura, whose ministry, without being liked by any of the political parties, was enabled to hold its own through its independence of the majority in the Diet and by means of disillusions, till the outbreak of the war with Russia on February 10, 1904, brought once again a solid front of support against an outside foe, and peace within the sphere of domestic politics. The record in the ten years between the two wars is that of six ministries and four disillusions. Foreign policy had been of vital consequence not merely to the influence, but also to the very existence of Japan since its victory over China. The prestige of the empire had been immensely increased by the campaign and also by the treaty revision of 1894, which ensured removal of the stigma of extraterritoriality in five years' time. Japan was now a member, on equal terms, of the family of the powers. She was so much the more, therefore, in danger from the intrigues of the nations which were bent upon preventing her influence from affecting their plans for exploiting the Asianic mainland. Russia began at once, after the conclusion of peace with China, by capitalizing the interest she had acquired. First of all, she obtained permission to complete the Siberian Railway from Vladivostok through Manchuria, instead of using the long loop of the Amur. She also obtained financial advantage by lending to China the money needed to pay off the indemnity to Japan. Three years later, she followed up the German seizure of a portion of the province of Shantun by obtaining a lease of Port Arthur, of which she had deprived Japan in 1895. Then followed the extortion of the right to build a branch railway from Harbin through Mukden to Port Arthur. All of this was of intense significance to Japan, who meanwhile could only continue her preparations for the inevitable struggle which was to come. Then came the Boxer outbreak in China. The old Empress Dowager, tired of watching the process of the slicing of the melon, made her famous coup d'etat of September, 1898, swept impatiently aside the reforms of July, and threw in her lot with the Boxers who, fortified with strange medicines, deemed themselves invulnerable. In the fatuous attempt to get rid of the foreigners at one fell swoop, Mr. Sugiyama, chancellor to the Japanese legation, was one of the early victims. And for this reason, as well as because of Japan's contiguity to the scene of trouble, Japan was called upon to join the Allied forces charged with the capture of Peking from the punishment of the rebels. The troops sent from the island empire were among the most efficient of those employed in this remarkable expedition. They gained, moreover, an enviable reputation both for their valor and military skill, and for their freedom from the general tendency to loot the captured territory. During the negotiations which followed the suppression of the boxers, Russia separated herself from her quondam allies and overran Manchuria. She failed, moreover, to withdraw her troops when the other powers, according to agreement, evacuated the region which had been previously occupied. Promises indeed were made to complete the withdrawal in three stages of evacuation six months apart, but the promise was kept only so far as the first stage was concerned. Russia, in fact, was following anything but a simple and settled line of action in the Far East. 
while the naval men were probably ready for a campaign of annexation in Manchuria, Witt was content with a policy of peaceful penetration both in Manchuria and northern China. The notorious Bezobrazov was, under pretext of taking over timber concessions in Korea, working for the predominance of Russia in the peninsula. Japan seemed for a time quite willing to allow Russia her way with Manchuria, provided she was permitted a similar freedom in Korea. But the bear wanted to fill both paws with oriental honey. While the negotiations between Russia and Japan were in an early stage, the position of the latter country internationally was immensely strengthened by the signing, on January 30th, 1902, of the Anglo-Japanese Alliance. Such an alliance had been favored as far back as 1895 by Count Mutsu, the then foreign minister, and the English statesman, Joseph Chamberlain, had advocated the step in March 1898. But it was left for Lord Lansdowne in England and Hayashi, the Japanese minister, to bring the matter to a successful issue. Ito had been sent to Europe to work for a German-Japanese alliance, or possibly to put pressure, by the appearance of such, upon the British Foreign Office. For a time, some favor was shown towards the working for a triple alliance between Great Britain, Germany, and Japan, though it also seems likely that Japan was herself hesitating between an Anglo-Japanese alliance and an understanding with Russia. To the relief of most people, however, the negotiations terminated as to the Anglo-Japanese alliance of January 30th, 1902. Today, it is the fashion to underestimate the advantages gained by either party by the agreement, but at the time, these were sufficiently obvious. To Japan, it was felt that in the event of a conflict with Russia, England might be depended upon to keep the ring. The reoccurrence of such an episode as the retrocession of the Liaotong Peninsula was rendered impossible. It made easier, moreover, the floating in London of some much-desired loans. For Great Britain, the advantage of the arrangement, the first treaty of alliance made with any Oriental power, was not quite so clear, but in the background was doubtless the fear of Russian aggression in India. The most important provisions of the treaty are contained in the promise that, should either contracting power become involved in a conflict with any third power, the other would exert its influence to prevent others from joining in hostilities against its ally. Should, however, any third power intervene, it should be the duty of the other contracting power to come to the assistance of its ally and to maintain war in common. The significance of the Treaty of Alliance was the more apparent in view of the recent character of Western intercourse with Japan. Less than 50 years before, Mr. Fukuzawa could find in all Yedo no one to teach him English, and the first English minister to Japan on his way out was of the opinion that Japan was a cluster of isles on the furthest verge of the horizon, apparently inhabited by a race grotesque and savage. That one of the proudest nations of the West should now be anxious for an alliance with such a people is indeed significant, and it was not long before Japan herself was to appreciate the advantage which had been thus secured. We have already traced in part the events which made this tremendous and fateful struggle more or less inevitable. While the diplomacy of Russia was shifty and evasive, Japan showed herself commendably patient and conciliatory. In her case, the subsequent action was defensive, and indeed, a matter of life and death. In the case of Russia, there was the ambition, encouraged by the Tsar, to make of Manchuria another Bukhara. So while the Russian foreign office, crafty, obdurate, and dilatory, was through the mouth of Lambsdorff temporizing, troops were being dispatched in ever-increasing numbers to the east. Finally, after six months of weary parleying, Japan severed diplomatic relations with Russia, recalled her minister, Carino, and announced that she would take such independent action as she considered best. The situation was a startling one to the whole world, since to most it was beyond belief that Japan could successfully wage war with one of the most powerful of European empires. Nor is amazement much less in retrospect, even when all due allowance is made for Russian distance from her base, for the corruption and incompetence of her higher officers, and for the general unpopularity of the war with the masses even then on the verge of revolution. Japan was quite within her rights in seizing the initiative, though actually the first shot was fired by the Russians when they encountered the Japanese transports on the way to Korea. But the gigantic conflict really began on February 9, 1904, with the almost simultaneous attacks made by Admiral Togo at Port Arthur and by Admiral Uryu at Chemulpu. 
Each of these engagements resulted in a victory for the Japanese and gave the freedom necessary for ensuring the passage of troops to Korea and Manchuria. They also served to increase the terribly small margin of naval ascendancy which Japan held at the opening of the war. Land operations commenced with the victory of General Kuroki's first army on the Yalu, where the Russian commander, General Kuropotkin, had been ill-advised enough to order a stand. This success opened the way to the Liaoyang. Meanwhile, the second army had reached the field, under General Oku. He landed on the Liaotong Peninsula and immediately after, on May 26th, won the important battle of Kinchou, capturing thereby Nanxin and compelling, on May 30th, the abandonment of the port of Dalni, Dairen. A little later, General Nozu landed at Takushan to join Kuroki, and General Nogi's army commenced the investment of Port Arthur. This left Oku free to check the force of Kuropotkin, which had been planning the relief of the fortress. While the investment of Port Arthur was being completed from the land side, attempts were made from the sea to make an effective blockade. During one of these attempts, the Russian flagship, Pietro Pavlovsk, with Admiral Makarov on board, was sunk. The Japanese also suffered on the sea on June 15th, although the worst of the misadventure was successfully kept a secret until after the war. The loss of the cruiser Yoshino by collision and that of the battleships Yashima and Hatsuse by mines were incidents which might have had a serious moral effect had they become public. On land, a great battle lasted at Liaoyang for the whole week, commencing August 25th. In the end, the three armies of Oku, Nozu, and Kuroki, under the general command of Field Marshal Oyama, inflicted a tremendous defeat upon General Kuropatkin. Hardly less serious in its effect upon Russia was the defeat shortly afterwards suffered on the Shaho. After this, the opposing armies went into winter quarters. Meanwhile, against the beleaguered fortress of Port Arthur, terrific and costly attacks continued. The Japanese made the most heroic sacrifices, sometimes for the smallest conceivable gains. 10,000 men gave up their lives in the taking of 203 Meter Hill. The spirit of all, down to the common soldier, was that of Take Hirose, one of the many heroes of the siege, when he wrote, As infinite as the dome of heaven above us is the debt we owe our emperor. Immeasurable as the deep sea below us is the debt we owe our country. The time has come for us to pay our debts. When the news was brought to General Nogi that his own son was among the dead, the stoical soldier remarked quietly, It is an honor that the nation has accepted the humble sacrifice. So ever nearer these human bullets got to the doomed citadel and port, and soon after, General Kondrantenko, one of the most skillful of Port Arthur's defenders, was slain. General Stosel decided to surrender. The surrender was made to General Nogi on the first day of the new year, 1905. In the early spring of this new year, the campaign to the north was resumed. What has been described as the greatest battle in all history, up to this date, was waged around Mukden from February 24th to March 10th. All the plain between the city and the imperial tombs still today bears witness to the terrible struggle. In one enclosure alone, the writer has seen the inscription which marks the resting place of 23,000 Japanese dead. The battle was won by a great flanking movement, carried out by Nogi's veteran army, opportunely released by the capitulation of Port Arthur. The Russians are said to have lost 27,000 killed and 110,000 wounded. Although so far the Japanese had enjoyed an almost unbroken series of victories, they were really at this time in a rather critical situation. Money was hard to get for the continuance of the war. The Japanese communications were getting longer and the Russian lines shorter. The double tracking of the Siberian railway was enabling Russia to speed up the transport of troops. Most serious of all, the Russian Baltic fleet had sailed in October 1904 and was gradually nearing the eastern waters. And here we may rightfully claim that American influence had some weight on the scale favorable to Japan. For if Germany and France were contemplating intervention in the aid of Russia, Mr. Roosevelt characteristically made it known that in such a case he would promptly side with Japan. Writing to his English friend, Mr. Cecil Spring Rice, he added, I, of course, knew that your government would act in the same way, and I thought it best that I should have no consultation with your people before announcing my own purpose. 
it is quite possible that Mr. Roosevelt's promptness on this occasion went far towards averting the outbreak of a world war. But much was depending on the skill and vigilance of the Japanese Navy, and Togo was not the man to betray the hopes of Nippon. The great Russian fleet of 29 ships under Admiral Razasvensky reached the Straits of Tsushima on May 27, 1905, and was attacked by the Japanese admiral at exactly the psychological moment. The Battle of the Sea of Japan, in which the Russians lost their entire fleet, with some 4,000 killed or drowned and 7,000 taken prisoners, to the 116 killed and 538 wounded on the Japanese side, deserves to be ranked among the decisive battles of all history. The effect was electrical throughout the world and, although Russian fighting power was by no means so far impaired as to make a continuance of the struggle impossible, it was clear that the proper moment had arrived to suggest negotiations with a view to making peace. The offer, as expected, was made by President Roosevelt on June 9th and was at once accepted by both combatants. It was mutually agreed that envoys from the belligerent nations should meet at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the first session was held on August 10th. Russia was represented by Mr. afterwards Count Witt and Baron R. Rosen, and Japan by Baron, afterwards Marquis, Komura and Mr. afterwards Baron, Takahira. Viscount Kaneko was also present unofficially as representing Ito. Komura's proposals were first of all rejected en blanc after the matter of oriental bargaining, and then taken up for discussion one by one. The main difficulty was on two points, the cession of Sakhalim and the payment of indemnity. On these points, after four days' discussion, there followed six days' deadlock. An adjournment of two days made the reopening of hostilities more probable. Among the extra or ancillary secrets of the conference is the story that Mr. Roosevelt forced the hands of the Japanese by permitting the Associated Press to publish a statement to the effect that Japan would accept peace without indemnity. This, however it came about, Omura was obligated to accept. The compromise, which to most observers had seemed, under the circumstances, inevitable, resulted in the following features of the Treaty of Portsmouth. 1. Japan's paramount position in Korea was conceded. 2. The southern half of Sakhalin, known as Karafuto, was conceded to Japan instead of the indemnity of 580 million U.S. dollars, which had been demanded. No fortifications, however, were to impede the navigation of the straits. 3. A simultaneous evacuation of Manchuria, the Liaotong Peninsula being, in the case of Japan, accepted, was to be carried out by both armies within 18 months. 4. To Japan was awarded the Russian lease of the Liaotung Peninsula with the railway and other privileges south of Kyuang Chense and Changchun. 5. Fishing privileges were accorded Japan along the shores of the Bering Sea. 6. Payment was to be made for the maintenance of prisoners, the balance due to Japan amounting to about 20 million US dollars. The treaty was signed on September 5, 1905 and this was followed by the signature of an agreement at Seoul on November 17th, establishing the Japanese protectorate over Korea, also by an agreement with China on December 22nd, transferring to Japan the reversion of the Russian leases. The South Manchurian Railway Zone was created by imperial ordinance in the following June. Hailed with enthusiasm by all the governments of Europe and America, the Treaty of Portsmouth had by no means a popular reception in Japan. Possibly among the most dissatisfied was Komura himself, upon whom fell the weight of the popular discontent. The loss of an indemnity, which was expected to finance the new railway schemes in Manchuria, was associated in the Japanese imagination with the presence of Mr. E. H. Hariman in Tokyo and his well-known ambition to secure financial control of the Manchurian lines for the United States. Yet, as Mr. McCormick asserts, Komura's apparent diplomatic defeat at Portsmouth was reflected in the policy which he then forged for his country, and in this his proper star rose. The popular dissatisfaction is accounted for easily enough when we bear in mind the long strain to which the Japanese people had been subjected and the heroic sacrifices they had so cheerfully made. It was quite natural that the well-nigh miraculous restraint exhibited during the conflict should, under the circumstances, temporarily give way.
Yet the riots, regrettable as they were, were of small account when compared with the semi-revolutionary conditions prevailing at the time in Russia, and the people soon learned to take calmer and more sensible views. It was then recognized that, while the risk of continuing the war beyond the point reached was extreme to the degree of madness, the gains registered by the Treaty of Portsmouth were to Japan of inestimable value. The Orient was freed, at least for years to come, of a giant menace. Space was provided on the continent for the natural overflow of the Japanese population and for the expansion of Japanese commerce. Japanese prestige became, at a bound, a thing to conjure with throughout all Asia, not least the removal of the Anglo-Japanese alliance on August 12, 1905, while the war was still unfinished, showed that the proudest of the nations of the West was not adverse from sharing the fortunes of Nippon. Japan was now not merely an Asiatic, but also a world power, whose interests in the affairs of the East were unquestionable and dominant. End of chapter 26. Read by K. Dropeski. Chapter 27 of An Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 27 The Last Years of the Meiji. Domestic politics from 1905 to 1912 are not particularly interesting to the foreign student. Yet, they are quite important as revealing a considerable swing of the pendulum from the intoxication of military glory to a considerable manifestation of social discontent. This, possibly influenced in its later stages by the Chinese Revolution, was largely the result of domestic conditions. Mr. Saito writes, The repeated famines in the northeast districts of Japan, the disastrous eruption of the Sakurajima volcano, the rapid rise in the cost of living, the revelation of bribery scandals, the frequent changes of cabinets. All these work together to cause popular disquietude. Yet parliamentary government was showing a rather striking increase of stability as compared with the earlier years of constitutional government. During the first twelve sessions of the Diet, extending over eight years, there were five dissolutions of the lower house. During the next thirteen sessions, extending over eleven years, there were two dissolutions. During the first eight years of the Diet's existence, there were six changes of cabinet. During the next eleven years, there were five changes. Another healthy sign was that men of affairs were beginning to realize the importance of parliamentary representation. At first, the constituencies were contested almost entirely by professional politicians, barristers, and journalists. In 1909, there was a solid body, the Boshin Club, of businessmen commanding nearly 50 votes in the lower house. And as the upper chamber included 45 representatives of the highest taxpayers, the interests of commerce and industry were intelligently debated. After a premiership which had carried the country through the war, Katsura resigned in the last days of 1905. His place was taken by the Marquis Sayonji, who, on the defection of Ito, had become leader of the Seiyukai. The new premier succeeded in carrying through the nationalization of the railways in the 22nd session of the Diet. He also secured in 1907 an arrangement with France for safeguarding peace in the Far East. A similar agreement with China concerning the Simintan, Mukden, and Kirin Railway, and a new treaty with Korea, placing the administrative authority in the hands of the Japanese resident general. Early in 1908, however, there came about a cabinet crisis and the 10th general election took place in the May of that year. A month or two later, Sayonji resigned and made way for Katsura's second administration. The returned premier now held office for the unprecedentedly long term of four and a half years, resigning only in August 1911, with a view to renovating the spirit of the people. During the last year of this ministry, the whole country was thrilled with horror by the discovery of an anarchist plot against the emperor. The conspirators were arrested and tried. Many of them were condemned to death, but some of these received the imperial pardon. Katsura's most important step during his second administration was the annexation of Korea, for preservation of peace in the Far East. The terms of the Treaty of Portsmouth, so far as they are related to Korea, 
had been intended not only to safeguard the peninsula from the intrigues of European powers, but also to save the Koreans themselves from the consequences of their own chronic corruption and administrative incompetence. Possibly also the need of providing room for the embarrassingly rapid increase of the Japanese population was not unconsidered, though, as Mr. Gubbins reminds us, Japanese expansion and Japanese emigration are two quite separate questions. But the years following the signing of the treaty were full of difficulty and vexation, entailing, moreover, the expenditure of many millions of dollars and the loss of many valuable lives. It was in consequence of these difficulties that a new treaty was made between Japan and Korea on November 17, 1905, which established Japan's relationship to the peninsula clearly as that of a protectorate. Ito was sent as resident general, and it was decided that all Korea's diplomatic business should be transacted through Japanese channels. The Moribund state made a futile protest to the United States, which had in a vague way pledged her support some years earlier, but the logic of the situation was accepted, and America withdrew its legation. Thus, several years in advance of actual annexation, Korea terminated her existence as a separate nation. Yet, even with this, further and more drastic measures were speedily found desirable, and a new agreement was made July 24, 1907. During all this time, an enormous amount of work was being accomplished in the reformation of taxation and currency, the establishment of banks, post offices, telegraphs, and schools, and in the erection of public buildings. In some cases, as even Ito acknowledged, the new administration was unsympathetically and tactfully carried out. But the sullen and provocative nationalism of the Koreans made matters exceedingly difficult. The suppression of one insurrection cost the lives of 21,000 persons. At length, the Emperor of Korea, voluntarily or under pressure, abdicated in favor of his son, and the latter was sent to Japan to receive his education. Then came a series of very dramatic events, beginning with the resignation of Ito in June 1909. The great statesman was thoroughly discouraged by his failure to win the cooperation of the Korean people. Four months later, while the ex-resident general was conferring with the Russian Minister of Finance at Harbin, he was shot by a Korean fanatic. Thus, the career of one of the greatest Japanese in history was prematurely brought to a close. Among the telegrams of condolence received by the emperor was one from Lord Kitchener, who at the time was visiting the Manchurian battlefields. It is interesting to add that after the assassin had been taken to Japan and there condemned to death, he was allowed ten days' respite in order that he might finish a poem he had commenced. Prince Ito was succeeded in Korea by Baron Son, who, after a few months, resigned and gave place to General Terauchi. This appointment was the signal for carrying out the plan which had for some time been recognized as inevitable. On August 29, 1910, Korea became by annexation an integral part of the Japanese Empire. The old name of Chosen, Land of the Morning Freshness, was now officially adopted and the name of the capital, Seoul, became Keijo. The emperor, together with his predecessor, were allowed to remain in the old palace and provided with an annual income of a million yen. The older emperor died in January 1919. The younger, who was Yi to the Koreans, Li to the Chinese, and Ri to the Japanese, died on April 24th, 1926. Those who are desirous of acquainting themselves with the achievements of Japan and Korea during the first years after the annexation should read the remarkable report on Reforms and Progress in Chosen, issued by the Governor General at Keijo in July 1916. To mention only a few facts of significance, it is interesting to find that during the first two years following annexation, 15 million young trees were planted as a beginning in afforestation, that 10 million seedling mulberry trees and 60,000 broods of silkworm eggs were distributed to the farmers, that common, industrial, technical, and normal schools, as well as agricultural experimental stations, were established, and that a well-trained gendarmerie was organized. It is no wonder that after years of patience, Japan began to find in Korea a people heartened and bettered materially falling in with the situation and marching ahead. More on the same subject, however, must be reserved for a later page. One may grow sentimental over the disappearance of a kingdom which dates itself from 2333 BC, at which remote time the son of the creator alighted on a mountain in the province of Phyong'an, or at least from the foundation of a dynasty in 1122 BC, 
by the Chinese sage Qi Tzu. But one cannot deny that when Korea, after all her buffetings to and fro in the whirlpool of welt politique, found absorption in the Empire of Japan, a happy solution was reached such as should conduce to the peace of the Orient and of the world at large. Reference has already been made to the fact that, a week earlier than the signing of the Treaty of Portsmouth, Mr. Edward H. Harriman, the American railway financier, landed at Yokohama. Within five days, he procured the signature of a memorandum providing for the lease and management of the Southern Manchurian Railways. This memorandum, known as the ito Haraman Agreement, was undivulged at the time, but was evidently accepted by Japan, because in default of the indemnity from Russia, it seemed manifestly impossible to finance the railways, and still less possible to think of them as reverting to Russia. A month later, Komura, hot with indignation at what seemed to him the inadequate result of the Portsmouth Conference, arrived home. At once, Japanese politics assumed a new complexion, in general unfavorable to the influence of the United States. The memorandum was forgotten, or regarded as premature, and a new treaty was made with China, interpreting the provisions of the Treaty of Portsmouth a little more stringently in the interest of Japanese supremacy in the Orient. Japan had, in the sequel of her two wars, suffered sufficiently from the weakness of her diplomatic arm. In consequence, we are entitled at this time to interpret her diplomacy as being rather assertively pro-Japanese than as being deliberately anti-American. Yet there can be no doubt that it militated for a time against American influence in Far Eastern affairs. Regard must be had also to the stirring up of anti-foreign feeling on account of the California school question to which we shall presently recur. Nevertheless, things seem to be going smoothly at Washington. The sending of the American fleet of 16 battleships around the world was carefully planned so as to present nothing of menace to Japan. It is even doubtful whether the Root Takahiro Agreement, signed November 30, 1908, appeared at Washington either as a rebuff to China or as a further step towards securing Japanese dominance in the Orient. The language, expressive of the desire to encourage the free and peaceful development of their, i.e., the United States and Japan, commerce on the Pacific Ocean, to support by all Pacific means at their disposal the independence and integrity of China and the principle of equal opportunity, and to maintain the existing status quo in the region above mentioned, seemed harmless enough. Nevertheless, there was a sting in the tail of the document which was unobserved at the time. On the entrance of Mr. Taft's administration, the new Secretary of State, Mr. Knox, made known in January 1910 his plan for securing the neutralization of the Manchurian railways by purchase and restoration to China. The purchase to be carried out by means of a loan subscribed by the powers. But the plan was not supported by Great Britain, and was by the Japanese regarded as threatening the confiscation of their interests in Manchuria. Russia and Japan thereupon seemed to spring together in the adoption of a common policy. On January 20th, 1910, Japan informed China that she and Russia jointly declined the American proposal. Formal rejection followed, and on July 4, 1910, Japan and Russia signed an agreement excluding specifically all foreign interference. It was a rebuff to the United States, the nature of which could hardly be concealed by the conventions of diplomatic language. Further limitation of American influence came indirectly through the revolution in China. Prior to the revolution, Japan and Russia had insisted on joining a syndicate which was planning on extensive loan to China. The Six Power Loan, as it was called, was first delayed through the outbreak of the revolution. Then came President Wilson's withdrawal of American participation, from some fear lest the conditions of the loan should infringe upon the sovereign rights of China. Though defended by some, this withdrawal has been more generally regarded as only a further step in the fatal policy of weakening the American position in the Orient. However this may be, Japan's own influence continued to grow. Every opportunity was embraced of increasing the extent and variety of her reasons for intervention. It would be difficult, perhaps impossible, to prove that Japan officially took part in the long-continued disorder which marked the presidential term of Yuan Shikai. It would be as impossible to claim that she did not use every available opportunity to make assured her sovereignty in Eastern Asia. 
the fact that Yuan had been persona non grata to Japan ever since the time when he functioned as Chinese resident in Korea undoubtedly militated against the success of his government. Unsettled conditions, moreover, played into the hands of Japan as certainly as the comparative weakness of American diplomacy had done in the preceding decade. Though the emigration of laborers was not legalized in Japan until 1885, a few drifted over to America by various channels as early as 1841. Between 1861 and 1870, 218 Japanese came to the United States. In the years from 1901 to 1908, the number steadily increased, but the arrivals dropped from 9,544 in 1908 to 2,432 in 1909. These figures do not include those who, as indentured laborers, had come to the Hawaiian Islands prior to their annexation to the United States. After the annexation in 1898, the coming of Japanese laborers from Hawaii did much to increase American hostility. In 1910, the Japanese residents in the United States numbered 72,000, and 57,000 of these were on the Pacific coast. The earliest expression of the cry, the Japs must go, was in 1887, when there were only 400 in California. Yoshio Marquino, the artist, describes his introduction to American courtesy on landing at San Francisco in July 1893. I went to Golden Gate Park, he says, with another Japanese. Whenever we passed before the crowds, they shouted, Jap, and Sukebe, the latter word is too rude to translate. Then some of them even spat on us. When we came out to the corner of Geary Street, pebbles were showered upon us. The appearance of the bubonic plague in San Francisco in 1899 led to the strengthening of the agitation, though there was no reason for connecting the arrival of the plague with the Japanese. In 1901, the exclusion of Japanese was demanded with yet greater vehemence, and the Asiatic Exclusion League, formed in 1905, began to exercise more and more pressure on public bodies. Hence, in May 1905, the passing of the Order for Separate Schools by the Board of Education. The carrying out of this policy was, however, delayed by the Great Earthquake and Fire till the next year. It is interesting to note that, at the time these separate schools were created, there were only 93 pupils, 60 of them under 16 years of age, and scattered over 23 different schools, who came under the ruling. Secretary Metcalf, sent by President Roosevelt to investigate the matter, reported as follows. Many of the foremost educators of the state are strongly opposed to the action of the San Francisco Board of Education. Japanese are admitted to the University of California, an institution maintained and supported by the state. They are also admitted and gladly welcomed at Stanford University. San Francisco, so far as known, is the only city which has discriminated against Japanese children. Further immigration of Japanese was disallowed by Congress in 1907, and by proclamation, Mr. Roosevelt forbade their coming from Hawaii, Mexico, and Canada. The Gentlemen's Agreement was made by negotiation with Tokyo, whereby Japan promised not to give passports to Japanese laborers proceeding to the United States. This agreement, until its suppression by the Immigration Bill of 1924, was maintained with unquestioned good faith. Yet the campaign in California continued, and successive sessions of the legislature were flooded with exclusion bills. These culminated in the Alien Landowners Bill, which after some rebuffs was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor on May 19, 1913. The question then took on the character which has since proved a considerable obstacle to harmonious relations between Japan and the United States. It may be said that there were few on either side of the Pacific who favored a policy of unrestricted immigration. The great desire was for the adoption of such a plan as should avoid unjust discrimination between races. In Australia, where the desire for Japanese conclusion was at least as strong as in California, discrimination was avoided by the employment of a dictation test, which could be manipulated to keep out the undesirables of any race or color. In Canada, where also the objection to the entrance of Japanese laborers was strong, the question was settled by the Canadian mission of November 1907, under Mr. Lemieux, which obtained from the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs an undertaking to adopt such measures as were needed to prevent immigration. Beyond the question of the admission of Japanese to the United States was that of granting citizenship to those already resident. My own opinion is that the naturalization law should be so changed as to make the aliens of all races eligible to citizenship. 
Such a law would be based upon good principle and would do much to foster good feeling on the part of Asiatics towards the United States, an end greatly to be desired. Still beyond this lies the larger question of consideration and kindly feeling, which might be so easily and so much more evidently shown to the Orientals and other alien races who have come to sojourn among us. On this point, the writer said some years ago, frank and honorable relations between the State Departments of Oriental nations and our own, equally removed from doctrinaire sentimentalism and from pandering to popular prejudice, intelligent and humane administration of existing laws respecting immigrants, encouragement of the intercourse which shall promote mutual understanding and goodwill. These are the factors which will make the human more conspicuous than the racial, and link together the two shores of the Pacific with the bond of honorable and lasting peace. The Marquis Sionji was still premier when the whole nation received a terrible shock in the death early on the morning of July 30th, 1912, of the Emperor Mutsuhito. During the brief illness which preceded this event, many were the incidents which testified to the love and loyalty of the dying monarch's people. Perhaps none is more touching than the story of the little girl who cut off her hair to present at a shrine with prayers for the emperor's recovery. The deceased ruler had reigned for forty-five years as a liberal sovereign in the truest sense of the word. The passionate loyalty which was exhibited through all these years to the throne was due as much to the emperor's personal character as to the age-long belief of the people in his divine descent. The emperor had lived a life of Spartan simplicity and of unwearying effort for the good of his subjects. He had made himself distinguished for his humanity and charity on every occasion of suffering and need. He was also devoted to the arts, and an accomplished writer of the short Japanese poems which are known as Tanka. Dead, he lost the familiar name of Mutsuhito and assumed the title of the memorable age his reign had inaugurated. As Meiji Tenno, his influence is still strong as ever. This is shown by the multitudes who visit worshipfully the beautiful shrine at Tokyo which preserves the idea of his spiritual presence. That Japanese are still ready to die for him is illustrated by the story of the little boy who, rescuing his emperor's picture from the burning schoolhouse, had no place to hide it from the flames but in his own body, which he opened unhesitatingly with his knife. Only the charred body revealed the story of a triumphant sacrifice. The London Times, in the course of an obituary editorial, expressed the general estimation of mankind as follows. By the death of Emperor Mutsuhito, Japan loses a monarch venerated almost to the point of worship, the world one of its most remarkable men, and Great Britain a faithful and trusted ally. His reign will probably remain forever the most memorable in the long annals of Japan. Under him, Japan burst the bonds which had for so many centuries constrained her, and took her place, mailed and serene, among the great powers of the world. He saw the whole process from the beginning, helped to guide it aright, and won for himself enduring remembrance in the history of the East. The funeral, on September 13th, consisted of a series of impressive ceremonials with the traditional and archaic symbolism of Shinto. The funeral car, drawn by five oxen chosen for their special color, was so constructed that the wheels made seven different melancholy creaking sounds as they revolved. The peculiar effect being the exclusive art of a family of carpenters at Kyoto, whose forefathers have constructed many a buyer for the imperial house. A startling episode in connection with the funeral rites was the suicide of General Moreske Nogi and his wife at the moment when the imperial procession started. The grim soldier, who had borne with a samurai's courage the death of his two sons at Port Arthur, was missed from the funeral cortege of the emperor he had so effectually served. There were those, however, who asserted that, in the form of a pale blue flame, his freed spirit had been perceived hovering above the imperial hearse. As evening fell, the two bodies were found weltering in blood in the humble little home which is still visited by so many thousands of admiring pilgrims. It was a startling revival of the old practice of Junshi, following in death. An extraordinarily deep impression, writes a correspondent, has been made upon the nation by the tragic end of one who was universally admired and acknowledged to be the finest flower of the military tradition of Japan, and who had been, in fact, sans peur et sans reproche. End of chapter 27。Chapter 28 of An Outline History of Japan。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Serafina An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowen Chapter 28 The New Era of Taisho Immediately after the passing away of Meiji Tenno, two out of the three sacred treasures of the empire, the sword and the jewel, were committed to the new sovereign, Yoshihito, with whom was inaugurated the era of Taisho, great righteousness. The third treasure, the mirror, remained, as was customary, in the great shrine at Ise. Yoshihito Harunomiya, the third son of Mutsuhito, was born on August 31st, 1879, was made heir apparent on August 31st, 1887, and was proclaimed Crown Prince November 3rd, 1888. He was married to Sadako, daughter of Prince Kujo, on May 10th, 1900. At the time of his accession, he had three sons, the eldest of whom, the present Prince Regent, Hirohito, was born April 29, 1901. The coronation did not take place till November 1915 and was, as usual on such occasions, a strange blend of the archaic and the ultra-modern. Among the most significant of the rites was the Dai Josai, which goes back to a time of immemorial antiquity. In a primitive hut of unhewn timbers, bound together with vines, the emperor kept his ten hours vigil. Here the priests made the motion of pouring hot water over him seven times from a wooden ladle. Here he made obeisance to the sacred sword and the sacred jewel. Here he made his communion with the gods, in three helpings of rice, four cups of white sake, and four cups of black sake. Here he reported to the gods his assumption of the imperial authority. Ere this significant ceremony had taken place, the realm was once again shadowed by death. A wave of genuine grief passed over the land in the spring of 1914, when it was announced that the widowed Empress of Meiji Tenno had passed away. Though not the mother of the new emperor, the deceased lady was bound to him and to his family, as well as to the nation at large, by most affectionate ties. Once again, the quaint procession of oxen and creaking wheels expressed the woe of the inarticulate. Once again, the love and loyalty of the populace flowed forth unstintedly. The dead empress was laid to her last rest in Kyoto, and her spirit venerated among the kami as the empress Shokin. The Marquis Sayonji's ministry did not long survive the accession of the new emperor. Its downfall came about through the insistence of the war minister, General Uehara, upon retaining two army divisions in Korea. As the cabinet was embarked upon a policy of economy, and as no other soldier would accept the war office without the two divisions, Sayonji had no alternative but to resign. After something of a deadlock, Katsura, now Prince Katsura, patriotically offered to fill the gap, but the rising tide of democratic feeling suspected his motives and a resolution of no confidence, moved by Mr. Ozaki in the lower house, created so much feeling that the aged statesman felt obliged to resign. He began at once the formation of a new party, which was called Riken Doshikai, the Constitutional Crusaders Association, destined to be influential enough in the after years. But the banner of leadership soon fell from the failing hands of Prince Katsura, and before 1912 was ended, he was dead. He had been accused of appealing too frequently to the emperor for protection, and his death from cancer was that of a humbled and disappointed man. In February 1913 came the Yamamoto Ministry, but this was brought to an end in a few months by what is known as the Naval Scandal. 
This implicated quite a number of men, some of them high in official position, who had accepted bribes from the Siemens Schuchert Company in obtaining the contract for building a Japanese warship. Another deadlock followed, during which Prince Tokugawa and Viscount Kiyora vainly attempted the formation of a cabinet. At last, on April 14, 1914, the grand old man of Waseda, Count Okuma, accepted the task with the assistance of Prince Katsura's new party, the Doshikai. The leader of this party, Baron Kato, became the new foreign minister. It was to this cabinet that the responsibility fell of deciding upon entrance into the Great War. The room is still shown in which the epoch-making decision was made. On August 1st, 1914, the Great War burst upon a startled and bewildered world. It was soon evident that Japan was ready, both in the spirit and in the letter, to observe whatever obligations she had incurred by her alliance with Great Britain. It is with profound regret, ran the imperial edict, that we, in spite of our ardent devotion to the cause of peace, are thus compelled to declare war, especially at this early period of our reign and while we are still in mourning of our lamented mother. Baron Kato explained in the Diet that Japan had no desire or inclination to become involved in the present conflict, but she believed she owed it to herself to be faithful to the alliance and to strengthen its foundation by ensuring permanent peace in the East and protecting the special interests of the two allied powers. On August 15th, Japan issued an ultimatum asking Germany to withdraw all warships from Chinese and Japanese waters and deliver up by September 15th the entire leased territory of Kyochao with a view to its eventual restoration to China. It is said that the demand was, with intentional sarcasm, modeled upon that which Germany, nearly 20 years previously, had made for the retrocession of the Liaotang Peninsula. As no answer was vouchsafed by Germany prior to August 23rd, war was declared by Japan on the following day. It has been stated that negotiations were already proceeding between Germany and China for the abandonment, at least temporarily, of Tsingtao, but, in any case, the initiative was with Japan. The first Japanese troops were landed on September 2nd and these were presently joined by a small Anglo-Indian force under General Bernardistone. The bombardment of the forts began on October 31st and was so vigorously prosecuted that the defenders surrendered on November 7th. The Allied troops made formal occupation of the conquered port on November 16th. Even before the end of the siege of Tsingtao, the Japanese fleet had destroyed in a few days the German prestige in the Pacific by the capture of the largest of the Marshall Islands on October 6th, the seizure of Yap on the day following, and the occupation of all the Marshalls, Ladrones, and Carolines by October 20th. Of the further services of Japan to the Allied cause in the Great War, we shall have occasion to speak a little later. Within two months of the taking of Tsingtao, the world was startled by an application to China at the hands of Japan of the doctrine of maximum pressure. On January 18, 1915, Dr. Hioki, the Japanese minister at Peking, personally served upon President Yuan Shikai what are known as the 21 Demands. These demands, arranged in five groups, may be roughly summarized as follows. Group 1 dealt with the recently acquired territory in Shangtang, securing the transfer to Japan of all the privileges included in Germany's lease and asking China's promise that no future lease to any third power of territory in the province of Shangtang should be considered. Group 2 asked the acknowledgement of Japan's special position in Manchuria and eastern Mongolia and extension of the lease of Port Arthur to a period of 99 years, and certain rights of residence, mining, and railway building by Japanese subjects in these territories. Group 3 demanded that the Hanya Bing Mining Company 
should become the joint concern of Japan and China, thus carrying Japanese influence into the valley of the Yangtze. Group 4 asked the Chinese government to agree that no island, port, or harbor along the coast shall be ceded or leased to any third power. Group 5 may be quoted in extenso, since it was around these points that the bitterest controversy raged. Article 1. The Chinese government shall employ forceful Japanese as advisors in political, financial, and military affairs. Article 2. In the interior of China, Japanese shall have the right of ownership of land for the building of Japanese hospitals, churches, and schools. Article 3. Since the Japanese government and the Chinese government had many cases of dispute between Japanese and Chinese police to settle, cases which caused no inconsiderable misunderstanding, it is for this reason necessary that the police of important places in China shall be jointly administered by Japanese and Chinese, or that the Chinese police department of the places shall employ numerous Japanese for the purpose of organizing and improving the Chinese police service. Article 4. China shall purchase from Japan a fixed ration of the quantity of munitions of war, say above 50%, or Japan shall establish in China a jointly worked arsenal, Japanese technical experts to be employed, and Japanese material to be purchased. Article 5. China agrees to Japan's right to build a railway connecting Wuchang with Qiuqiang and Nanchang also a line between Wuchang and Hangzhou, and a line between Nanchang and Qiaochao. Article 6. China agrees that in the province of Fujian, Japan shall have the right to work mines and build railways and to construct harbor works, including dockyards, and in case of employing foreign capital, Japan shall be first consulted. Article 7. China agrees that Japanese subjects shall have the right to propagate Buddhism in China. It must be confessed that when the news of the demands was generally printed in March 1915, a rather painful impression was created, especially in the United States. But, before describing the sequel, it is important to remember certain essential facts that Okuma was finding it necessary to secure support for his rather heterogeneous combination of parties against the Seiyukai by the presentation of a strong policy is obvious. In this, he felt justified in overlooking no point which might serve to place Japan on a footing of equality in all respects with Western countries. Hence, his request for concessions in the matter of advisors and religious propaganda similar to those which had been won by the Western powers. We must also in this connection allow for the Oriental spirit of bargaining, which always asks for more than it expects to receive eventually. As Professor Payson Treat puts it, the treaties which finally resulted contained very great modifications in the terms and included practically nothing which China was not prepared to yield at the very beginning of the long discussion. Okuma was therefore justified in giving out that the negotiations between us and China were nearing a satisfactory conclusion. As to the exacerbation of feeling in the United States, there is little doubt that much was due to deliberate attempts to sow discord between Japan and her European allies, and that much criticism was in ignorance of the facts since revealed by the correspondence published in the reports of the American Foreign Office. Professor Treat points out that it was in connection with the desire of the United States to secure a coaling station at Samsa Inlet, north of Fuchao, a point as strategically dangerous to Japan as a Japanese coaling station would be in the Bermudas, that Group 4 was pressed upon China. We also learned, adds Dr. Treat, that is, by the publication of the American reports, that the American Department of State after a careful scrutiny of the Japanese demands, and in the light of information received from our representatives in Peking and Tokyo, informed Japan that in respect to 16 of the demands, 
it was not disposed to raise any question. These included the demands regarding Shangtang province, for which Japan was so roundly denounced in the United States four years later, and regarding South Manchuria and Eastern Inner Mongolia. Only five of the demands seemed objectionable to our State Department, two of these on the ground that they would be a violation of the principle of the open door, and three because they were clearly derogatory to the political independence and administrative entity of that country. Japan acceded to our suggestions in every case. Four of the demands were dropped, and the fifth was changed to an exchange of notes which, following our suggestion, stated that China would not permit any power to construct a dockyard, a coaling station for military use, or a naval base, or to set up any other military establishment on the coast of Fukien province. Nor shall they allow any like establishment to be set up with any foreign capital on the said coast. In other words, there was absolutely nothing in the Sino-Japanese treaties of 1915 to which the American government had taken the slightest offense. To go back a little, after the statement by Okuma that the uneasiness and suspicion in the United States in connection with Japanese negotiations at Peking are based on misunderstanding and misinformation scattered broadcast by interested mischief-makers. Group 5 was withdrawn. It was announced that these particular demands were not intended to be enforced at the present time, but were only presented as principles which it was considered well that China should endorse. In a revised form, the demands were presented again on April 26, and, upon China replying with further protest, an ultimatum was dispatched on May 7th by Japan, which on the following day was accepted. China, however, continued to show her dissatisfaction by a boycott of Japanese goods and by the raising of a fund known as the National Salvation Fund. Years afterwards, even when the Treaty of 1915 was to the world outside of China of little more than historical interest, the ideographs for Remember the National Shame continued to deface the walls and temples of China. The world at large was content for the time to rest satisfied with the solution reached, whatever might be the discontent with the past or suspicion as to the future. It had perforce to be recognized that Japan was left secure in her claim to be the dominating power of the Far East. She had won this position by her valor, her diplomacy, and her readiness to rise at critical moments to the magnitude of her responsibilities. As setting a seal to the fact we have just mentioned, it is important to remember the agreement reached at Washington on November 2, 1917, between the governments of Japan and the United States, as represented by Viscount Ishii and Mr. Robert Lansing, respectively. The substance of the agreement was not so much in any new department as in the expression of mutual understanding of the principles governing the two governments in relation to China. Mr. Lansing explicitly recognizes that Japan has special interests in China, particularly in the part to which her possessions are contiguous. After stating that there had been unquestionably growing up between the people of the two continents, a feeling of suspicion as to the motives inducing the activities of the other in the Far East, Mr. Lansing affirms that the visit of Viscount Ishii has changed all this, has swept away the work of mischievous propaganda, and created an atmosphere of trust and confidence. On the first day of December 1917, President Wilson addressed to the Emperor a fitting answer to Yoshihito's own cordial message in which it was stated that the result of his, Viscount Ishii's, visit will be as happy and as permanent as the enduring friendship of the peoples of the United States and Japan. It will be remembered that, soon after, several distorted versions of the agreement appeared. It was asserted that Mr. Lansing had been hoodwinked, especially as he was ignorant at the time of Allied commitments to Japan. 
Before the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations in 1919, Mr. Lansing stated that the phrase as to Japan's special relation to China through territorial propinquity was inserted by Ishii's own suggestion. But, in a letter from Mr. Bryan to the Japanese ambassador of March 13, 1915, two years before the agreement in question, the then Secretary of State wrote as follows, the United States frankly recognizes that territorial contiguity creates special relations between Japan and these districts, that is, Shangtung, South Manchuria, and East Mongolia. There was nothing whatever in the statement which was foreign to the claims of Japan or dangerous to the interests of the United States. In comparison with the literature poured forth from the press dealing with the World War as it affected France, Flanders, Great Britain, or Italy, there has been little written to tell of Japan's share in the great conflict. Of course, in the actual amount of fighting and in the loss of blood and treasure, Japan's part was comparatively insignificant. Yet it would be misleading to judge of Japan's value to the alliance by this standard. At the very least, the power and prestige of the Japanese fleet set free the navies of Great Britain and, later, of the United States, for service in the Atlantic and the North Sea. In addition, there was the capture, already alluded to, of Germany's base in the Pacific, Tsingtao, and, with the cooperation of Australia and New Zealand, of the enemy's insular possessions. That Japan was able to clear the Pacific of hostile warships and commerce raiders, to force Bonsby's fleet from the Pacific to the Atlantic, where it met its doom, to help the convoying of large forces of Anzacs to Egypt and the Dardanelles, to head off German schemes for promoting uprisings in China and Manchuria, to protect the Siberian Railway, to furnish at a critical time arms and ammunition to Russia, and to assist materially the suppression of the submarine menace in the Mediterranean, not to mention the services of the 500 Japanese volunteers from the Pacific coast who fought in the Canadian and American armies, is eloquent testimony to the loyalty and efficiency of the support rendered in the Allied cause. The steady adhesion of Japan to the great cause, in spite of whatever temptation to the contrary, in spite even of anti-British propaganda prior to the entrance of America, made Asia safe and greatly lessened the anxiety of those nations which were called upon to bear the brunt of the conflict in the West. Mr. Wilson's famous assertion that the war was meant to make the world safe for democracy had its echoes in many different directions. These were clearly audible in Japan, as elsewhere. Dr. Jenks states that as early as 1900, Prince Ito's trusted lieutenants foresaw the steps by which the Japanese government was to move away from the German ideals, which had once been entertained, to something like the system of party responsibility prevailing in Great Britain. The formation of the Seiyukai was an indication of this, while the career of men like Mr. Yukio Ozaki, the leader of a more extreme liberal party, is striking witness to the growing desire for fuller democratization of the nation, without thereby weakening the thread of loyalty to the throne which runs through the entire fabric of Japanese history. The wonderful industrial development made possible by the World War had the immediate result of increasing the wealth of Japan beyond all precedent. Whereas before this there had been annual additions to the national debt approximating $90 million, the government was now able to redeem many of its foreign loans and increase its gold reserve to the amount of a billion dollars. But there was a bad side to it all, for while the profiteers, or narikin, literally become gold, rioted in luxury and extravagance, others began to feel the increased cost of living, and to breathe a spirit of discontent with the atmosphere of democracy. In consequence, strikes began once more to be common. The labor movement, it should be remembered, inaugurated by socialists of the type of Katayama about 1897, 
had been suppressed by the application of Article 17 of the Public Order Police Law of 1900, with the result that trade unions were practically unknown again till 1916. But in 1917, there were 417 strikes, affecting over 60,000 workers, and a year later, in spite of better times, there were 497. In August of 1918 occurred the Rice Riots of Kobe, which led to the downfall of the Terauchi Ministry. There was quite a popular demand for a new government, more in sympathy with popular aspirations, and the first commoner to head a Japanese ministry was found in the person of Mr. Takashi Hara, leader of the Seiyukai, in secession to Sayonji. Mr. Hara was not a graduate of any university, but had had long experience of political life. He was, for some years, Ito's right-hand man, and had served his country as counsel in Tianjin, charge des affairs at Paris, vice minister of commerce, minister in Korea, and minister for home affairs before taking the premiership. Political and social progress was now the order of the day, and a perfect furor for democracy took the place of the earlier militarism. Some of the movements now presented were, of course, of earlier origin and inspiration. The Yuan Kai, Laborers' Friendly Association, was founded in 1912 by a young Christian lawyer, Bunji Suzuki. The factory law, forbidding the employment of children under 12, except for light work and with special permission, also the employment of children and women for more than 12 hours a day, and providing for at least 30 minutes rest within the first six hours of work, had been passed in 1911, but had been put in force, and even then with some reservations, only in 1916. But now welfare work of the most various kinds began to be popular, and attention was drawn to industrial conditions in the factories and mines demanding sympathy and reform. A good illustration of the quickening of conscience in social matters is to be found in the career of Mr. Toyohiko Kagawa of Kobe, whose remarkable work, Crossing the Death Line, has gone through over 300 editions. The Saint of the Shinkawa Slums is a Japanese Saint Francis of Assisi who has lived literally the Sermon on the Mount, passing through a period of temptation and mental struggle into a life of consecrated service for his fellow men. The authorities at first considered him a dangerous radical, but are at last waking up to the fact that he represents one of the strongest conservative forces among laborers in Japan. The completion in 1918 of 50 years since the return of the sun goddess from her cavern of seclusion may afford us a good opportunity for the briefest possible summary of conditions in Japan as they were at the point to which we have now come. Politically, Japan was in 1918 still in the age of experiment, though not a few steps had been made with brilliant success. That the constitution had always worked well not even its warmest friends would have admitted, but it was gradually becoming more and more efficient. There was less need, as the years went on, for that rapidly diminishing body of the elder statesmen, the Genro, who had rendered such great service in Meiji. The cry was now for Ninsei, Ninken, and Jiyu, that is, popular government, popular rights, and liberty. And, with it all, there was the recognition of the nation's ability to continue without a break the eager quest for democratic forms of government in harmony with the age-long devotion to the throne and its august occupant. Quoting a stanza written by the late Empress Dowager to the effect that, However shallow the mountain rivulet, if dammed up it will overflow, so will it happen with the sentiments of the people. Mr. Ozaki about this time affirmed that the future of Japan would not belie the fundamental secret of government which guides and acts upon the popular sentiment. Materially, the progress of Japan up to this point was without precedent. The area of the empire had increased from 144,000 square miles 
to 257,673. The population, roughly estimated in 1868 at 30 million, was, at the close of 1916, 77,289,494, with an average yearly increase of some 600,000. The revenue of the empire from 1872 to 1917 had increased from 58 to 714 million yen, drawn in large part from the taxes on land, income, liquors, and customs duties. Foreign trade had increased by leaps and bounds, and the shipping, which in 1868 was a negative quantity, amounted in 1893 to 15,000 tons, and before the end of the Great War, to over 2 million tons with great companies like Nippon Yusen Kaisha, Tokyo Kisen Kaisha, and Osaka Shosen Kaisha, sending out their vessels to the ends of the earth. Railways, which were inaugurated in 1872 by the opening of a line 18 miles in length, now extended over 7,000 miles, of which 6,000 were the property of the state. Mining had become increasingly important, both in Japan proper and in Korea, with copper and coal the chief products, and iron, petroleum, gold, and silver in respective amounts. The fisheries were providing the food supply of a large part of the nation and occupation for nearly two million people. Agriculture was still supporting three-fifths of the population, with 300 million bushels of rice produced annually, and wheat, rye, barley, millet, potatoes, soybeans, and other crops in proportion. Manufacturers had made enormous strides. At the close of 1915, there were nearly 17,000 factories, producing textiles, machinery, chemicals, foodstuffs, and miscellaneous goods. About 1,500,000 families were keeping up the reputation of Japan for sericulture. The telegraph system included 5,000 offices and over 100,000 miles of wire, with telephone stations practically everywhere. The postal system had over 7,000 offices in the empire, and at Tokyo there were 12 daily deliveries of mail. In her dependencies, Japan had made notable advance. Twenty years' rule in Taiwan had subjugated the headhunters, established drains, sewers, and a water system in the capital, built 4,000 miles of roads and many miles of light railways, made extensive harbor works, established trade in tea, salt, rice, sugar, and camphor, and in short, turned a liability into a flourishing asset. In Korea, progress had been slower, but over 1,000 miles of railway had been opened by the end of 1917, and many important reforms carried out. Intellectually, development kept pace well with the economic advance. Elementary, secondary, university, and technical education had played a great part in training young Japan for her enhanced share in international life. There were four imperial universities, with 10,000 students, and 25,000 schools attended by 8,250,000 pupils. In 1906, 98% of the boys and 95% of the girls were in actual attendance. The private universities and missionary schools were also contributing their part, and educational authorities were keenly alert to make reforms when discovered and needed. In literature, Japan had passed with a swing of a pendulum, from the craze for Western books to a reaction in favor of Japanese literature, and again to a more synthetic and balanced use of things both native and foreign. The native schools of philosophy and fiction were jostling the devotees of Nietzsche and Tolstoy, and revival of the no drama was at rivalry with enthusiasm for the Irish drama. Attempts had been made to amalgamate the written and spoken languages and to supersede the kana with romaji. But so far, while foreign textbooks were commonly used in the schools, 
the Japanese language and script continued to hold their own. Foreign wars had brought about an immense advance in journalism. Periodicals on every conceivable subject abounded. In 1914, there were registered 2,719 periodicals, of which 861 were newspapers. Several years later, there were six newspapers in Tokyo and Osaka, each with a daily circulation of 200,000 copies or over, while other influential journals were printed in English. In art, though the bad taste of foreigners often placed a premium on inferior work, the encouragement given by the government to painting and sculpture, the publication of copies of old masterpieces, the establishment of institutions such as the Tokyo Art School, the personal efforts of teachers like Okakura Kakuzo, and, above all, the innate artistic sense of the Japanese people, have kept things along the right path. In religion, there was, of course, much that was chaotic. Shinto had become, for many, a political philosophy rather than a religion, with its traditional ritual on important national occasions. But there was, nevertheless, a religious Shinto which should not be overlooked. Thirteen Shinto sects were officially recognized, with 14,000 priests and 120,000 shrines. Buddhism was marked by many serious attempts at reform, but had on the whole lost ground. There were 12 recognized Buddhist sects, with 50,000 priests and 70,000 temples. The ethics of Confucius had considerable vogue, but many of the younger men felt that Confucianism was out of harmony with Western civilization. Christianity had grown steadily, and probably at this time, including all church bodies, numbered close to 200,000 professed believers. Okuma, in 1909, summed up the religious condition as follows. Japan at present may be likened to a sea into which a hundred currents of oriental and occidental thought have poured, and, not having yet effected a fusion, are raging wildly, tossing, warring, and roaring. The old religions and old morals are steadily losing their hold, and nothing has yet arisen to take their place. A portion of our people go neither by the old code of ethics and etiquette, nor by those of modern days, while they are also disinclined to conform to those of foreign countries, and such persons convey the impression of neither possessing nor being governed by any ideas about morality, public or private. That the situation was not without its anxieties is shown by the convoking of a tri-religion conference in March 1912 by the then Vice Minister of Home Affairs, when 50 Shinto, Buddhist, and Christian representatives assembled to discuss how they might best meet the spiritual needs of the nation. That such anxiety existed was proof positive that those responsible for the moral welfare of the nation were not asleep at their posts. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29 of an Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elsie Selwyn. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowen. Chapter 29 Aftermaths of the Great War after the collapse of the Russian imperial government and the freeing of the Austro-German prisoners who had hitherto been held in large numbers, the question arose as to the best means of assisting the contingent of Czechoslovaks who were desirous of joining the Allied forces on the Western Front. It was obvious that the easiest route for these to take was by way of Siberia, but it was also obvious that some Allied assistance was required to enable them to escape from the Bolshevist force in control of the territory. At the invitation of the Allied board following, however, upon a Japanese suggestion, Japan sent an expedition with this object 
and with similarly invited contingents of British, American, French, Chinese, and Italian troops. The whole force was placed under the Japanese General Otani as the ranking officer, and although the cooperation between the elements of so mixed an army was not without its weakness, the ability of the commanding officer was generally conceded. The result was a successful penetration of Asia from Vladivostok to the trans baikal provinces, the protection of the railway lines, and the relief of the Czechoslovakian forces. When the war came to an end, the Allied troops were gradually withdrawn, first the English and French, and then the Italian and Chinese. In January 1920, the United States also ordered the withdrawal of its soldiers, leaving the Japanese alone to guard the railways and complete the transportation of the refugees. When this had been achieved, Japan also left the trans baikal and the Amur provinces. Siberia could not be evacuated so easily for an obvious reason. There were many thousands of Japanese doing business in Siberia who could not be left to the mercy of the Bolshevists. As it was, in the March of 1920, a terrible massacre of Japanese took place at Nikolaevsk, for which satisfaction was not given by Russia until the signing of the Treaty of 1925. The number of Japanese murdered has been estimated as from 350 to 700, and included the Japanese consul Ishida with his whole family. It was this massacre, perpetrated by a guerrilla band of Bolshevists known as the Partisans, together with the menacing situation on the Korean frontier, which justified delay in the Japanese departure from the Maritime Province in North Manchuria until October 1922. It had proved for Japan a sufficiently costly expedition, with little or no compensating features. Eleven divisions of troops had been sent, and of these, 1,475 officers and men were killed and about 10,000 wounded. The total cost was not less than $700 million. Northern Sakhalin was not evacuated till after Japan's treaty with Russia in 1925. It should be added that the joint efforts of Japan and China for the heading off of the Bolshevist terror brought about the Sino-Japanese Agreement of March 1918, which a little later was the cause of no little agitation among the Chinese Nationalist Party. Footnote. The Sino-Japanese Agreement of March 1918 was avowedly made, quote, in view of the daily increasing strength of the enemy within the borders of Russia the result of which cannot help but be a menace to the peace and tranquility of the entire Far East. End quote. It counted upon joint military and naval action and preparation towards that end. The full text of this agreement is given by Putnam Wheel, The Truth About China and Japan, page 160. It may be explained that the Anfu Club, representing the provinces of Anhui and Fukien, designates the Chinese political party supposedly in sympathy with Japan and the Japanese imperialistic aims. See H. H. Gowan and J. W. Hall in Outline History of Japan, page 472. End footnote. The borrowings by Tuan Chi Wei and his associates from Japan at this juncture made the name of the Anfu Club a red rag to the Chinese patriots. In consequence, Japan decided in March 1919 to lend no more money to China and the Pact of 1918 was eventually, in January 1921, annulled. Meanwhile, Sino-Japanese affairs were being hotly debated in the press of the United States and under cover of the Peace Conference at Versailles. In the conference held at Versailles in 1919 for the settlement of peace terms following the Great War, Japan naturally played a leading role. She was represented by several of her leading statesmen, Marquis, afterwards Prince Sayonji, Baron, afterwards Viscount Makino, Viscount, afterwards Count Chinda, Mr., afterwards Baron Matsui, and Mr., afterwards Baron K. Ijuin. There were two questions deeply interesting to Japan in the interest of that new world which it was hoped the conference was about to usher in. First was the Japanese proposal introduced and ably argued by Baron Makino that, quote, the equality of nations being a basic principle of the League of Nations, the high contracting powers agree to accord as soon as possible to all alien nationals of the states members of the League equal and just treatment in every respect, making no distinction either in law or in fact on account of their race or nationality, end quote. 
This was ultimately withdrawn in face of the determined opposition of the United States and the overseas dominions of Great Britain, though 11 votes out of 17 were cast in favor of the proposal. Secondly, there was the distribution of the captured German possessions in the Pacific. The United States did not like the increase of Japanese influence in the Pacific, and Mr. Wilson proposed the administration of all the groups by Australia. But in view of the Anglo-Japanese alliance and the actual contribution of Japan to the war, Great Britain could not disallow the claims of the island empire, so Japan was awarded under a mandate issued on May 7, 1919, the islands north of the equator, including the Caroline, Pelu, Ladrun, and Marshall groups, and the island of Yap. All islands south of the equator were given to New Zealand and Australia. Now arose the thorny question of the disposal of the German leases at Tsingtao, before putting in her claim to the reversion of these leases, Japan had endeavored to settle the matter directly with China, even as she had earlier announced her intention to do. But the Chinese delegates refused, being plainly afraid of the complacency of the Peking government. Mr. Wellington Ku made an able presentation of the Chinese case, and Baron Makino replied, using the notes of the secret Matono Twin agreement between China and Japan in 1915. The Chinese, who regarded Prime Minister Twen as Japan's tool, were immovable and appealed for a decision. Then President Wilson, who was personally favorable to the Chinese side of the contention, allowed his fears for the safety of the League of Nations to affect his action. France and Great Britain had been so far committed to the side of Japan by arrangements made prior to the entry of America into the war that their attitude was a foregone conclusion. So when the conference reconvened in April, Mr. Wilson, who had already had to oppose Japan in the matter of racial equality, and was afraid a further rebuff might send her away from the conference altogether, aided in the rejection of China's plea. He was probably convinced that the matter could be disposed of by the League of Nations, if not by direct negotiations between China and Japan. It was clear that the action taken at Versailles was not the last word on the subject. American opinion ran strongly in favor of China, though it is a little difficult to separate what was sincerely pro-Chinese from what was partisan hostility, now beginning to show itself in the American Senate, against President Wilson and the League of Nations. The repercussion of Mr. Wilson's famous declaration as to the rights of self-determination was felt all the way from Ireland to Eastern Asia. Korea felt the full force of the new aspiration, especially as the spread of the new doctrine coincided with the harsh and militaristic administration of Governor General Count Hasegawa. After 150,000 Koreans had fled from this regime into Manchuria, and those who were left began bitterly to complain of taxation without representation, the gagging of the press, discrimination in education in favor of Japanese, rudeness on the part of officials, and so on. So came about the remarkable Passive Revolution of 1919. The immediate occasion was the funeral of the old ex-emperor. While the Korean population of the capital were crying their manse, banzai, in the funeral procession, their leaders appeared before the officials, showed a declaration of independence which they had signed, and offered themselves for prison. The authorities were taken so much by surprise that they acted vigorously rather than wisely. Probably the fault lay rather with the gendarmerie than with the regular soldiers, but a period of suppression was inaugurated in which the stupidity, as well as the harshness of the officials, was strongly in evidence. Disturbances broke out in a 618 places, and for 60 days the rioters, numbering half a million, kept up their demonstrations. The reports of the slain during the period of suppression vary all the way from 1,000 to 50,000, with the probability rather in favor of the smaller figure. The news broadcast through the world with regard to this reign of terror created everywhere a painful impression and did not add to the popularity of Japan in the United States. But a mistaken policy was soon corrected by the resignation of the unpopular General Hasegawa and the appointment of a singularly able and humane statesman, Baron Makoto Saito. An imperial rescript was promulgated in August 1919 in which it was stated Quote, we are persuaded that the state of development at which the general situation has now arrived calls for certain reforms in the administrative organization of the government general of Korea, and we issue our imperial command that such reforms be put into operation. End quote. 
These reforms, briefly stated, were as follows. 1. The replacement of the former military government with a civil government, making the governor generalship open to a civil official. 2. Replacement of the gendarmerie system with an ordinary police system. 3. Establishment of non-discrimination between Japanese and Koreans. 4. Establishment of a cultural policy with a view to raising the Korean people to the same standard as the Japanese. Since the initiation of these reforms, much has been done to reconcile Koreans to their position in the empire, and the situation has immensely improved from what it was before the arrival of Governor General Saito. A word should be said with regard to the part played by Christians and Christian missionaries in the revolutionary propaganda. Undoubtedly, there were Christians, as well as believers, in a new Korean religion entitled Tendokyo, who sympathized with the anti-Japanese propaganda. This is also true of a certain number of missionaries, but it is quite untrue to say that any considerable number of these were concerned in anything treasonable. Mr. Kiyoshi Nakari of the Educational Affairs Bureau of Chosen declares, quote, an accusation has been directed against the Japanese government charging that it persecuted Korean Christians and was endeavoring to hinder Christian work in Chosen. While this accusation is wholly baseless, it is equally wrong to regard the foreign missionaries as a body as inimically disposed toward the government. End quote. Distinct progress has been made since the uprising in obtaining a good understanding with the foreign missionaries in revision of the regulations concerning religious propaganda in missionary schools and in giving permission for religious bodies to become juridical persons. The feeling on the Pacific coast against the Japanese, which had been lulled during the Great War, began from 1919 onward to show a rather violent recrudescence. Some of it was due to skillful propaganda on the part of China to secure the retrocession of the German leashes in Shantung without the necessity of direct dealings between the two Oriental powers. Few people in the United States realized that the occupied territory was only 250 square miles out of the 55,970 of the whole province, or that only 21,000 Chinese out of 25 million lived within the area. Yet the feverish indignation of all China, North and South, and the vigor with which the boycott of Japanese goods was carried out did much to affect American opinion. But most of the anti-Japanese feeling in the United States was produced by fears of Japanese dominance on the Pacific coast. There was no serious charge that Japan had failed to keep both the letter and the spirit of the gentleman's agreement. Still, the introduction of picture brides for the eligible Japanese bachelors in America and the high birth rate of the first generation of Japanese immigrants created a great scare which was fanned into flame by the alarmists. The stopping of the picture bride marriages in the spring of 1920 did little to allay this fear. It was feared that the Japanese farmers, who had been singularly successful in reclaiming and making profitable much of the wasteland of California, would eventually drive out the white settlers. Although Japanese immigrants, as ineligible to citizenship, could not purchase land in their own name, Japanese could lease land for periods of three years, could buy land in the name of their American-born children, or could form corporations in which Americans were financially interested. To counteract all this, the Oriental Exclusion League was formed, and an initiative act known as the Alien Land Act was placed on the ballot of 1920 in the state of California. This act prohibited land ownership by Japanese, the leasing of agricultural lands by Japanese, the owning of land by companies or corporations in which Japanese were interested, and the owning of land by Japanese children born in the United States, unless they were removed from the guardianship of their parents. The measure was carried in November 1920 by a vote of 668,483 to 202,086, a three-to-one vote but the victory of a minority of the registered voters. The act, thus depriving Japanese of the guardianship of their own children in respect to real property, came into force on December 9th. The matter was discussed at Washington by the Japanese ambassador, Baron Shidehara, and the American ambassador to Tokyo, Mr. R.S. Morris, then home on leave, but the agreement to which they themselves came as to the necessity of a new treaty led to no result. The mania of anti-Japanese legislation spread from California to other states. 
Bills similar to the Californian were passed during 1921 by Washington, Colorado, Nebraska, Arizona, Oregon, and Texas. While the excitement was spreading over the 110,000 Japanese men, women, and children in the United States, certain questions of interest had arisen of more immediately domestic concern. Dissatisfaction with the Reform Bill of 1918, whereby the electorate had been increased from 1,450,000 to about 3 million, had produced a perfect clamor for manhood suffrage, and a bill in this interest had been introduced into the Diet in February 1920. But the government considered the time unripe for so radical a departure, and the Diet was dissolved. The general election, which followed on May 10th, gave the government a stronger position since the Seiyukai party, of which Mr. Hara was the head, had 280 members, returned to the 110 who represented the next largest group, the Kenseikai. This result led to the temporary shelving of the demand for manhood suffrage. In the matter of an international loan for rehabilitating the affairs of China, President Wilson had by 1918 changed his mind. Acting on Mr. Reinsch's promise to China when that power entered the war, Mr. Wilson now supported the proposal of a four-power loan put forth by the banking interests of Great Britain, France, Japan, and the United States. Japan hesitated at first and stood out for certain reservations in respect to Manchuria and Mongolia, which seemed to revive the old sphere of influence doctrine but on the assurance that the object of the loan was entirely economic and free from all political character, the reservations were withdrawn. The agreement was signed on October 15, 1920, but has since remained practically a dead letter for reasons which belong to the history of China. Meanwhile, both in Japan and outside, some concern was being felt with regard to the future of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Footnote. The Anglo-Japanese Alliance of 1902 had been renewed first in September 1905, with an alteration of the language to allow for the changed relations of Korea to Japan, and again in July 1911. In this last treaty, the important clause is Article 4, intended to head off any inference that, by the terms of the alliance, Great Britain might be called upon to assist Japan in a war against the United States. The language of the article is as follows. Quote, should either of the high contracting parties conclude a treaty of general arbitration with a third power, it is agreed that nothing in this agreement shall impose upon such contracting party an obligation to go to war with the power with whom such arbitration treaty is in force. End quote. End footnote. Many felt that it had served its purpose and was no longer necessary, while opinion in the United States feared lest its terms necessitated in any conflict with Japan the hostile action of her ally. As the end of the ten-year period for which the alliance had been made was due in July 1921, much argument was waged to and fro over whether renewal or denunciation of the alliance were the better course. The matter was discussed at the British Imperial Conference in June 1921, and it was then decided to let the alliance run on beyond July without taking any action whatsoever. But, as we shall see a little later, the making of the Four Power Treaty at the Washington Conference in December 1921 was only possible after the supersession of the alliance. A matter which interested Japan not a little at this time was the visit of the Crown Prince Hirohito to Europe, it was something entirely without precedent in all of the 2,500 years of Japanese history, and many were the hopes and fears and prayers which were wafted along with the prince when, in March 1921, he left the empire accompanied by Prince Kanin and Count Chinda. The Katori, on which the prince sailed, visited Hong Kong, Singapore, Bombay, Port Said, Malta, and Portsmouth, and England, France, Belgium, Holland, and Italy were the European countries which did their best to welcome their unique visitor. A return was made in September, setting at rest all the solicitude which had been felt. Two months later, owing to the continued ill health of the emperor, who was now quite unable to pay the necessary attention to state business, the crown prince was made regent of the empire. For some time it had been felt in the United States that misunderstandings between the Republic and Japan were rapidly bringing the two nations within measurable distance of a terrible and wholly unnecessary war. 
It was in view of this hideous possibility that on the accession to power of President Harding, steps were taken through his Secretary of State, Mr. Charles E. Hughes, to stay the rivalry of the powers in the matter of naval building programs, and to make some specific agreements in the interest of the peace of the Pacific. Japan was approached informally on the subject in July 1921, and gave ready assent to the holding of a conference with this object in mind. The delegates from the empire consisted of Admiral Tomosaburo Kaito, Prince Ayasato Tokugawa, and Mr. Masanao Hanihara, and their appointment was one of the last acts of the premier Mr. Takahashi Hara, who was assassinated by a misguided youth on November 4th. The Washington Conference opened in November 1921 and was attended by representatives of Great Britain, France, Italy, Holland, Belgium, Portugal, China, Japan, and the United States. Officially, the meeting was called to discuss the limitation of naval armaments, but it was understood that Pacific problems and problems of the Far East generally would be taken up. The conference was of vital interest to Japan almost throughout. First, on November 12th came the startling presentation of Mr. Hughes's plan for the reduction of the naval power of Great Britain, the United States, and Japan by the scrapping of enough capital ships to make the ratio of naval strength as 553. Time was needed for the consideration of so unexpected a proposal, especially by Japan, since the assassination of Premier Hara had done much to disarrange the political alignment. Public opinion also had to be taken into consideration, but... When it was learned that the United States would discontinue work on the fortification of Guam and the Philippines, the acceptance was hearty and accompanied by a good deal of relief. It was no longer thinkable that the United States and Japan would fight, since neither navy was formidable enough to be dangerous on the opposite sides of the Pacific. The next question to come up was that of a treaty on Pacific subjects such as might render obsolete the Anglo-Japanese alliance. This so-called Nine Power Treaty provided in a comprehensive way that respect should be ensured to the sovereignty, independence, and the territorial and administrative integrity of China. It offered, quote, the fullest and most unembarrassed opportunity to China to develop and maintain for herself an effective and stable government, end quote. It promised the influence of the powers, quote, for the purpose of effectually establishing and maintaining the principle of equal opportunity for the commerce and industry of all nations throughout the territory of China, end quote. It promised also, quote, to refrain from taking advantage of conditions in China in order to seek special rights or privileges which would abridge the rights of subjects or citizens of friendly states and from countenancing action inimical to the security of such states, end quote. There were other provisions along the same line, and if China has not benefited by them as much as was anticipated, the reason is partly that she has not made easy the task of helping her, and partly because it is exceedingly difficult for nine powers to agree upon any common line of action in an emergency. Outside the official program of the conference, but nevertheless of the first importance, was the settlement of the Shantung Difficulty. This was largely due to the willingness of Mr. Hughes and Mr. afterwards Lord Balfour to sit in with the Chinese and Japanese delegates for the purpose of assisting in arrangement of the much vexed question. Japan had announced her readiness to return the least territory to China, asking only the opening of the same to foreign trade. She had not even requested the establishment of an international settlement at Tsingtao, she was also ready to permit the consortium to apply to the three new railway lines already begun in the province, and to turn over the Tsingtao customs as an integral part of the maritime customs organization. She also promised, as soon as China was able to take over the policing, to withdraw the soldiers guarding the Tsinan Railway, and to restore whatever property in the territory had been used for administrative purposes. The principal hitch was over the disposal of the Kiao Chao Tsinan Railway, 250 miles in length. It had been exceedingly profitable under Japanese administration, and Japan did not want to transfer it to the absolute ownership of the Chinese without some guarantee as to efficient management. For China to buy the line and pay cash for it would only mean the mortgaging of the property to foreign financiers in return for a loan, in which case the interest of Japan would be simply transferred to some other nation. The matter was at last settled by China's undertaking to buy the railway from Japan on the security of treasury notes running for 15 years, but redeemable at China's option after five. 
Till the redemption of the notes, Japan was to appoint the traffic manager. Another Japanese was to be chief accountant, with a Chinese chief accountant possessing coordinate powers. These officials were to be under the direction and control of the Chinese managing director and removable for cause. The treaty embodying all these agreements was signed on February 1, 1922, amid the hearty felicitations of all present at the conference. One or two other matters taken up at the Washington conference, particularly affecting Japan, may be mentioned. Among the uninvited delegates to the conference were representatives from the Far Eastern Republic having its headquarters at Chita. These had come to complain of the Japanese occupation of portions of Siberia and the northern part of Sakhalin. The conference disposed of the matter by accepting the assurance that no exclusive exploitation of the resources of these territories was in contemplation and that the occupying troops would be withdrawn at the earliest possible moment. Of particular interest to the United States was the reference in the Treaty of February 11, 1922, to that hitherto unconsidered trifle of an island yap. While the mandate awarding the former German possessions in the Pacific north of the equator to Japan was accepted, it was required that Japan should respect existing treaties with regard to the islands between the United States and Japan. It was specially provided that the United States should have free access to the island of Yap and all that related to the landing and operating of the Yap-Guam cable, or any cable which might hereafter be laid or operated by the United States connecting with the island of Yap. On the whole, Japan was well satisfied with the results of the Washington Conference. She felt at ease with regard to possible aggressive policies on the part of other nations in China. She felt free from suspicion with regard to designs upon the Philippines, which, as a matter of fact, she could have bought for a comparatively small sum years before the American occupation, and she felt relieved from the heavy strain of naval competition with the United States. If all was not accomplished by the conference, which was expected in the first flush of enthusiasm, still enough was achieved to make men grateful for the initiative of Mr. Harding and the cordial cooperation of the Pacific powers. End of chapter 29. Read by Elsie Selwyn. Chapter 30 of An Outline History of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elsie Selwyn. An Outline History of Japan by Herbert Henry Gowan. Chapter 30. The Great Earthquake and After. The year 1923 opened quite hopefully in Japan. Mourned by the empire, which remembered all the vast services which they had rendered from the earliest days of Meiji, two great statesmen, almost the last of the Genro, passed away in 1922. These were Okuma, whose memory is enshrined in the university of his founding, Waseda, and Yamagata, whose services in war and peace outweighed in the minds of his countrymen the general conservatism of his mental outlook. But... Great as were these losses, the majority of men in Japan were now looking forward rather than backward. One of the strongest desires of the government, for example, was to re-establish harmonious relations with Russia, China, and the United States. In the case of China, considerable progress was made. In the handing over of the Tsenan Railway on January 1, 1923, was the happy termination of a long-endured and thorny controversy. Japan was permitted by her arrangement with China to renew for 30 years leases in Shantung, which had been made prior to the ratification of the treaty, and she was also allowed to purchase salt to a large amount from the salt works of Tsingtao for a period of 15 years. With Russia negotiations for the settlement of the troublesome questions connected with the occupation of Sakhalin, the Nikolaevsk massacre, and Imperial Russia's debt to Japan were not so satisfactorily proceeded with. Conferences were attempted at Dairen, Chanchung, and Tokyo. Japan offered to purchase northern Sakhalin for 150 million yen and to be content with an apology for the affair at Nikolaevsk. But Russia proved obstructive and absolutely declined to recognize the debts of the imperial government. On August 24th occurred the death of the premier, 
Admiral Tomasa Burro Cato, and this carried with it the resignation of the cabinet. Four days later, Admiral Count Gombe Yamamoto was sent for to form the new administration. Yamamoto was one of the pioneer graduates of the Naval Academy in 1877 and had had much experience abroad in the United States and in Germany. He was not new to the premiership having formed his first cabinet in 1913, but this time he came into power at a crisis of wholly unlooked-for disaster, for it was by candlelight and amid the terrors of the great earthquake of September 1st, 1923, that the new ministry assumed the seals of office. Practically without warning, about a minute before noon on Saturday, September 1st, came the great shock, which in so brief a space of time overwhelmed the densely populated cities of Tokyo, Yokohama, Yokosuka, Odawara, and many others in the provinces of Sagami, Musashi, Awa, the north coast of Izu, and the west coast of Kazusa. Within this area, hardly a building was left undamaged, though the structures of reinforced concrete stood the shock fairly well. This world-shaking earthquake, that is, one recorded by the seismometers practically all over the world, was followed by a long train of aftershocks and by seismic waves such as that which destroyed a large part of Kamakura. But the most serious aftereffect of the earthquake was the fire which broke out independently in many centers, especially in Yokohama and Tokyo, and swept over vast areas of the cities affected. The disruption of the water pipes, of course, made it quite impossible to do much by way of checking the flames. One of the great tragedies of the whole catastrophe was due to fire, when over 40,000 people took refuge in the ground formerly occupied by the army clothing depot on the eastern bank of the river Sumida. Here, a furious tornado of flame approaching from three sides swept the area and left no trace of life behind. The losses through the combined effect of earthquake and fire are hard to estimate accurately. About 90,000 were killed in Tokyo and Yokohama, over 100,000 wounded, and over 40,000 were reported as missing. Many, of course, could not be identified, so it is probable that the total toll of human life will never be known. In material things, the loss was so prodigious as to be beyond accurate computation. It was estimated as all the way from 1 to 5 billion yen, but much perished on which no monetary value could be placed. Among the fatalities, all classes were represented. Princesses Yamashima and Kiroko and the young prince Moromasa were among the victims, and Professor Kuri Yagawa of Kyoto University perished at Kamakura, Viscountess Oshima at Odawara, Baron K. Matsuoka at Ninomiya. Indirectly, due to the earthquake, was the death of the last famous member of the older general, Marquis Matsukata, aged 92. The venerable statesman was buried in the ruins and rescued alive, only, however, to catch pneumonia and die of this and his injuries six months later. The brighter side of the great calamity appeared almost coincidentally with the disaster itself in the instant response of stunned Japan and the sympathetic outside world to the great need. The Yamamoto Ministry, hastily sworn in by the Crown Prince on the evening of September 2nd, at once took hold of the situation with effective vigor, aided by the Japanese Red Cross and other philanthropic bodies. To the relief fund, which was at once started, the emperor contributed 10 million yen and 30,360,000 yen was dispersed from the national treasury. Nor were outsiders slow to offer help. The foreign ships in the harbor of Yokohama and other ports did splendid service in taking off refugees and supplying first aid to many hundreds of sufferers. When the relief fund was finally closed, it was seen that out of the 61 million yen subscribed, 21 million yen was from foreign sources. Out of this sum, no less than 15 million yen was from the United States and its territories. The sympathy of the United States in this hour of terror and sorrow, and the magnificent service rendered by the American ambassador, Mr. Cyrus Woods, are things no Japanese is ever likely to forget. In the first alarm caused by the fire, the rumor prevailed that Koreans had been aiding the flames, and many innocent persons probably fell under the popular fury because of this belief. But the army acted promptly, 
and in a short time over a hundred thousand koreans and over forty four thousand chinese were collected and given shelter at the military barracks the army also aided wonderfully in the clearing away of collapsed buildings the building of public shelters and temporary hospitals the establishment of public dining rooms and such common necessities the ashes of the old tokyo were hardly cold before reconstruction was in the air with viscount shimpei goto mayor of the capital and minister for home affairs in the yamamoto cabinet and his element dr charles a beard formerly director of the new york bureau of municipal research had been invited to tokyo by mayor goto to make a general survey of the city dr beard's results were embodied in the interesting book the administration and politics of tokyo but the author told the present writer in tokyo a few months before the earthquake that he regretted it would be impossible to carry his plans into effect now however dr beard was immediately requested by cable to proceed to japan with a unique opportunity for reconstruction work on modern lines with two-thirds of the capital in ashes and with a man like goto who had done such notable work in the rebuilding of the capital of formosa at the head of the reconstruction board it certainly looked as if a chance had come such as seldom offers itself to the molding hand of man but money was scarce and the cry for business as usual insistent even within temporary quarters so it was soon perceived that reconstruction called for patience even more than for skill in city planning time was needed even to be sure as to which plan was wiser than any other there were some who considered that yokohama might well be allowed to revert to its former unimportance at the time of the first treaty some even advocated the removal of the capital to osaka or back to kyoto some again considered the possibility of so uniting yokohama and tokyo as to make one great port all private persons of course were anxious to rebuild their homes and businesses as speedily as possible in spite of the difficulties caused during the next few months by obstruction in the diet the fall of the yamamoto ministry at the end of nineteen twenty three and the similar fate of the kiyora ministry not long after and the transformation of the reconstruction board into a reconstruction bureau the progress made during the next nine months was almost phenomenal the bankers announced the worst of the financial crisis successfully weathered business recovered rapidly and firms began to find their way back to yokohama as well as to tokyo in the former city the breakwater was repaired and many of the old keys replaced more substantially than ever in tokyo the population showed a falling off of less than half a million and schools and parks homes and business blocks began rapidly to emerge from the ruins yet it had been conservatively estimated that all trace of the earthquake of nineteen twenty three will hardly be obliterated for twenty years on december twenty seventh nineteen twenty three a young fanatic d namba attempted the assassination of the prince regent while the latter was on his way to the imperial diet to open the forty eighth session of that assembly the prince was not injured but as deeming themselves in some way responsible premier yamamoto and his cabinet together with the metropolitan chief of police at once tendered their resignation viscount kiyora was sent for and by january seventh succeeded in getting together a cabinet which was popularly condemned as a cabinet of the privileged classes dr mizuno took the place of goto as home minister and so became responsible for the work of reconstruction to the kiyora cabinet fell the duty of carrying through the interrupted plans for the marriage of the prince regent the prince had been betrothed formally to princess nagoto kuni eldest daughter of prince kuni on january seventeenth nineteen eighteen the alliance was formally sanctioned by the emperor on june twenty sixth nineteen twenty two at which time the public announcement was made it was intended that the wedding should take place in the fall of nineteen twenty three but this plan was defeated by the occurrence of the earthquake soon after the beginning of nineteen twenty four announcement was made that the wedding would take place on january twenty sixth but the actual ceremonies extended from some days earlier when the prince regent visited the great shrines to make the proper announcements to the ancestors right on to june fifth when the wedding was celebrated by the citizens of tokyo in the presence of the royal couple sumptuous gifts were showered upon the prince and princess from all over the world as well as from various parts of the empire 
and married life began simply and auspiciously in the Akasaka Palace, originally built for the entertainment of state guests from foreign lands. A happy feature of the whole festivity was the exhibition of genuine affection for the prince and princess on the part of the populace. It was plain that royalty's new spirit of democracy and accessibility had not lessened the ancient loyalty of Nippon for its rulers. Since the Great War, American opinion had been rapidly crystallizing into the form of opposition to the generally unrestricted immigration policy of earlier days. Every nation has the double duty of protecting its own national homogeneity and character, and at the same time of recognizing that this character is developed in the interests of world service. In the early years of the Republic, the doctrine of the melting pot was held and taught without reason and with an optimism severely rebuked at the time when the Great War shattered some other national delusions. Hence the swing of the pendulum towards an extremely careful selection of possible immigrants. Unfortunately, while this laudable desire led to the adoption of the quota policy, of admitting immigrants from most of the outside world. Under the influence of long-continued propaganda, the policy of absolute exclusion was adopted for Asiatics. This policy was not resented by Japan because of its effect in excluding immigrants of that nationality, but first of all, because it discriminated against them as undesirable racially, and secondly, because it impugned the honorable character of the gentleman's agreement. As Premier Cato put it, it was a sentimental matter, Nothing practical upon which we had set our hearts had been taken from us. We merely were wounded in our feelings. Our friends had done something we did not expect and could not help adjudging unjust. End quote. Mr. Hughes, as Secretary of State, felt the same way. Quote, there can be no question, end quote, he said, quote, that such a statutory exclusion will be deeply resented by the Japanese people. Permit me to suggest that the legislation would seem to be quite unnecessary even for the purpose for which it is devised. End quote. Nevertheless, in spite of all efforts made by individuals and organizations friendly to the Japanese, public opinion so far influenced the House of Representatives that the immigration bill, with its obnoxious clause, was passed with but little opposition on April 12, 1924. The publication of a letter by the Japanese ambassador, Mr. Hanihara, dated April 11th, with its solemn warning against the possible, quote, grave consequences, end quote, which the passing of the bill might entail, had the unfortunate and unforeseen fate of being interpreted, quite unfairly, as a threat. Partly in consequence of this, the Senate, which had been relied upon to modify the bill, also passed the measure on April 15th. Mr. Coolidge signed it with the following statement, quote, in signing this bill, which in its main features I heartily approve, I regret the impossibility of severing from it the exclusion provision which, in the light of the existing law, affects especially the Japanese. I gladly recognize that the enactment of this provision does not imply any change in our sentiment of admiration and cordial friendship for the Japanese people." End quote. Following upon the passage of the bill, there seemed much reason to fear that the President's hope, expressed in these last words, might not be realized. On the other side of the Pacific, there were protests, official and unofficial. Meetings in which heated speeches were delivered were held in Tokyo and elsewhere, declaring that Japan could not possibly submit. One man committed suicide outside Viscount Inouye's house in order to draw attention by his sacrifice to the great wrong. The funeral of this patriot was made the occasion of a most remarkable demonstration. Officially, the cabinet drew up a protest on May 28th, which was transmitted to Ambassador Hanihara for presentation at Washington. Nor were protests confined to the other side of the Pacific. On this side, the Federal Council of Churches issued a statement which commenced as follows, quote, The Asiatic Exclusion Section of the Immigration Law of 1924 has created an international situation which causes us grave concern. The manner of its enactment... The abrupt abrogation of the gentleman's agreement without the conference requested by Japan, the insistence on a discriminatory law which Asiatics resent as humiliating, unjust, and unchristian, and the affront to Japan's prestige as one of the great and equal nations of the world have combined to wound and grieve a friendly nation. End quote. The law went into effect on July 1st, and the first intensity of feeling rapidly subsided, 
through the good sense of statesmen on both sides of the ocean. But results followed which had been quite unforeseen, particularly in the encouragement given to the cause of Pan-Asianism and the drawing together of the three powers of Eastern Asia, Russia, China, and Japan. Of a more practical nature was the alteration of certain Japanese laws which had on the side been persistently misunderstood, such as the matter of dual citizenship and the terms on which land might be purchased or leased by foreigners in Japan. Before the end of the year, Mr. Hanehara was replaced as ambassador to Washington by Mr. Tsuneo Matsudaira, whose names, signifying perpetual peace under the pine tree, were regarded as a good omen. The Kiyora ministry had been doomed almost from its birth, and it hardly needed the shock of the immigration bill to bring about its downfall. This was hastened by the result of the general election of May 1924, and on June 8th, Viscount Takati Kato was called upon to form a ministry. This he did by including Mr. Tsuyoshi Inukai of the Kakushin Club. Kato had been a factor in politics from the time when he served as Okuma's secretary. From 1894 for five years, he had represented Japan and London and returned to Tokyo to become Minister for Foreign Affairs. He held the same position in Sai Onji's cabinet and was also in Okuma's ministry at the outbreak of the Great War. After the death of Katsura, Kato became leader of the new Kenseikai party, and it was the victory of this party which swept him into office at this juncture. Yet before he had been a year in office, he was deserted by Takahashi in Inukai, and the cabinet had to be reformed by command of the prince regent in order to harmonize the diverse elements of which it had been composed. One of the great achievements in the field of domestic politics of the Cato ministry was the passing of the Manhood Suffrage Bill in March 1925. The bill was introduced for the purpose of doing away with the property qualification and to grant the franchise to every male free from stated disabilities above the age of 25. The listing of these disabilities brought about a sensational struggle between the two houses of the Diet. It had been the intention of the government to disqualify paupers, but the House of Peers amended the disqualification to read, quote, people depending upon others for help or support, end quote. An effort to obtain agreement by compromise led to the emperors being asked to prolong the session, first for one day, then for two further days, then for two days more. At last the peers yielded halfway, and only two million were cut off the list of voters instead of the four million contemplated. With all amendments, the bill, of course, made a great step forward, not without its risks, for there would be now 12,500,000 voters instead of the 3 million hitherto enfranchised. Several important changes were made by the bill apart from the increase of the electorate. The number of elected peers is now as follows. Counts, 18. Viscounts, 66. Barons, 66. Imperial nominees to the House of Peers are now 125, while the number of the highest taxpayers elected to the same is 66. Princes and marquises are now permitted to resign from the upper house at will. A new element is added to the legislature by the election, from among themselves, of four members of the Imperial Academy for terms of seven years. Indirectly, a result of the Manhood Suffrage Bill is the creation of the Farmer Labor Party, a purely political party formed largely from the non-propertied classes. It is no exaggeration to say that the passing of this bill is, in the strictest sense of the word, a second Ishin, footnote, that is, renovation, a term applied to the revolution of 1867, end footnote. Comparable, that is, to the restoration of 1868, this is the more especially true in the light of Prince Sionji's declaration that after himself there will be no more general. The power has passed definitely from the hands of privilege into the keeping of the whole people of the empire. The fact has already been alluded to that the rebuff received in the United States by the passing of the immigration bill has something to do with the drawing into closer relations of China, Russia, and Japan. In respect to China, Japan had regretted the costly mistake by which the trust of the great Asiatic Republic had been forfeited. She now began to realize that the cornerstone of her foreign policy must be in China. As the Japan advertiser at this time put it, quote, 
Japan could better afford to sacrifice all other interests before giving up her presence and her contemplated cooperation with China in an economic and diplomatic way. The old militaristic idea of political dominance of China by Japan seems to have largely disappeared, along with certain other views long held by the powerful military bureaucrats who have so often dictated to the foreign office in the past. End quote. Mr. Yusuke Tsurumi has well said, quote, There is no doubt some necessity in our new virtues. Such situations are not peculiar to the Orient, but the new turn in Chinese-Japanese relations has a deeper significance. It is an expression of the growing desire of the Japanese to take up anew the study of Oriental civilization. It means that Japan is discovering that Western civilization dominated by the machine, and by passion, offers no solution to the great problems of inherent, permanent, national stability, serenity of the spirit, and man's greatest achievement, the conquest of himself. End quote. Of even more significance is the announcement of policy by the foreign minister, Baron Shidehara, who said in the Diet, quote, We have followed with the strictest exactitude the principle of non-interference in China's internal politics, we have absolutely refrained from supplying any party in China with arms, munitions, or loans that might be utilized for the purpose of continuing hostilities. Knowing that the Chinese were sick of war, we believed that the refusal of assistance to any particular party in China was, in effect, assistance rendered to the whole nation of China. Another point to which we attached particular importance was our belief in international good faith. The Japanese government had already subscribed to the resolution of the powers prohibiting the supply of arms and ammunition to China. We further declared on more than one occasion our policy of non-interference in the domestic troubles of that country. We have now translated these commitments faithfully into fact. End quote. This good feeling between the two countries was not allowed to continue without incidents demanding considerable restraint. Among these, the Shanghai Affair of May 1925, when the shooting of a Chinese rioter in defense of Japanese mill property proved the spark which threatened a great conflagration. Again, the firing by Chinese nationalist troops upon Japanese destroyers on March 12, 1926, created consternation and led to an ultimatum issued by the Protocol Powers of 1901. Yet, with all such critical incidents, the friendly restraint of Japan has been remarkable and the attitude of Mr. Hyoki at the Peking Tariff Conference was sympathetic beyond that of most of the other representatives. The negotiations between Japan and Russia had hung fire for several years through Japan's unwillingness to relinquish Sakhalin without an adjustment of the Nikolaevsk affair. Fifty years earlier, the whole of Sakhalin could have been purchased for $1 million, but now M. Jolfe wanted the sum of $750 million. However, since the earlier occasion, Japan had come to realize the value of the island's oil and coal resources, estimated as from one-fifth to one-half of those beneath the surface of the United States. In May 1924, the insistent demands of the Japanese government through Mr. Kenkichi Yoshizawa brought about a conference extending to no fewer than 77 sessions with the Soviet representative M. Karakan. On January 20th, 1925, the Russo-Japanese Treaty was signed providing for the recognition of the Treaty of Portsmouth by the Soviets for a revision of the Fishery Convention of 1907 for an apology instead of an indemnity for the massacre at Nikolaevsk for concessions to the amount of 50% of the coal and oil deposits of North Sakhalin, all this conditional on the immediate withdrawal of the Japanese troops and accompanied by a promise that the Soviets would not use propagandist methods in the empire. Over this last possibility, the Japanese statesmen, especially in view of the increase of the electorate, had been excusably nervous. The conclusion of these negotiations was regarded as one of the most encouraging of recent developments, particularly as it was felt there were policies in Russia and Japan which seemed to be converging on Manchuria and the newspapers were already predicting a recurrence of the conflict of 1904. The treaty came into force on February 26th and soon after Mr. Tokichi Tanaka left for Moscow to be the first Japanese ambassador to the Soviet government.
The Keito ministry seemed, after its reorganization exclusively from the ranks of the Kenseikai, to be making fair progress in solving the many problems for which the natural course of political history, as well as the extraordinary necessities created by the earthquake, had made it responsible when an attack of influenza laid low, at the age of 67, the premier who had gained the trust and friendship of his own countrymen and the respect of his fellow statesmen and other lands. Viscount Cato was immediately succeeded by Mr. Regio Wakatsky, who had been minister for home affairs under his deceased chief. Baron Shidahara continued to hold the portfolio for foreign affairs. Another death with different associations, which occurred a few weeks later, namely on April 24th, 1926, was that of Prince Yi, the former ruler of Korea. The ex-emperor had been ill for some time, but was only 53 at the time of his decease. The calling to memory of so much of the passion and intrigue of earlier days led to some exciting scenes in connection with the funeral ceremonies of this last of the Korean royal line but the ceremonies were tactfully as well as impressively carried out, and there was no serious outbreak. The Koreans mourned not only a departed emperor, but also the burial of many of their former anticipations and hopes. End of chapter 30, read by Elsie Selwyn.